The Rage of Saints, The Shadow Watch Saga, Book Two. Written by S. A. Klopfenstein. Narrated by Stacy Krejci. Prologue. The year 323 N. W. Sixth year of the reign of Cyrus Morrow. Cyrus Morrow, the sixteenth Chancellor of Osha, should have been pleased. Exuberant, even. The leaders of the Shadow Watch lay in the dungeons beneath the White Citadel, their magic rich blood filling him with power each day. Many of the Watchers had chosen to serve him rather than suffer this horrid fate, which made Cyrus Morrow even more powerful. Monsters ravaged the New World for the first time in centuries, and the people of Osha looked to their Chancellor as though he were their god. And he was their god. When the Chancellor revealed his magic to the people of Osha, the day he paraded the Watchers through the streets of Morrow El, their mouths had gaped with awe. They'd knelt in reverence as he'd ridden past. Magic had returned to the world at his hand. Nothing had gone according to plan, but everything had turned out better than he ever could have dreamed. The monsters that had come through the portal between the worlds had been unanticipated, but they had turned into a precious opportunity. Rulox and Nosferati had returned from the realm of nightmares and myths to ravage the world. The people of Osha were afraid, and fear made them loyal. Their chancellor wielded power unknown in all the new world, and his new magical army, the Sky Guard, would keep the Empire safe from hellish beasts. While other nations plunged into chaos, Osha would remain strong, and the people of the North would be grateful, worshipful. Cyrus Morrow was more powerful than his father, and his father before him. He was far more powerful than Loras, his precious, perfect brother, had ever been. But it was not enough. It was as though Loras had returned from the dead to taunt him with this fact, as he had taunted Cyrus with his magical prowess when they were children. Of course, like their parents, Loras had not practiced his magic much. It was this self-denial that held the empire together, their father had liked to say. Cyrus had showed no prowess to deny himself of, but he had always thought it a ludicrous notion. Self-denial had made his father and all his forefathers, and especially Loras, weak, far weaker than Cyrus had ever been. Cyrus had fashioned his own power. No longer would an ocean chancellor be mocked by foreign dignitaries as a vestige of another time. No longer would the nobles rule the empire like puppeteers. Now, more than ever, the chancellor was revered and feared, but for one thing, the gallows girl. Cyrus Morrow had hoped that in the turmoil of old-world monsters ravaging the new world, the gallows girl might be forgotten. It had been weeks since she'd been lost in the catacombs beneath the crooked teeth, and many months since any common person had seen her. Yet here he was, on the balcony where he first drank the gallows girl's blood, and it was time to inflict pain on her account once more. There came a knock on the balcony doors. A morph announced the arrival of his visitor, and Cyrus motioned for them to enter. The noble traitor, Wren, of House Andovier, the attendant announced. That's Captain Andovier, murmured Wren weakly but defiantly as he entered. The watcher was escorted to the balcony by a traitor to his own cause. Daja Bati had been one of the first watchers to join the Chancellor's Sky Guard and the dark-skinned Parjan seemed all too eager to demonstrate his new loyalties. He led Wren with a shove that sent him to his knees. Careful, said the Chancellor, your captain might break. Despite his quick tongue, the captain of the Watchers looked like he'd been inflicted with a plague. His skin hung loose and was tinted a grayish hue, as though he were beginning to rot. Even his eyes had lost their luster. Brilliant blue now appeared dull and faded. You're my captain now, my lord, said Daja, bowing his head. His long dreadlocks whipped through the air with the movement. Reckon the best thing for Wren might be breaking. The chancellor chuckled, pleased with the young Parjan's unabashed loyalty. Nevertheless, he motioned for Daja to help Wren up. Wren moaned. 
Had enough of my dungeons, said the Chancellor. Dodger's doing quite well. Dodger stood behind his former captain with arms crossed, his expression hard. The Chancellor loved the anger that flared up at the mention of Wren's own soldier's betrayal. Suddenly, the Watcher Captain didn't look so pitiful. There's fire in him yet. Good. Am I ready to betray my own kind? said Wren bitterly. Like my brother? He spat the words, and the Chancellor grinned. Like you? Cyrus Morrow's lips curled. Betray? Your gallows girls set monsters upon the entire world, and you accuse me of betrayal? You sought to return the glory of the Watchers to the New World, and I have done that. I am sorry to have stolen your glory, but it is time you accepted the world as it is and moved forward. The Sky Guard awaits you, my friend. It will welcome you with open arms, as it did Dodger. At this, Dodger nodded coolly. A table had been set out on the balcony, and the Chancellor gestured to Wren. Sit. Eat. You must be tired of the stale rations of the dungeons. Replenish yourself, I insist. Wren sat and replenished, tearing into a leg of roasted venison. The juices splattered from his lips, staining the white tunic he'd been given for this meeting. As he ate, the color returned to Wren's cheeks, only a little, but nothing was missed by Cyrus Morrow. See, I'm not all blood and horror the Chancellor said. Wren did not answer, but he did not stop eating. You know, you might have been part of all this, said the Chancellor. The return of our kind? Wren coughed up his wine. You're no watcher, you're a parasite. The Chancellor tensed, though he tried not to let it show. Instead, he smiled, reached out with his sense, and summoned the second goblet. It floated through the air to his hand, and he drank a glorious red liquid. It was not wine. As its coppery taste left his tongue, he could already feel his power increasing like a stoked fire. Yes, said Cyrus Morrow, our kind. Or are you naive enough to think that magic is restricted to your old world orders? It was that sort of thinking that led to the fall of the Watchers, my friend. I thought you were more sophisticated. I know what happened in the old world. My ancestors were there, said Wren. Yes, they were, as you were there when I discovered what can be done with Watcher blood. So was Solero. And yet both of you have the audacity to paint yourselves righteous. Wren's expression grew hard, and the Chancellor was pleased. He knew Wren regretted serving him those many years ago. Those events had led to the death of the royal family all but Cyrus. Much as Wren might hate to believe it, he had helped make the Chancellor what he was. We are more alike than you think, Wren. We both created a problem. Astoria may be the one who let those beasts through your portal, but you made it possible. Don't you paint yourself righteous? The Chancellor laughed. Still bantering, even after weeks of bloodletting. Your strength is returning. Good. Why are you treating me so well? said Wren bitterly. I'm reminding you of the finer things, the things you have longed for ever since you fled the city. You may have spent the last few years out in that God's forsaken tower in the woods, but you are still a true noble of Osha. I'm trying to seduce you, of course. For a moment, Wren looked taken aback. The Chancellor enjoyed surprising people with the naked truth. Wren recovered and took a loaf of bread. It steamed as he broke it open. And why else are you treating me well? Wren said. The Chancellor was pleased. Nothing got past Wren and Ovia. There's something I need you to do for me, and for that you will need to be strong. The Chancellor procured a parchment from his robes. It was such a little thing, found in the pockets of a mere servant boy. But if Tori had taught him anything, it was that servants could pose a considerable threat, even to him, especially to him. Wren unrolled the parchment. Inscribed on the crumpled paper were no letters or words, 
servants were rarely literate. No, there was only one symbol, small in the bottom corner of the page, so small it might have easily gone unnoticed, mistaken for a scribble by one of the scribes. The symbol was that of a gallows, the overhanging beam cleft in two. Though it was not his writing, Wren's face betrayed horror at the sight of it. What do you want me to do? Commander Redvar, you may enter. The servant boy, who had been brought up from the dungeons, did not tremble when the commander of the Chancellor's Sky Guard forced him into the Chancellor's presence. The boy was expressionless, and this infuriated the Chancellor, though again he tried not to let it show. Here is your insurrectionist, my lord, Darian said, shoving the servant boy to his knees. Sparing the gallows boy had turned out to be one of Cyrus Morrow's greatest decisions. When the Chancellor appointed Darian Redvar as commander of his magical army, the people of Osha had been in awe. The Chancellor had proven cunning even in his own apparent grace. The gallows boy, who once had defied him before all of Osha, who had triggered the gallows girl's very demonstration of forbidden magic last year, had turned into his most feared servant. Darian's expression was cold as he stood over the defiant little rebel. This will be interesting. The Chancellor smiled at the boy, offering his hand, and the boy looked dumbly at it. I am helping you stand, Cyrus Morrow said. Like Wren, the boy was dressed in a fine-spun tunic, better than anything the boy had likely worn before. He took the Chancellor's hand and stood. What's your name? the Chancellor said. Me name's Liam, the boy said, his low-born accent thick. A Morgothian, said the Chancellor, noting the boy's sun-specked pale skin. But it would seem one not so blessed by your god. Red hair was seen as a blessing from Nafta. Halstead had been thus blessed and yet Nafta had not spared the rebel king at the hands of the gallows boy. Cyrus Morrow mussed the boy's plain, tawny hair. He gestured to Wren. Show Liam what we've found. Wren's expression was visibly pained as he regarded the boy, but still he obeyed and handed over the treacherous parchment. Liam clenched his fist around it, crumpling the poorly drawn gallows into a ball. You do not deny it is yours, said the Chancellor, amused. Liam's knees weakened a little, but he stood tall for one no older than thirteen summers. He shook his head without hesitation. I don't deny it, don't regret it neither. The Chancellor chuckled darkly. You realize that the gallows girl is a traitor, a dark sorceress who brought back the terrors of the old world? She's a saint, Liam said obstinately, and she's coming to save us. Save you? A horde of Rulocks marched toward the city as we speak, at her behest. The Chancellor grew cold, gripping the boy by the collar of his tunic. Despite his bravery, little Liam was shaking, and this pleased the Chancellor. I saved you. My armies keep the beasts at bay. No, said Liam, you ain't no savior. You're a tyrant. His grip tightened on the boy. A part of him admired his brashness. It was such a spark that had prompted him to spare the gallows boy not so long ago. But this boy would receive no such grace. Yes, well, we become what we must, my boy. And you are about to become exactly what you must. That symbol is a sign of treason. Do you know what happens to traitors, boy? The boy swallowed, but nodded. Y you're going to kill me? The Chancellor released his grip on the boy. Actually, Wren here is going to kill you. He's a traitor, too, and it's time you both understood what that entails. Wren backed away from the boy. I won't, he said. Ah. Now that is just charming, said the Chancellor. After all that's happened, Wren, you still believe you have a choice. The sorceress Medea appeared behind Wren 
stepping from a sudden rise of mist, the path of the godstones. Before Wren could react, her pale, tendril-like fingers extended from billowy silks and latched onto his skull. You don't want to serve me again, said the Chancellor. Wren, I am afraid you have no choice. The Chancellor took hold of Liam by both arms and held him still. This is the fate of those who hope in the gallows, girl. At Medea's command, Wren began channeling his conjury power in a way he had never done before. First, the boy's tunic was wrenched from his chest, exposing his torso. And then the incision began, starting at the center of his scrawny chest. The cut ran slow and deep, compelled not by a blade, but by pure, unadulterated magic. It was the cleanest cut the Chancellor had ever seen. The skin split open so smoothly, it was as though the image were being painted on a canvas rather than carved from flesh. It was beautiful. Throughout the process, the servant boy screamed in agony, crimson life gushing from the growing wound. By the time Wren had finished, the boy was dead, his life poured onto the balcony floor. The Chancellor turned the boy over so he could examine the finished product. The image carved from the little rebel's chest had come out perfect. An exact likeness, a piece of art. Etched into the dead boy's chest was a broken gallows, the symbol of the gallows saint. Part 1. Mouth of the Gods Little was known about the Great White North, nor the people that inhabited it. What was told of the Aleut was mostly legend. Wild men, ancient savages, harsh people befitting such a harsh place. No one knew because no one ventured into the North. It was a place even the gods had forsaken. From Dawn of the Third World Chapter One The North stretched out like a great frozen sea, powerful and infinite, beyond the mouth of the gods. Between two mountain ranges, the northeastern reaches of the crooked teeth and the westernmost peaks of the spine of the north stretched a gaping glacial valley of ice and crevasses, known to have swallowed many who dared venture through its treacherous passage. This was the mouth, and it was the only way to the great white north. It had been three weeks since Astoria Burrodai had joined Alec Dubaruk and his company of Aleut and crooked refugees. They had covered many miles, but it was slow going across the frozen scree of the gray waste with such a large company. Tori had begun to wonder if they would ever reach the north. For days she'd longed to finally spot the infamous mouth of the gods that Alec described. But as they neared, Tori began to wonder again if she'd made the wrong decision. To journey to the Icelands in pursuit of revolution, or restoration, as Alec liked to refer to it. I see why they call it the mouth, murmured Tori's closest companion, Misha Sufai. With the looming peaks of the teeth and the spine towering on both sides, and the jagged pillars of ice rising to meet them, Tori thought the mouth ought to have been more aptly named. More like the fangs of the gods. Alec de Baruch chuckled, sidling beside her. I told you it was magnificent. Not sure that's the word I'd choose said Tori. Terrifying, offered Misha. Blood-curdling? Alec took their jests in stride. It's a vicious beauty, my grandmother says. The North is cruel, but there's wonder, too, if you've eyes to see it. We'll work on our squinting, then, said Tori, smiling. It was strange to smile at such a time. Great storms would soon be approaching, but it felt good to joke and laugh and Alec had a way of bringing this out of her. Alec shook his head. My people resented being forced to flee to such a harsh land. Some still do, but I see magnificence. I see a place that's made us resilient. Then why go to war against the Chancellor? For some old bit of land? Misha asked. Alec smiled. Tori had quickly been growing to appreciate his incessant grin. Despite the weathered countenance of a hard existence, his smile shone with childish genuineness, a smile of wisdom 
and persistent hope. For some, it is revenge, justice. But for me, it's spiritual. The heart and soul of my people lies in Osha. I love the North, but I feel like a part of me is missing as long as I live anywhere else. Have you ever been there? asked Tori. Few living Al you'd have. I've heard the tales of the traitors in the Ice City. But no, I have seen Osha only in my dreams. Yet I still feel its absence. It is my home. Guess I've never felt that way about a place, Tori muttered. I'm a bastard. No place has ever felt like home. What about you, Misha? asked Alec. Misha had grown quiet. Her short black hair whipped up in a gust of wind. She gazed off at the massive forms of rock and ice known as the Spine of the North, the natural barrier between the known world and the mysterious Great White North. I miss the islands, Misha said eventually. The sand and swimming in the silver sea. I miss the scent of flowers, the taste of citrus and salt kisses. But not the castes and the code of my people or my parents and their damned honor. It's the people that make a place. I never want to go back to Melanesia. Alec's expression softened. Well, you will both just have to trust me. Nothing is more sacred to the Aleut than our homeland. Someday maybe it can become home for us all. They continued in silence, and with each step the mouth of the gods seemed to gape wider and wider, as though they were willingly walking down the throat of some gargantuan old-world beast. Tori had already seen enough of those to last a lifetime. With Rulox and Nosferati ravaging the world, and the Chancellor sure to be hunting for her, the Great White North might be the only safe place in the New World. But looking at the yawning chasms before them, Tori wondered if there was such a thing as a safe place. When they reached the edge of the valley, Alec de Baruch blew a whale horn, and the company set up camp. The nights were growing colder as the brief season before winter set in. Mammoth furs and insulated sealskin yurts helped, but Tori imagined it would only get colder beyond the mouth of the gods. As the sun fell behind the crooked teeth, the jagged shards of glacial ice that formed the mouth glowed with a bloody hue. A vicious beauty, said Tori. She sat down beside Misha as the Aleut set fires and prepared supper. Misha nodded absently, staring after a young crooked girl attempting to ignite a pile of kindling for the evening fires. Yeah, uh, beautiful. Tell you what, Tori went on. I'll sleep a lot easier once we get past that ice maze. Misha was troubled, Tori could tell. There were worse things going on, and Tori knew her friend would never bring up her own anxieties. But Misha had been solemn ever since Alec had begun speaking of homelands. Misha never spoke much of her life before the watchtower. She came from a high-born Melanesian family, judging by her lighter brown skin and her ability to read and write. Tori assumed Wren and Kale and Ovier had stolen Misha away without event. So Misha let it seem. But Tori realized there was more. She felt it, as though a dark storm hovered over her friend's past life. Tori kept talking, trying to distract her from her troubles. But Misha didn't respond, her attention fixated on the crooked girl and her failing fire. The wind rushed and doused the third attempt. What do you think Ikala will be like? said Tori, more to herself than anyone. I don't imagine the ice city can truly be made entirely of ice, do you think? Suddenly, Misha shot to her feet without so much as a grunt in answer. She hurried to the fire and knelt beside the crooked girl. Let me help. Misha held out her hand as though to block the wind. Strike your flint again. The girl did and this time the flame roared to life with the flare of Misha's fiery power. The kindling hissed, and then the rest of the wood caught. Misha patted the girl on the shoulder. Nice work, she said, and returned to Tori. The crooked girl followed. It's all right, you know, the girl said. I know you did it. You're magic too. Am I? 
Sure. You came with the gallows girl, so you must be. Anyway, I seen you tending the fires the other night, when we were running out of timber before you reached the Everwinter Forest. Those fires should have burned up by midnight, but in the morning they were still burning, and you were still tending them. Magic. Misha could not hide a smile. Maybe that was the gallows girl. The girl rolled her eyes, but dared a questioning glance at Tori. Tori shook her head. Afraid not. I don't know the first thing about fire. What's your name, little lady? The crooked girl could not have been more than ten or eleven summers old, but she was already growing into long, gangly limbs. Tesla, and I'm no lady, she said, unfazed at being addressed by the gallows girl. My brother thinks you're one of the old gods, but I don't really think so. You seem too normal. Normal, said Misha, chuckling. Uh, I mean, not normal. Human, I guess. Tesla glanced away, showing the first signs of timidity. Well, that's because I am human, said Tori. You're very bright. Tell me, how do you know so much about fire? The girl beamed. I like to burn things. Mom always says I'll burn the house down one day. At this, her expression turned. But I guess she don't have to worry about our house no more. Tori was filled once again with fierce shame for the destruction she had caused in the crooked teeth only a few short weeks ago. Your home. The Rulocks, said Tesla. Crushed it to pieces. Killed my papa, too. I'm so sorry, Misha said, clasping the girl's hand. Tori could tell Tesla was holding back tears and she could not help but admire the girl's strength. Me and my brother do all right, but my mom, she's torn up something awful. She tries to hide it and tells us to keep strong, but I seen her at night crying all alone. It ain't your fault, though. It's the Chancellor that done it. But is that true? Tori could not convince herself it was. She had been weak. She had let the monsters through the Chancellor's gateway between the worlds. She had stirred them up in her failed resistance, and who knew what destruction lay ahead? A nagging question returned to eat at her gut. Where did the Nosferati come from? Had they come from the old world as well? And if so, had Tori been the one to let them through? Some byproduct when the portal had been opened? Don't worry, said Misha to the crooked girl. We'll deal with the Chancellor soon enough. A smile returned to Tesla's lips. That's why you're here, isn't it? She said to Tori. Before Tori could answer, they were interrupted. Hey, Tess! A woman with a weathered face came hurrying over and took Tesla by the wrist. You ain't got time to be bothering our gallows saint and you know it. Oh no, she's fine, said Tori. The woman scowled. She ain't fine. She's supposed to be helping her brother fix the stew. The fire's going just fine, Tess. There's meat to mince and taters to skin. Get on. Gods, Mom, I'm sorry, cried Tess. I must have forgot. Mm, yes, well, I forgive your forgetfulness, but your brother may not. Now get. Yes, Mom. Tesla turned to Misha. Thanks again for the fire. Then she turned to Tori, the firelight flashing in her hazel eyes. And thank you, too. For what? said Tori. For coming with us to the north. Tess scampered off to find her brother. I hope you pardon my daughter. Afraid she takes after her papa. Her papa must have been a fine man, said Misha, still watching the little girl run off. She was no bother at all. The woman smiled, though there was sadness in her deep brown eyes. Well... In that case, you both best be hurrying off yourselves. Ma'am, said Tori. Didn't you hear? There's food that needs cooking. Tessa's mother shook with a laugh. Misha and Tori laughed along with her. For days they had tried to help the company with preparations, but everyone refused to let them assist with trivial duties. Of course, said Misha, the normal lightness returning to her voice. We'd love to help. There was a darkness looming over Astoria and Misha, more threatening than the mouth of the gods. Death 
guilt, betrayal, fear. But for a few moments, they both felt light again. The woman's name was Gwyneth Falzen, and together with Tesla and her brother Jordy, Misha and Tori prepared a fine stew of hare, potatoes, and a strange spice bark, which fed nearly half the company. It felt good to contribute for once. So many saw Tori the way Tesla's brother Jordy saw her, like a god. It was a relief to be treated as a human again. Gwyneth reminded Tori of old Mary, which filled her with a strange combined sense of sadness and joy. The woman was sharp and snappy, yet Tori could easily see the love she bore for her children. When dinner had been served and cleaned up, the fires were stoked, and an old Aleut man began telling ancient stories of frost giants and magic stags and dragons of the sea. Tess led Misha by the arm to the fireside, and together they listened, enraptured. Tori stayed back and observed. She was glad Tesla had managed to distract Misha from her haunted memories, though every time Tori saw her, she thought of the godstones and the rulocks, and pangs of guilt surged anew. She was responsible for what happened to Tesla's village, and who knew what else? Though out here in the wild, even those recent horrors felt like something from a dream, Tori loved the simplicity of their company march, eat, and sleep. Out here, it seemed there was no OSHA, no Chancellor, no need for magic or wars. She was not sure she believed Alec, that a land could be worth the bloodshed that would inevitably come with a revolution. Suddenly, a hand grasped her shoulder from behind, and she leapt, barely stifling a shriek. Alec chuckled. But Tori did not. The unexpected touch took her back to the catacombs beneath the crooked teeth, to dark chambers where the soldier, Jujin, had shoved her against a damp cave wall and very nearly had his way with her. In all the chaos and mourning that had followed, Tori had thought little of the terror and helplessness she'd endured in those moments, but at Alec's touch it returned in full force. Jujin's twisted gaze roared to life in her memory and she could feel his wiry hands again, clawing at her clothes, searching for skin and tender places. Tori jerked away, instantly feeling foolish. Tori, it's okay, Alex said, confused. It's just me. She tried not to reveal how shaken she really was. He touched her shoulder again, reassuringly, and she forced herself not to pull away in spite of herself. Alex seemed to sense her uneasiness and quickly withdrew his hand. I'm sorry I startled you. Tori sighed. Gods, no, I'm sorry. It's just, I keep going back to the catacombs. She had told no one of what Jujin had nearly done, not even Misha. In the wake of the nightmare they had survived, it had seemed unimportant in comparison to the betrayals of Vashti and Kale and the others the deaths of Mary and who knew how many of their friends from the watchtower. Alec knew about the Nosferati, and she let him believe that was what she meant. It's like reliving a nightmare, isn't it? he said. Once you've seen death. Yes, death is much worse. But that was not what haunted her just now. Tori merely nodded. When I was young, my youngest sister and me went fishing at the place where the ice meets the frozen sea in summer. There was a hole where seals would come to the surface. We'd fished places like it a hundred times before. I dropped our bait on our way there, and I asked Lysa to get it while I set up the lines. I heard the crack when she fell through. By the time I got there, she was already gone beneath the ice. It was three years before I fished again. Alec. Tori did not know what to say. What can you say about nightmares? And she felt guilty for being haunted by a terror that almost happened. Why didn't she see flashes of Rulox or Nosferati at a startling touch? But no, it was that pig, Jujin. I'm so sorry. Thank you, he said softly. Though that's not why I told you. I guess we all have nightmares, but... None of us should have to carry the burden of them alone. 
Tori smiled. Maybe one day I'll take that offer. It's always there, he said. Tori noticed him reach to touch her again, but he caught himself and pulled back. The reason I startled you was because I wanted to show you something. He pointed toward the edge of camp, out into the darkness of the gray waste. What could you possibly need to show me out there? She said skeptically. Well, technically, you'd probably see it inside camp, but the fires tend to pollute it. Pollute what? The lights of Enora, goddess of the northern sky. We're far enough north, we should see them, even this early in the season. Tori followed him out past the circle of yurts, beyond the ring of light emanating from the evening fires. Twice in her life she had seen traces of the lights, but only in the deepest winter upon the northern steppe. In Osha there were too many lamps and they were too far south, but even traces were extraordinary to behold. Alec led the way across the frozen scree, never faltering, and soon the camp was but a flicker in the distance. He found a large boulder that suited him, and he sat with his back to it, the rock blocking out the light of their camp. Tori sat beside him. She enjoyed the young Aleut man's company, and she trusted him, even though at times it felt foolish. But it was those times she reminded herself that Alec had almost killed her, with his blade and his strange shaman's power that negated her own. But when he realized who she was, he had saved her life. She could sense his kind heart and see it in the way he treated the people in his company, the way he did not pry but was willing to share about his own tragedy and hardships. And so, her flashback to the catacombs fading from her memory, Tori scooted closer to him so she could feel his warmth through the furs of both their parkas. They sat in silence for some time, waiting to see if the lights would come out. Finally. Tori broke the silence. Do you really believe revolution is the answer? Don't you? He said softly. Can more darkness bring light? Night comes before day, doesn't it? Tori sighed, staring off into the darkness. Somewhere the spine and the teeth were looming. I know the injustices of the Chancellor's rule. I've lived them. And yet I wonder... How much bloodshed will it cost to fight it? I don't know how many of my friends died in the catacombs. All of them, it is possible. All in the name of revolution. Sometimes I wish the gallows had never happened. Sometimes I wish I was still just a servant girl in Morrow L. Alec went quiet. He gazed off at the inky night, watching wisps of cloud drift into the valley from the peaks of the spine. You won't be forced to join us, you know, Alec said. If you want to leave when we reach the Ice City, you can. You can sail off to the Southern Isles with the traders in the spring or the Triumvil, anywhere in the world, if that's what you want. But it won't stop this revolution. This isn't about you or the gallows. It has been brewing for decades, centuries, since the days of the old world. My grandmother envisioned it before I was born, and long before she saw you. Whatever blood has been or will be spilled, it is not your doing. No one can carry the dead. Tori said little else for a while. Truth be told, she wanted to believe him. She wanted to hope, but she was not sure she knew how. There was too much darkness in her mind to dream of a better world. Suddenly, Alec nudged her, and she looked up. It was subtle at first like traces of dye dropped into a bucket of water. But then the colors spread. The sky lit up with magnificent waves of purple and green threading across the northern sky. The lights of Enora. The colors were far more pronounced than any lights that had ever shone upon the steppe. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, Tori muttered, her eyes following the dancing ripples of light formed as though a child's finger were tracing in the sky. Even in places like this, at the end of the world, there is beauty and hope. At this, Alec's gaze moved from the lights and settled upon Tori. 
His brown eyes twinkled with the colors of the sky, and his olive skin flushed slightly. Tori suddenly realized how close the shaman was to her, and realized that she did not mind his nearness. But quickly they broke apart. From beyond the great shards of ice towering over them, a sharp, groaning sound filled the night, reverberating off the peaks of the teeth and the spine, building. It sounded like a dozen great beasts roaring to life. And then the sound faded. What was that? said Dory. In the distance, she could hear worried murmurs rising from their camp. The mouth is a glacier, said Alec finally. The ice is always shifting. I... He sounded as if he were trying to convince himself. I am sure that's all it was. Nevertheless, they both hurried back to camp. The lights of Enora rushed now, with violent shifts of color across the sky, as though a storm were raging. A vicious beauty. Chapter 2 The mouth of the gods gaped wide in the soft dawn light and swallowed them up as they passed from the gray waste into the jagged valley of glacial ice that spanned between the mountain ranges of the crooked teeth and the spine of the north. The mouth stretched north for miles before tapering off into the Icelands beyond. The groans of shifting ice had lasted less than a minute before quickly waning in the too still northern night, but still Misha Sufai had slept lightly. In truth, she had not slept well since the fall of the watchtower, since Zaya's death and Vashti's betrayal. Stings that buried themselves into her mind and even her dreams. Every day she became more accustomed to the foggy existence of sleep deprivation and night terrors. But Alec de Baruch and the Northmen, along with the girl, Tesla, had rekindled vanished hope in her. Tess bounded through the snow like a hare with endless energy, pausing often to marvel at the towering pillars of ice looming around them. The girl distracted Misha from the memories of nightmares, living and imaginary. Still, Misha longed for a cup of the bold coffee of Melanesia to rouse her in the bitter morning. Her family's kitchen master had once brewed some of the finest in all the islands. But she did not want to think of home, either. Those memories haunted her as well. Tess came running up, grinning. She'd disappeared for a short while, exploring the maze of ice. And now she gripped Misha's gloved hand and pulled her along. You've got to come see this, Tess shouted for a few of the other children to follow. And they wended through a narrow cleft in the pillars of ice, which towered over them like giant fangs. Tess, you shouldn't be wandering in here, said Misha regarding the sharp drop of a crevasse on her left. It plummeted for thirty feet at least. The ice moves. Didn't you hear it last night? Tess laughed. It's not far. She ran ahead with one of the other crooked girls. What does it hurt? Misha thought, hurrying after them. Tori and Alec were up ahead anyway, leading the company through the mouth. The way was narrow and so the line of Aleut and Crooked Folk stretched long and moved slowly. The children were not likely to stray far enough to get lost from the group, but they needed looking after, and their joy lightened the burdens Misha carried. It seemed impossible that, at seventeen, it had only been six years since Misha had been a similar young girl, with endless wonder and energy. So much had changed so quickly with the coming of her first bleeding, and all the rights that womanhood brought in the islands of the Silver Sea. Misha's first blood had occurred during her thirteenth summer, and by fourteen she had fled for the trade cities of the Triumvul. A scream jolted Misha alert. Tess and a pair of crooked children had just disappeared around a boulder of ice. Misha raced to them, praying she would not be too late, but before she turned the corner, she heard Tesla chortling. The screaming stopped, and there was more laughter. Around the corner, the children gathered around a gap in the ice. Protruding from the glacier was a frozen human arm, jutting out from an invisible body. Emerged nearly to the elbow, its fingers stretched out like icy daggers, grasping for something just out of reach. 
Tess grinned at the disgusted expressions of the other children. Yo! cried a young boy, no older than seven. Is it real? asked a girl, who proceeded to poke at the fingers. Alex says the mouth can swallow people whole, Tess informed them enthusiastically. I bet this one died a hundred years ago. But it's still got skin, protested her brother, Jordy. Can't be that old. Don't matter if it's in ice, said Tess. The skin will stay forever. It could be a thousand years old. Afraid she's right, said Misha, mussing Jordy's shaggy locks of dark hair. This far north, I doubt it ever gets warm enough to thaw out, let alone decay. Tess shoved her brother playfully. Told you. What are you kids doing all the way out here? It was Alec de Baruch, and the kids all shot to attention at his stern voice. The group's moving on. So should you. We found a hand, said Tess boldly. Alec knelt to examine the frozen limb. An ancient Northman. North woman, actually, judging by the hand. Might be a thousand years old. Misha noticed his sly smile as Tess's eyes lit up. See? cried Tess again, pointing at her brother. Ah, uh, you just had a lucky guess, said Jordy. A thousand years, said Tess. And you might join the frozen people down there for another thousand if you keep wandering off. We're nearing the end of the Valley of Ice. I want you all marching with your families until we're clear of the mouth. You hear? Alec's face grew stern and he looked right at Tess. The crooked girl wilted under his gaze. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Now get moving, all of you, or you'll have us all wandering out here in the middle of the night. The children ran back the way they'd come, and once they'd gone, Alec laughed. It was my fault, said Misha. I let them come. Don't be too hard on them. Alec smiled. They could use a bit more fear in a place like this. Though honestly, I miss the days I could walk through such a place so fearlessly. Me too. Thank you for watching after them, Misha. The shaman fell in step beside her as they returned to the group. They look to you as well, you know. What do you mean? The children. Tori may be the gallows girl, but you give them hope also, particularly Tesla. You notice much, said Misha. I try to know my people, old and new. I am their shaman, a shepherd of souls. I must know them the way our divine parents know them. The old gods, said Misha, knowingly. Few people worship them still, you know. We have not forgotten our past. We still pray to them by their old names, what we called them long ago, before the ocean stole them and distorted them. Shalam is god of the day, and he provides us with food, strength, and peace when it can be found. Anora is goddess of the night. She followed us to the north and gave her lights to guide our way, to give us courage and hope, even in bitter darkness. And I must do the same for my people. You really believe in them, don't you? Don't they have gods in the islands of the Silver Sea? My people believe the gods left this world long ago. The souls of our ancestors remain to protect us, give us wisdom, and intercede with the gods on our behalf. Sounds like the tales of the watchers of the old world, said Alec. Melanesians believe the souls of our ancestors spring forth in the trees in our gardens where we sprinkle the ashes of our dead. But I have not prayed in a garden of souls in many years. Your people pray in gardens. In Jerka, they sacrifice doves in temples. The watchers burn incense and prayed on rugs. I bet we all get it wrong, said Misha. Perhaps, said Alec. He thought for a moment. Or perhaps we all get it a little right, like shades of the same sunset. My people believe the gods are all around us, and so we pray wherever we are. Perhaps it does not matter where you pray. That doesn't sound like a holy man. I suppose I am not like most holy men in the new world. I point others to the great mysteries beyond our world. I don't care if you call them by the same name. You do not seem to care for the gardens of souls, I sense. So, what then? Misha thought a moment. She had given little thought to gods of late, and since the destruction of the watchtower, she had often wondered how any gods could stand by and watch powers of evil continue to rule over the world. 
in the triumphal, Misha said at last. People pray to gods from many lands, and there are temples and shrines throughout the cities where traders may worship any god they desire from any nation in the new world. But there is a temple at the outskirts of the holy center dedicated to the unknown one, the forgotten god. It is said she watches out for strangers and orphans, the people we've forgotten, just like we forget about her. Somehow she always made the most sense to me. Alec smiled at this. Then I shall thank the Unknown One for remembering you and leading you and Tori to us. Misha and Alec reached the rear of the stream of people winding through the maze of ice. Where is Tori? said Misha. Leading the way, said Alec. I thought it would be good for her to be the one to lead us into the Great White North. You told her where to lead them, didn't you? Of course. Tori has never traveled through the mouth, after all. But her followers don't need to know that. Misha laughed. Some gods we watchers make, huh? I imagine even your unknown one was young once. Misha never had the chance to respond. The ice trembled violently and sent Misha to her knees. A jarring pain shot up her thighs. From the depths of the mouth came a horrendous groan and a boom like thunder, and suddenly the ground disappeared from beneath her feet. A crevasse split wide like a massive wound in the earth, rent by some giant invisible sword. Instinctively, Misha caught herself, reaching out with her sense, and flew to the edge of the expanse. Her heart thundered in her chest. The rumblings increased, the crevasse stretched wider, and Alec went plummeting. Misha's entire body tingled as her senses honed in. She caught his wrist just in time and pulled him to safety. They collapsed in the snow. But there was no saving the Aleut and Crooked Folk ahead. The mouth of the gods swallowed up four that Misha saw, and who knew how many in the maze beyond. Screams echoed from all directions. The rumblings faded, the ice groaning like a dying beast, but the crevasse did not grow any wider. It fell away at least a hundred feet, narrowing into the dark innards of the earth. There was no hope for those who'd fallen. Misha rose to her feet and held out her hand to help Alec up. The shaman stared at her dumbly. His hands quavered as she took hold of them. We have to help the others, she said. Come on. But there was no time to help anyone, for no sooner had the thunder faded than it was replaced by a new sound. From the depths of the gash in the earth there ushered a mighty roar followed by a horrid, scraping sound, like nails upon glass. A great gray hand, which looked to be composed of ice and scree, emerged from the abyss. Another hand followed, and then a great icy head with massive tusks protruding from the sides of its vicious face. The thing heaved itself up from the pit, standing taller than four men. It lifted its mighty head, revealing jagged teeth of ice. A frost giant! cried Alec, suddenly jarring to life. The mouth of the gods fell into madness as the Aleut and the crooked folk tried to flee. Several more fell to their deaths as the chasm yawned wider. Alec and Misha raced along the edge of the drop, but the monster paid them no mind. It had already found its target. Fifty yards ahead, a girl was pinned beneath a shard of fallen ice. Her mother and brother tugged frantically at her arms as the beast neared but the girl was held fast. Misha realized with horror that the girl was Tesla. Chapter 3 The maze of ice shuddered with the echoes of dying screams. The earth had split wide, the ground falling away beneath the company of Aleut and Crooked Folk. The world unraveled around Tori, and in the madness it struck her strangely how few names she knew of her followers, and how many she would never know. She fought back welling sickness in her gut. These people were helpless. I have to save them. A crooked woman vanished before Tori's eyes, and she was unable to reach her. The woman had green eyes like Tori's own, and they locked for a moment before the end, a calm sense passing between them. Tori seized hold of the woman's young son, but she could not save them both. The mother did not scream when she vanished. Survivors screamed, 
the woman merely slipped away and was gone. Tori choked back tears. Her son wailed with horror as Tori pulled him away from the growing abyss. Mama! Mama! Tori did not even know the boy's name, yet she was all he had left. An aged, crooked man was pressed against the side of the ice maze nearby. Tori did not know his name either. Where in the abyss is Alec? she thought helplessly. The man's eyes met hers, but he seemed to be staring through her. What's your name? Tori demanded, the poor orphaned boy sobbing in her arms. M my name? the man asked obtusely. He was in shock. A dozen of their company had fallen to their deaths before his eyes. He's got to snap out of it. All of us do, or we're all dead. Yes, Tori said, taking his hand. I'm Astoria. What is your name? Benja, the old man managed. Benja, can you walk? Walk, he said, coming out of his daze. Yes, of course. Tori squeezed his hand. I need you to get this boy out of here safely. Can you do that? The old crooked man seemed to realize who she was, because he straightened up and his eyes went wide. I will, my saint. Tori handed the boy over to Benja, brushing the hair out of the orphan's wet eyes. You are going to make it out of here. The boy nodded. Uh, okay. And without another word, Tori left them. She had to find Misha and Alec. There was another loud boom, and the world shook. Tori staggered forward. An Aleut man came running from the passage behind. Tori had been at the front of the company, nearly out of the mouth, when the rending of the world had begun. Everyone else in her company was behind her. Seven others followed the Aleut man, stumbling forward with the trembling of the ice. The leader shouted for them to hurry. He had a spear strapped to the back of his pack, and suddenly Tori remembered his name. Merrick! He was a hunter. He'd killed two stags in the Everwinter Forest. She grasped his shoulder and looked him in the eyes. They were wide with fright. You must leave the others out! The hunter was shaking. Do you hear me? Tori touched his shoulder. The rumblings faded, and the chasm ceased its expansion for the moment. The hunter nodded to her, a peace coming over him at her touch. Yes, my saint, I will not fail you. Take Benja and the others. The end is half a mile farther, Tori pointed north. You have to get them out. Merrick nodded again. What about you? The rest are behind us. I can't leave them. It was then Tori heard a roar, and she knew it was not the sound of shifting ice, just as she'd known the night before, deep down, when she and Alec had heard the rumblings. It was the sound of a living beast. Go! Get them out! Tori cried then took flight. She hadn't flown since the fall of the watchtower, but her body took to it again as though she'd still been practicing with Wren every day on Oran's mountain. That feels like another lifetime, Tori thought as she flew. And it was. It was before the end of the world had come upon them. Below her, people scrambled frantically through the passage along the narrow cleft beside the yawning crevasse. Tori crested a towering pillar of ice, and she saw the creature. A mighty roar echoed through the mouth of the gods, sending shivers darting across her skin. She knew it only from the old sage's tales around last night's fires and a faded memory of one of her mum's old stories, but she knew without doubt what it was. A frost giant. The beast held a woman in its massive hands, and Tori realized with horror that it was Gwyneth, Tessa's mother. Below, Misha launched a gust of flame at the beast, but it was of little use. There was nothing to ignite. The giant's skin was frozen solid, and the flame was doused in a great rush of steam. Alec stood beside Misha, jabbing desperately with a useless spear. Gwyneth looked like a doll in the giant's grasp. With its free hand, it launched a chunk of ice at Misha and Alec, who leapt aside just in time. My daughter, please, cried Gwyneth. Tesla was trapped beneath a fallen shard of ice at the giant's feet. Jordy tugged helplessly at her arm, but she was pinned down. Misha let fly another ball of flame, distracting the beast. It spun away from Tess to face her, and Tori seized the moment and landed. 
The ice flew free of Tessa's body with a flare of Tori's conjury power, and Tori helped Tess to her feet. The girl's leg gave out, crushed beneath the weight of fallen ice, and she screamed. Jordy gave the support of his shoulder. Get her away, Tori shouted. No, my mom, cried Tess. A shard of ice came flying at them, missing Jordy and Tess by a foot and exploding against the side of a pillar. Now, Tori commanded. The two hobbled feebly along the narrow ledge. Tori turned back just in time. A great icy arm the size of a tree trunk swung at her, and Tori leapt aside. The monster roared. Leave me, cried Gwyneth, still in the giant's clutches. Get my children out! But there was no way Tori could leave her. She had already lost Mary and the Watchers and probably half their company here in the mouth of the gods. Tori reached out with her sense, and everything seemed to slow. She could feel the makeup of the world, the tiny frozen droplets that composed every grain of ice. Her heart filled with rage at all the death, all the suffering. A massive shard of ice broke away with a twinge of Tori's sense and launched into the giant's legs. It dropped to its knees, but it was not enough. The shard of ice she'd thrown came flying back at her from the giant's hands. She dodged to the side, tumbling in the snow, and in that same instant the giant tossed Gwyneth aside and she disappeared, swallowed up by the crevasse. Just like that, Tess and Jordy's mother was gone. The beast lumbered toward her, ice flying at her like cannon fire. Misha launched another ball of flame to no avail. Tori blocked a few shards with a flare of conjury power, but it was too much. The giant launched chunk after chunk of ice the size of boulders. The earth trembled again, and Tori stumbled to her knees. When the ice hit her, Tori could feel the crunching of her ribs, the collapsing of her left lung, and the rush of blood within her chest. She lay in the snow and tried to move, but her limbs had been rendered immobile. Her head felt light, and she felt herself fading. The giant reached for her with icy paws. Vaguely, Tori could feel the pieces of her body fitting back together, her regenero power keeping her alive, but it was slow, and she had no time. The beast's fingers wrapped around her torso, and Tori was too weak to fight it. Someone behind her screamed. No! High-pitched, like the shriek of a falcon, the sound seemed to build and build, filling every space in the glacial maze. It reverberated off the ice building louder and louder, louder than any scream Tori had ever heard. Her ears rang and her head pounded. As the horrific shriek built even louder, the mouth of the gods shuddered, the crevasse groaning as it gaped even wider. Ice cracked beneath the giant's feet and it fell backward, taking Tori with it. With every bit of remaining strength, Tori reached out with her conjury sense and the great icy fingers released her. She leapt to safety, collapsing in the snow, and the frost giant disappeared into the abyss. The scream echoed for some time before dying away. When Tori turned, she found Tesla standing at the edge of the passage, her fist clinging to her brother's cloak. The crooked girl's chest heaved frantically. The scream had been hers. Slowly, Tori's body healed, and Misha and Alec helped her to her feet. When they reached Tesla, the girl collapsed from exhaustion. My mom, Tess murmured, tears welling in her eyes. Misha knelt by the girl's side, brushing the hair out of her face. Shh, you're all right. No, I'm not. She's dead. The ground trembled again at Tessa's scream. Tess broke into sobs, and Misha held her tight and rocked gently. What did I do? Tess whimpered. Tori took the girl's hand, realization dawning on her. That scream was magic awakening. Just as it once had in Tori so long ago on the day of the gallows. You saved us, Tess, Tori said. You saved us all. Part Two The Unraveling of the World there was a saying that arose after everything was over. 
The world must be undone before it can be remade. But no one believed that in those days. There was no hope, no world to come, no world to remake. To those who lived through the unraveling, it was the end of the world. From Dawn of the Third World Chapter 4 Kira Fain was in a constant state of anguish, and therefore so was Kale and Ovir, for he felt responsible for what the Chancellor had done to her, and there was nothing he could do. For weeks they had been secluded in the den of the Ilya, buried deep beneath the Yanavi capital, Liani. But this time not as prisoners. Kale had not seen Salaburo die, the newly crowned great sultane, since he had been chosen in the twisted game of power that was masked as the choosing of Arayeva. But it seemed his old friend bore some guilt for Kira's physical state, for Kira was attended daily by the Burodai family's very own Thrasi, an elderly tribesman named Azrahi, who administered an array of herbs and healing spells. Still, Kira's eyes were irreparably disabled, and she lived in that strange limbo between pain and sleep, death and life. The severe burns she'd sustained under the Chancellor's distortion of her own Lumeni power had rendered her eyesight useless and scarred the right side of her face beyond recognition. The tender, swollen skin was dressed with linens and oozed with pus. The room reeked with the smell of death. But Kale hardly noticed, nor cared. Kira was alive, if barely, and that was all that mattered. A few days ago she had shot up in bed, shouting and cursing, seemingly unsure what was dream and what was reality. It had taken the Thrasi and Kale both to keep her from harming herself. Afterward, she slept a full day before waking to violent delusions. Kale feared she might never recover. Each time Azrahi tended her wounds, he said, She is marred by fierce magic, stronger than my own. Some days Kira looked to be improving, and other days she thrashed about, plagued by dark fever dreams. Truth be told, Kale feared what would happen if she did recover. What would they do? Where would they go now that he'd betrayed all their fellow watchers? Betrayed her? Ashi, Sala's most trusted servant, had delivered the news that the watchtower had indeed been defeated. My brother? Kale had asked. Ashi shook her head, a strange look on her face. Ren is alive, in the Chancellor's dungeons. Kale had been overwhelmed by a confliction of guilt and relief. He had betrayed the location of his brother's rebel army, but at least it had not cost Ren his life. But what of the other Watchers, the symbol of the revolution? And the gallows girl? No one knows, Ashi said. It seems the legions were attacked by Nasferati while escorting her to Osha. The gallows girl was lost in the mayhem. Now Rulox and the race of cannibalistic demons had returned to the world of men, and Kale had enabled it to happen. But if he had not, Kira would be dead. The Chancellor already had the Godstones, so it would only have been a matter of time before Cyrus Morrow discovered the Watchtower. At least, that was what Kale tried to tell himself. It had been nearly a month since her encounter with the Chancellor when Kira began to stir. She was soaked in sweat and clammy to the touch. Kale fetched a bowl of water, took her hand, and helped her drink, uttering a prayer that she would not slip into another violent hallucination. She coughed as she tried to swallow, but the next sip went down easier. She leaned back and sighed. It was more life than she'd shown yet, and Kale dared to cling to hope that the worst might be over. Thank the gods, he whispered, squeezing her hand. Kira moaned and muttered something unintelligible. What do you need? he said. Where is he? Her voice was a mere rasp. I'm here, said Kale. Kira coughed and pulled her hand away from him. Not you, the Thrasi. Azrahi appeared in the archway and knelt at the bedside, 
his tunic of small beads rattling as he moved. He held his hand to Kira's forehead and smiled. I believe your fever has finally broken, my dear, he said. Arayeva be praised. Kira coughed again, and the Throssi helped her sip some more water. Praised? I'm still blind, aren't I? That wasn't part of the dream. It pained Kale to hear her speak the words, confirming his fears. It would not pass. No, said Azrahi carefully. He passed his hand in front of her eyes, but the sudden movement stirred no life in them. I, I'm afraid that was no dream. But you must remember, you could be dead, my dear. Like my friends? The Thrasi did not seem to know what to say. He helped her with another drink. I believe the worst has passed. As Rahi patted her hands, you will be in pain for some time, I expect, as your face continues to heal, but the infection has waned. Can you sit up? Kira was still terribly weak, but she managed to shift herself upright in bed. The Throssi began unbinding the wraps about her face. The oozing had eased up, and now the ruined skin shone red and swollen. He treated her wounds with a healing salve, then wrapped her eyes with a fresh layer of linen, thinner than the last. Tender flesh was left visible at the sides of the bandage, but it was good to see more of her face. It made her seem more like a person and less like a corpse being prepared in burial cloths. Thank you, Thrasi, Kira said sincerely. I owe you my life. I'm afraid I did precious little. The dark magic binding itself to you has lightened, though not by my doing. Arayeva is not finished with you yet, but you are welcome all the same. He patted her hands once more and then left them alone. Suddenly, the gravity of everything they had endured together washed over Kale. He loved her, and she was awake, and he knew they should speak, but he feared what she might say now that she was coherent. How do you feel? Kale said weakly. Hungry. I've had nothing but a bit of broth in... How long has it been? Nearly a month. Gods, said Kira. Is there any lamb in this pit? Kale smiled, grateful she'd not lost her sense of humor along with her sight. Maybe you ought to start with Yilki. He fetched her some of the Yanavi flatbread, and she ate voraciously. As she chewed, she winced, but it did not stop her eating. When she finished, she lay back against her pillow. Kale hated the sight of her like this but he was desperately grateful she was alive. Is she grateful? he wondered. You hardly left this room, she muttered. All the time I'd been out. I could sense you, even when I was lost in some terror. He could not tell if she was pleased by this fact. Her tone was flat, somber. You were on the verge of death. I couldn't leave you. I wanted to die. Kira said. You're tired. You should rest. Don't tell me what I need. She was growing angry, though he could sense she was holding back a rage far greater than her voice showed. I knew what I was risking, going back for the godstones. Kale did not know what to say. I was willing to die to protect the Shadow Watch. This time I was going to protect the others. Why did you come back? Her voice quavered. Why? I, I couldn't let you die. It wasn't your choice to make, she said bitterly. After what happened before, how could you take that away from me? Kale knew she was referring to their greatest regret, their failure to protect the young Watchers on the Isle of Jala all those years ago. Watchers not unlike Ren's Shadow Watch. Young sorcerer refugees led by a charismatic man from another age of the world. Even their leader had died. How many are dead at the watchtower, Kale? The Chancellor didn't kill them, just as he promised. I heard, said Kira, her anger subsiding into sadness. I may have been half delirious, but I heard when Ashi came to tell you about the Nosferati, the gallows girl, all of it. However many died this time, 
however many are being bled dry in the White Citadel. That blood is on you, Kale. All of it is on you. Kira trembled with sobs, her ruined eyes unable to produce tears any longer. You stole my sacrifice. Kira, please, I, I... He reached for her hand. All he wanted was to hold her, but she pulled away. A chasm greater than Jala, greater than the span of the great canyons of Dim, opened up between them, and Kale felt she was back in the other world, where Medea had taken her with the godstones. Kira had never seemed so far away. Leave me, she said hollowly, and let me grieve in peace. Kale knew it was futile to argue, so he left her. When he returned an hour later, she had drifted back to sleep, though this time it was not in fits. And for this, Kale thanked the gods. Kira improved more each day. A week later, she was able to get up and move about the room with Azrahi's assistance. She would accept no help from Kale. He remained close, but often found himself in the main room of the Iliad den when she was awake. At times, he would reach out for her mind, wishing for some connection, but she had walled herself from him more than ever. Azrahi was tending her wounds when Ashi came to see Kale, who sat outside Kira's chambers. A few Ilya milled about the central hall of the den, discussing how to deal with the son of Xander Mina, the Sultane Kale had helped Sala kill during the events of the choosing. It seemed that Sala saw Kale as an ally, for the Ilya did not try to mask their plot from him. Or perhaps Sala recognized Kale for the spineless, unthreatening coward he was. Ashi brushed his shoulder from behind, startling him. For someone who gave up everything for love, she said, you look like Shenza, Skyblood. She took the seat beside him at a round table bedecked with platters of roasted lamb and rice. Ashi was dressed in black Ilya garb, her hood drawn back to reveal a bronze face and curly dark hair pulled tight behind her head in a braid. Kale should have been appalled to see the Yanavi slave. Ashi and her master had betrayed him after all, and yet he was relieved to be spoken to without revulsion. He and Ashi had formed a curious bond during the events of the choosing. Despite her betrayal, she was about the closest thing he had left to a friend. A miserable truth. Kira despises me, and I don't blame her. I betrayed my own kind, betrayed her. The Chancellor gets what he wants, said Ashi. I imagine he'd have gotten the information from Kira eventually, even if you'd abandoned her like she asked. She'd have died before she betrayed them. Perhaps, said Ashi. Even if she had, he'd have found your watchtower in time. Spoken like someone defending their own betrayal. Ashi glared at him. You don't pick up on apologies, do you? Your list of allies is small, it seems to me. So don't act like you have any place to judge me. I did what I did for the good of my people. So did Sala. Kale sighed. Why are you here, Ashi? She rolled her eyes, her lips drawn tight. To make a peace offering, Skyblood. I don't regret what I did, but I wish it might have turned out differently for you, and for Kira. Ashi glanced at the archway to Kira's chamber at the end of the room, her normally settled expression turning with something like remorse. A lot of good it does us now. It may yet said Ashi. I am leaving in the morning. Leaving the Red City? My chief has asked me to attend his sister in the White Citadel as she prepares to become the Chancellor's Queen. I'll be joined by a company of servants and Ilya charged with looking after Vashti Burodai. What? said Kale. Doesn't Sala trust his closest ally? Sala would be a fool to trust the Chancellor. Why are you telling me this? because you and Kira should come with me. You can't be serious. I saw what Vashti could do before her father tried to burn her at the stake. I know how she healed. Your healers could help Kira. Kale longed so very much to be able to help her. 
It is not too late to ally yourself with the Chancellor, said Ashi. You already gave him the Shadow Watch. If you join him, he will heal her sky blood. I am sure of it. Besides, Sala says several of your watchers have already joined him. Your brother's revolution is over, but Kira's sight need not be. My brother is there. All the watchers I betrayed, said Kale. I couldn't face them. His dreams were already tormented by Ren, his mother, and the dead watchers from Jala. It was like the ghosts of Gen, ever dwelling in his nightmares to remind him of the countless times the exiled lord had failed those for whom he cared the most. Not even for her? Ashi whispered. She would never go, not even to regain her sight. Ashi held up a vial. You know this draft? Kale did. Ashi had used it to render him unconscious on more than one occasion in the past couple months. Sometimes we must choose what is best for the ones we love, in spite of their stubborn ideals. Neither of you can do anyone any good down here. Kale took the vial and stowed it in his cloak. I'll consider it. Ashi smirked. Consider quickly, Skyblood. We leave at dawn, with or without you. And with that, she was gone. When Kale returned to Kira's chambers, he found her sleeping again. Her wraps had been removed entirely, and her wounds were beginning to scar. The Thrasi applied a salve twice daily to aid the process. Her right eye was nearly closed over with scar tissue. Her left eye was intact, but clouded over. It still moved, but saw none of the world. The thought that all this could be undone was nearly more than Kale could bear. Perhaps Ashi was right. What good were they down here? What good was Kira in such a pitiful state? Kale eyed the vial. He held it up in the soft lamplight and considered the crimson liquid. Kira would never go to Morrow El willingly. He knew her too well for that. Her blindness was the curse of a failed sacrifice, and she had accepted it. Perhaps she thought it was her punishment for her failures, just as Kale saw it as punishment for his own. Should he accept her desires, then? Was that best? For her? For the rest of the Shadow Watch? For himself? There, he knew, was the truth of it. To take her to the White Citadel would be to temper his own guilt. It might restore her sight, but it would not bridge the chasm between them. To drug her would be to betray her all over again. That night, Kale did not sleep. Into the waking hours, he watched over Kira. It was the one time she seemed at peace with him there, and if he tried, he could catch glimpses of her dreams. Her subconscious was not lined with the walls she constructed when she was awake. But he quickly withdrew. With his cerebro magic, he sensed she was dreaming of being able to see again, and this pained him beyond his capacity. It was all he could do not to slip the Ilya draft into the bowl of water beside the bed. It was what she longed for deep down, to see, to be able to help the others. But no, he could not do it. Scarred and blind though she was, he still found Kira beautiful so strong, so fierce. He stroked her hand tenderly as she slept, how he loved the feel of her smooth olive skin. The touch brought back torturous memories of the night he'd beheld her in all her beauty, before the world had filled with horrors and guilt, when his entire world had been nothing but her lips, her skin, her love. The night on the Isle of Jala. So many times, he had wished to return to that night and never leave, never go beyond it, but never more than now. The space between them was filled with blood and nightmares and betrayal, but once they had been as close as two people could be, back before the night of the slaughter, the night they were both trying to redeem, both trying to forget. And now, because of Kale, they had one more night to regret. Their chasm was expanding wider and wider. It was said the great canyons of Dim, which spanned miles in some places, had once been mere gullies carved by rain, 
but over time they grew. Each snowmelt, each rainfall, each spring flood cut deeper and wider, deeper and wider, until the other side of the maze of canyons was like another world. Kale stowed Ashi's vial in his cloak again and vowed to dispose of it as soon as possible. He was about to find Ashi and tell her they would not be going to the White Citadel when Kira began to seize violently in bed. He took hold of her hand as she trembled. Her skin was cold, and then she shot up straight and screamed. Shh, said Kale. It's all right. It was only a nightmare. Kira's head shifted back and forth as though trying to see, caught between a dream and her sightless reality. Her grip was tight on his hand. Kale, you need to get the others, she shouted. What others? It was only a dream. Everything is fine. No, she shrieked. Can't you hear them? Chills pricked his skin like hornets at the sound of her voice. He had never heard such terror. Kira, hear what? She shoved him away. Get Ashi! Warn the Ilya! We have to get out of the city now! They're coming! Now it was Kale's turn to tremble. Who's coming? Kira's voice was firm and steady, fully awake now, and there was no mistaking the dread in her words. The terror of the wandering dunes, she said. Zarila! Chapter 5 Zarila, thought Kale. It's not possible. Though Kale heard nothing, he did as Kira ordered, hurrying to find Ashi before she left the Red City for Osha. The urgency in Kira's voice left him without doubt. He did not understand how Kira could hear Zarila, but her tremulous voice had filled him with terrible chills. The monsters were the most notorious beasts in all Yanavi folklore, said to have plagued the people during their years wandering the desert at the dawn of the new world. Kale had always thought them nothing but a superstitious explanation for the sandstorms and sinkholes common in the wandering dunes. The thought that the beasts might be real made Kale's stomach lurch. First Rulox and Nosferati, and now this? He found Ashi in the den of the Ilya, loading supplies with a pair of young Ilya boys. The moment Kale told her what Kira had heard, Ashi begged him to fly to the Red Palace to warn Sala before it was too late for the entire city. But Kale hesitated. I, I can't leave Kira. You must. Kira came stumbling blind into the room after him. Ashi took hold of her hand and led her to a table for support. Kale, hurry, please, Kira murmured, clutching at her temples. It's getting louder. They are almost upon the city. I'll get her out, said Ashi, or I'll die by her side, but only if you can get to Sala in time. I don't know the way from the den, Kale said. Ashi took his hand fiercely. Her skin was searing. For the second time, the Yanavi slave let down the mental walls Sala had taught her to build against Kale's cerebro gift, and she opened her mind to him. Through her eyes, he saw vividly the network of tunnels beneath the Red City the Ilya's secret path. Now fly, Skyblood! And Kale did. He flew down dark, winding chambers, following Ashi's intricate mind map. When Kale emerged from a drainage grate outside the Red Palace, it was dawn, the Sol glowing blood red as it crested the wandering dunes. The sudden light stung his eyes. He had not seen the sun in weeks. It was a red dawn a sign of Arayeva's anger and despair. And Zarila are approaching Vliani, Kale thought. Perhaps there is something to their goddess after all. Kale flew from the earth and rose above the radial formation of streets and sandstone buildings. The red palace rose above everything, the heart of the Yanavi capital, with the golden temple of Arayeva at its zenith. The temple glowed in the early light, Kale knew the great sultan's chambers were situated beneath the temple. He had saved Sala from assassination there only weeks ago. Kale could sense Sala's mind dimly. It was still guarded by subconscious walls, but Kale sensed enough to know he was in his chambers. Kale flew to a ledge on the western side of the palace and entered through a high window. 
the Red Palace was well guarded. Through normal entrance, Kale would have had to pass through seven gates and several companies of guards, but Sala's window surmounted a sheer wall of sandstone, which towered two hundred feet over the awakening city. Even if someone could fight through all the security below, it would be nearly impossible to scale the smooth stone tower. Kale flew the distance with ease and landed softly in Sala's chambers. Set before the western window was a statue of Arieva, a beautiful sandstone woman, naked but for the flaming soul held at her waist. Outside the eastern window, the soul crested the dunes, and Sala knelt in prayer before a second identical statue. Odd, considering the man's lack of fervor toward his people's faith. He wore only a plain white tunic. His dark hair was unkempt, and his face unshaven a stark contrast to his normally well-maintained appearance. His lips moved with inaudible words, and he was apparently oblivious to Kale's arrival. But then Sala spoke aloud. Have you come to kill me, Skyblood? Sala sounded at peace, despite the potential threat. Or perhaps he was simply not afraid of Kale. No, he said. Sala chuckled strangely. I would not blame you. If you were, a red sun rises, just as it did the day I killed my father. Was that regret in his voice? I'm not here to kill you. I'm here to warn you. Zari La are descending upon Vliani. Sala breathed heavily, rendered silent by the vile name. That can't be possible. His voice rang hollow. You don't have time to find out. If you hesitate, it may be too late. Sala was still kneeling. He seemed almost in a trance. How could you possibly know Zarilar coming, old friend? Kira heard them from the den, said Keo. She, she heard them? He stared out the window, perhaps listening for them himself. But the morning was as still as the uninhabited valleys of the crimson mountains of the far east. Kale was baffled as well. How could Kira possibly hear them? Kale had heard nothing in the den. At first, he'd thought she was hallucinating, caught in the remnants of a nightmare. But Ashi believed her, and so must he. I don't know how, but Kira heard them approaching. We have to go. He took Sala by the arm, firmly, and jerked him to his feet. At this, Sala came back to life. Sala cursed, took one last glance at the rising soul, and murmured another prayer. Jeshu, Davin! he cried out, and two Ilya appeared immediately through the immense Socha doors to Sala's chambers. When they saw Kale, they drew their sabers. Filthy sky blood! At ease, Sala said, raising his hands. Davin stammered. But my chief, how could he? We have not left your chamber doors all night, I swear it, pleaded Jeshu. He flew, said Sala simply. And now, so must you. Sound the horns. We must evacuate the city. The bane of our people has returned. At the mention of Zawi La, both guards nodded fearfully. My chief, said Jeshu, what about you? I am with the Skyblood. Now hurry. The Ilya regarded Kale skeptically, but withdrew at a sprint to sound the ancient horns of Zawi La. Vestiges of the old world. The horns were the only thing that could warn the people in time. Ashi and the others, said Sala. They're fleeing the den, said Kale. I realize it is much to ask, Skyblood, but my fate lies in your hands once more. Ashi is getting Kira out alive. I promised to do the same for you, and fortunately for you I am through with betrayal. Kale took Sala by the wrist. Let's fly. Kale and Sala flew from the window of the royal chambers. Kale was not a strong flyer, but he hoped he could reach the edge of the city. They soared over the gates of the palace. That was when he felt Kira's cry in his mind. Oh, gods, they're still in the tunnels. Without explanation, he descended. What are you doing? Sala protested. I, I can't bear you any farther, Kale lied. Cradling Sala in his arms like a child, Kale slowed their descent at the last moment. He landed in a crouch outside the palace walls and set Sala down. 
the horns of Zarila began booming across the city. Giant tusks of an ancient behemoth, the horns were set along the walls of the Golden Temple, situated beside much smaller horns that rang out each morning and evening to call the Yanavi to prayer. The horns have not been blown in over three hundred years, said Sala darkly as they hurried through the streets. Kale felt sick. They had to reach the tunnels quick. The deep bellow of the horns of Zarila resounded across the city, distinct from any other sound Kale had ever heard. The guttural booming made the streets themselves vibrate. At least Kale hoped that was the reason. Though the people of Liani had never heard the horns in their lives, they responded immediately with terror and panic. The streets of Liani became teeming chaos, like a colony of war ants after their hive was destroyed. People screamed, flung belongings into the streets, and made frantically for the northern gates of the city, which led to the vast plains of the steppe. The horns bellowed beneath it all like a marching beat no one was following. The city seethed in one throbbing mass of mayhem, and Kale and Sala were stuck in the middle, weaving through walls of pressing bodies. No one even realized that their great sultane was in their midst. Sala was shoved aside like anyone else as the Yanavi fled. Kale seized Sala's wrist and jerked him down a side street, both of them shoving their way through the crowd. We've got to go underground, Kale cried. He gestured to a cleft in a wall, similar to the one Kale had emerged from only minutes ago. What have you sensed? Sala demanded, stopping in the narrow, vacant alley of red stone. Kira and Ashi are still in the den. Sala nodded, his eyes growing fierce. Kale didn't know for certain that Ashi was still with Kira, or even alive, but his words had the desired effect. Sala cared for his devoted servant. Let me lead the way. They slipped through the cleft in the sandstone wall, slinked through a narrow corridor, then Sala opened a grate, which led to the network of hidden tunnels beneath the Red City. Sala gripped his wrist and led the way in the dark. They reached the den to find it empty. Tables were overturned, provisions and crates and clothes were strewn about the room, and in the far wall there was a dark chasm that hadn't been there before. Zarala was here. Kale pushed back bile and reached out with his senses. No sign of Kira. Sala grabbed his wrist, and they hurried on down the twisted labyrinth of tunnels beneath the Red City. The noise of the fleeing masses faded, and Kale finally heard what Kira had somehow sensed from afar. A horrid, grinding sound, like soldiers marching upon a field of skulls. The ground trembled beneath their feet. It was the approach of Zarila. Era Yeva, have mercy, Sala murmured. He gripped Kale's wrist harder, and they pressed on as quickly as possible through the dark. Sala's prayer filled Kale with a greater terror than the sound. The grinding grew in intensity the deeper they ventured. Soon it was a mighty roar, and the ground roiled beneath their feet as they staggered forward. Without warning, Sala shoved Kale to the ground. The roar reached a fever pitch. There was a great rush of air, and a horrid stench permeated the chambers. And then, all at once, the roar ceased. The monster was directly ahead. Kale could sense its mind, or rather the mind of the many Rila. He could not tell whether they shared one mind or were simply tethered together by some mysterious telepathy. But in one glimpse, he unraveled a mystery that centuries of myths had only guessed at. Zarila were many individual beasts, interconnected, functioning as one, sharing their knowledge as they ascended from the depths of the wandering dunes. The onslaught of their dark sentience overwhelmed him. Kale swore he could see silver eyes in the darkness ahead. A slithering sound echoed off the cavern walls as the beast tasted the air. It was searching for one thing, the scent of humans. Deep breaths echoed through the caverns, a throaty wheeze that left a rancid sulfuric odor in the air. Kale and Sala held perfectly still, but Kale felt the foul breaths, hot and humid, upon his face, as though a wall of stench were pressing in on him. The beast sensed them. 
the slithering sound grew until Kale could taste the Rila's stench. His stomach churned. But then he sensed an awakening in the shared mind of Zarila. Some of the horde had reached the surface, where a delectable human feast awaited, all gathered in one place for the slaughter. And in a moment the grinding sound returned, the stench faded, and Kale's sense of Zarila drifted until it was but a vague anticipation of blood and violence. He let out a long-held breath of relief. Sala was trembling. I thought we were dead, Skyblood. Let's pray the others are not, was all Kale said. He felt nothing in his senses. They were too overwhelmed with the countless dying minds in the world above, mixed with the bloodlust of Zari La. He and Sala pressed forward once more. The beast left a yawning chasm in the tunnel, just as it had in the den. It had burrowed straight through the earth, cutting a brand new channel. Kale wondered if Zarila had cut the passage they were in now, centuries and centuries ago. Kale flew them across the gaping space, and they surged on into the dark. It took what felt like hours of weaving through the winding maze of tunnels, but eventually... Kale and Sala reached the end of the depths. He knew they were close and let out a deep sigh of relief when he felt Kira's mind open to him. They came to the end of the tunnel. A large stone shifted forward at Sala's behest, and they emerged in a red sandstone tower a league outside the city walls. Ashi and Kira and the other Ilya were waiting for them. Kale rushed to Kira and took her in his arms, beyond grateful that she was alive. And for once, she returned his affection. Kira gripped him tight. You took so long, she said. I worried you didn't make it out of the city in time. Why did you go into the tunnels? I heard you cry out. One of the beasts attacked the den. We barely made it out alive. Kale held her tight. Ashi and Sala greeted one another in the way of the Yanavi, clasping forearms. It was the formal greeting of equals, not of a king and his servant. Thank you, Skyblood, said Ashi, glancing over at him, for saving my chief. Kale nodded his own thanks, grateful to have Kira safely in his arms. Chapter 6 the Red City roiled like a den of serpents, whirlwinds of sand and debris rising from the streets and shrouding the infamous Zarila as they consumed the city. From a distance, atop the sandstone tower at the edge of the steppe, Kale and the others watched helplessly as buildings crumbled and the sky filled with screams. After many hours, it seemed like the Red Palace would survive the onslaught, but then it, too, was shrouded in whirlwinds of sand and when they had settled, half the palace had fallen away. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the crumbling of stone and the wails of the dying ceased. The attack was over. A stream of survivors poured onto the plains. That night, Ashi lit a beacon at the peak of the tower to guide their way to refuge. Thanks to Kira's warning, many had escaped the city before Zarila arrived, and soon there were thousands of Yanavi gathered at the banks of the spillway, before the outpost tower where their great sultane resided safe and sound. Over the next few days, Sala sent out teams to search for more survivors, and, miraculously, there were some found in the debris. Kale's gift proved vital in locating them. With his cerebro sense, he found many under piles of rubble and lost in gaping crevasses left behind in the sandstone. The city was riddled with a thousand such holes, making it look like one great corpse after a firing squad had done its dark deed. The search was slow work, and it was many days before Sala called a council of the surviving sultanes to declare an end to the search, to anoint successors for the dead chieftains, and to decide their next move as a people. Five of the sultanes had been safe on the steppe with their tribes at the time of the attack. Of those in the city, three were lost, and it fell to their eldest sons to rise up in their late father's steads. When the anointing ceremony had been completed, 
the great Sultane gathered the chiefs of the twelve tribes in the commander's quarters in the sandstone guard tower. Kale and Kira were not invited. They waited by a cook fire outside, amidst the large refugee camp that had formed on the banks of the river. The great spillway was the life source for the Yanabi, the mighty river formed from the runoffs of the crooked teeth and the spine of the north, weaved and built for hundreds of miles across the gray waste to the steppe. The spillway ran all the way to the Bay of Trium at the southwestern edge of the continent. It was the largest river in the New World, and without it the steppe would be an arid wasteland, and the herdsmen would be able to maintain no livelihood upon the steppe. Littles were playing at the shore of the river, boys and girls running naked and splashing one another as their mothers washed clothes on the bank. They were squealing with laughter. It seemed absurd after so many dark days. It's amazing, isn't it? said Kira. How littles can find such joy, even at a time like this. Childish ignorance, said Kale. Their world is in shambles. Their chieftains meet to decide how the tribes will survive this travesty, and they laugh and play, oblivious. It's a gift. What would the world be without laughter? Kale could not remember the last time he had laughed out of such pure joy, but he remembered a world before this darkness. He held on to the memory, though he did not dare entertain the notion that its world would return to him. He was grateful Kira was speaking to him again. It was joy enough for now. Kale squeezed Kira's hand briefly. She flinched ever so slightly at his touch. Whether from surprise at the contact or subdued disdain, he did not know. It would be a world without littles, he said at last. A world with no future, one not worth fighting for, gods. Kira's face turned toward the children's squeals. I wish I could see their faces. I've always thought it was one of the most beautiful things, the eyes of a child. Kale did not know what to say to this. Kira's blindness was still such a strange concept to grasp. He could not imagine how hard it must be for her. She had not spoken of it since she'd awoken, at least not to him. Your sight could be returned if we went to the White Citadel. But he did not say it. Ashi paced nearby, muttering irritated curses, but she soon grew tired of it and joined them around the cook fire. Well, you were right after all, Skyblood, weren't you? Ashi said, taking a seat. About what? That Salah's alliance with the Chancellor is in shambles. It just did not show until after the choosing, until after he'd gotten what he'd wanted from my prince. How so? How else do you suppose Zari La rose out of the desert to attack our city for the first time in over three hundred years? The Chancellor brought back Rulaks to the north, and now this. Ashi gestured at the skeletal remains of Liani in the distance. The sight reminded him of the ruined cities of the ancient world, the necropoly of the ruined empire of Fair. Once magnificent centers of a sprawling empire, now crumbling wastes overgrown with foliage and time. I thought there were attacks reported in the New World, said Kira, when your people were exiled in the desert. Tales, said Ashi, there have been such claims since. Any dead body found in the desert is blamed on Zarila, but no one has ever seen the attacks because no one ever survives, they say. You saw how they killed. They swallowed people whole. Real beasts would have left no bodies behind out in the desert for us to find. This is the Chancellor's doing, just like the Rulaks and the Nosferati. Kale wanted to agree with her. But why would the Chancellor order a slaughter like this? right after forming an alliance with a Yanavi. Salah sent ravens to Osha, he said. They are fighting their own war with the Rulaks. Ashi spat into the fire, which aroused a glare from an old maid tending the kettles. Shensa! Ashi swore in Yanavi. You sound like Salah, an army of Rulaks. Yes, I heard. If it's true, I hope they raise the city. I hope they turn his white citadel to crimson. Kira reached out and found Ashi's hand. 
It amazed Kale how she was adapting to life guided by sound rather than light. Don't wish vengeance upon all at the Chancellor's expense. There are innocents in Osha, just as here. Pa! But that was all Ashi could muster for some time. She stared off at her ruined city, glowering silently. Well, something must be done. There are ten thousand dead at last count. Thousands more will be added in the end. Ere Yeva, I wish I could sit in on the Sultan's meeting. A sudden thought came to her, and Kale sensed her question before she asked. Skyblood, you have your sorcery. What can you make of their council? Kale had been catching portions of it for some time, though he did not particularly care what they decided. His thoughts were on Kira and where they should go next. Kira was near fully recovered, except for her blindness. It was time they talked of their own next move. They need not be ensnared in the affairs of the Anavi any longer. He shook his head. You won't like it, Ashi. Tell me. The chieftains don't know of the Chancellor's godstones, nor the door they open between worlds. And Sala does not plan to reveal that knowledge. They helped Sala steal his way to the Great Saddle, he thought. If they knew, Sala would be a dead man. All they know is that Sala sealed an alliance with Osha. They have no reason to suspect the Chancellor. But they protested the alliance, said Ashi. We have always despised Osha, ever since the first Chancellor exiled us to the desert. Kale almost laughed at the irony. It would seem that most of the chieftains are rethinking their hatred. Most of the food stores in the city have been laid to waste, and winter is fast approaching. Aid from Osha looks suddenly quite appealing. The councils are never that united, Ashi protested. There must be some dissent. It was true. The tribes of the Yanavi were not known for their unity. They often warred against one another, usually territorial squabbles. And Kale knew all too well, when it came to the choosing of the great Sultane, they were not beneath murdering one another. Disaster has a way of subsiding old rivalries, said Kale. From what I can gather, Zerdan Mina is the only opponent, and since his father's manipulation of fate was exposed at the choosing, he is not exactly a convincing voice on the council. Ashi spat in the fire again, and the old maid shooed her away. With a heavy sigh, Ashi stood. We'll fall groveling at the Chancellor's feet for aid? All this reeks of the Chancellor. She stormed off and left them alone once more. Kale watched the children playing again for a while. One sprinted from the pack and raced to her father's arms. He'd just returned from guard duty, judging from his attire. The father twirled the little girl around. She squealed with joy, and together they made their way to their tent. Kale despised the soul tains and the corrupt workings of the Red Palace. Their system was riddled with cruel injustices, generally originating from the chieftains. But the Yanavi people were much like all others. Littles, caring mothers, and doting fathers. Still, he was ready to be done with the Yanavi. The council's nearly over, said Kira. How can you tell? said Kale, surprised. I can hear them rousing in the tower. Kale had been wanting to ask from the moment she'd told him she could hear Zarela. In his heart he already knew the answer. Her hearing had never been so acute before. Kira, how can you hear them? How did you hear Zarela? Kira did not answer at once. Her eyes blinked without sight, and she shifted her posture. My Lumini gift is worthless now. She touched her scarring face and winced. I, I think a new power is growing, as though to replace it. Her voice betrayed her anger at accepting the finality of her lost sight. She crossed her arms and leaned against a bundle of supplies and said nothing for some time. A new gift. Kale did not understand how that could be possible. According to the traditions of the ancient Watcher Order, the realms of magic were static. Kale was a Cerebro. He ruled the realm of minds, and that was all. Kira was a Lumeni and she ruled the realm of light. 
there was no transcending that gift. Kira had never shown an affinity toward any other realm of magic before. There were some who did. The Magi, those with more than one affinity. His mother had told him tales of such sorcerers. They were reviled by most leaders of the old Watcher order. They were seen as unnatural, too ambitious, but they had always fascinated Kale as a boy. Perhaps it is true, what Mother said, that magic has no limit. How else could it be explained? Kira had never shown it before, but with her Lumeni gift rendered useless, she was showing sure signs of the Sonara, who ruled the realm of sound. And Kira was right about the council being finished. Moments after she'd heard them, the Soltanes emerged from the tower and returned to the camps of their respective tribes. How is that possible? he responded finally. How could you possess another gift? Kira sighed. I don't know, Kale. Before I lost my sight, I never heard a thing out of the ordinary. But as I lay in that bed in the Iliaden, I found myself focusing more on sound to gain any knowledge of my surroundings. I could tell when you entered by your gait, by the timbre of your breaths. Azrahi was distinct by the soft rustle of his beads. Ashi steps lightly on the balls of her feet, and her breaths are slow and restricted as though constantly trying to pass unnoticed. The more I focus, the more acute my hearing grows. Subtle shifts of clothing, footsteps, heartbeats, all betray movement. I can't see it, but the world is alive with sound. That's incredible, he said. Kira was not smiling. I know I should be grateful, but I find myself resisting it, trying not to hear things, as though... If I do, I will accept the fact I will never see again. You saved us. Kira was silent for some time. She bit her lip, and he could tell she was fighting tears. Lumeni power has always been part of me, just as much as my eyes themselves. This hearing feels like a pegged leg, a sorry excuse for a replacement. I'd give anything to be a Lumeni again. When the council was finished, Sala adjourned to confer with the Barodai elders, but not before Ashi accosted him with inquiries about the meeting. She came away disappointed and stamped off to the edge of the camp. Kale and Kira ate with the Barodai tribesmen, and it was during dinner that Sala approached them. Despite residing within the safety of the tower, Sala Barodai still ate with his tribe, a trait Kale respected about the man. He was smiling as he took his seat. Kale offered some rice and roasted kela, but the great sultan waved it away. No, eat well, old friend. You both have offered more than enough already. Have we? My people owe you a great debt for warning us, for helping us locate survivors in our ruined city. The tribes have always been suspicious of the skybloods, who wield magic without spells, fly without wings but you have shown them that all the horrid tales of the old world are not true. It was known that the Yanavi bore no love for the Watchers. They blamed them for the war between the worlds and the ensuing fall of the old world, the events that led to their exile. There is honor among Skybloods, and I hope we all may put aside past differences. Like an alliance with the Chancellor, said Kale. Sala smiled resignedly. I'm afraid we need the aid of Osha more than ever, old friend. The chiefs are unanimous on this matter. We will cross the steppe and seek refuge at the city of Pendra. As soon as affairs are settled and provisions are secured for my people, I will journey to Maro El, and my sister will be wed to the Chancellor as promised. The sister your people believe dead, said Kale. The Yanavi were superstitious when it came to the dead. Vashti had been publicly burned by her father because of her watcher magic. For her to apparently rise from the dead now would be seen as grossly unnatural. The Zora tribe lives on the southern steppe near the great canyons of Deem, only one hundred leagues from the Triumvir. Fair Zora's daughter, Sheva, is pledged to a great merchant in Vel 
and has spent the last five years in the city being trained in the customs and languages of the Triumph. Now she is a grown woman, and her people have not known her looks since she was but a young girl. Fair Zora is an ancient ally of my family, and he has agreed. In the eyes of my people, a marriage between Sheva and the Chancellor will seal our alliance. And what will become of the real Sheva? asked Kira suspiciously. She will marry the merchant as before. She was to be lost from the tribe anyway. Ferrazora may even go to see his beloved daughter when they journey to trade in the Triumphal. Sala always had a plan. Kale couldn't deny that. Then all is well, isn't it? said Kale pointedly. My city is in ruins, Skyblood. Do not make light of what we have lost. Why are you telling us all this, Sala? Because while all may seem well with this alliance, I fear it stands at the edge of a cliff, and right now my sister is all alone in the White Citadel. You're still sending Ashi to attend her, I trust. Sala nodded. She told you. And you want us to join her, Kale finished for him. Yes, Skyblood. Ashi is strong, and there will be other Ilya in her company but we know little of Watcher magic. I need you to see that Vashti is treated well until the wedding. Kale could not believe the man's audacity. We may have aided your people in the middle of a cataclysm, but we are far from allies. You will make me beg? So be it, said Sala. He clasped Kale's hand between both his palms. I wish it might have happened another way, Skyblood. My sister... One of your kind needs you. Forgive me if I'm not sympathetic, but your sister betrayed her kind. And you did not? We all do what we must with what we are given. Then why must we help you, Sala? What are we being given? Kale's eyes bore into the great Sultanes. He was through with the man's manipulation. I think you know, Skyblood. Did you think Ashi's proposal came only from her? What proposal? said Kira. That was your plan all along, wasn't it? said Kale, disregarding her. To get us to go. Now more than ever, said Sala. What proposal? Kira demanded, grabbing his wrist. Ashi asked us to come with her to the White Citadel so your eyes might be healed in exchange for our pledged loyalty to the Chancellor. Kira was silenced. Her mouth hung open. The offer still stands, said Sala. I will send word of my confidence in your loyalty, along with a request that Kira be restored. There were healers in the Shadow Watch, were there not? Kale nodded. Then go, pledge your loyalty, and restore your sight, Kira. We will not betray our friends again, said Kale. Sala was clenching his fists. You are no good to any of them here, Skyblood. What is your plan? To wander the crooked teeth with a blind woman in search of the gallows girl? To run away from it all? Kira reached for him and missed, her hand patting at the ground until she found his arm. He's right, Kale. Her voice trembled as though she were convincing herself. What do you mean? He felt sick. Kira squeezed Kale's arm. We will not be the first watchers to join his Skyguard. Most of the others have done the same. Kira, the Chancellor can't be trusted. Kira released his arm with a slight shove. She pointed to her scars. Do you think I don't know that? No one can be trusted. Not even me. It stung, but he knew she was right. He couldn't believe she was saying it, but he could not argue with her. He had lost that right. The Chancellor will truly restore my sight, Sala? Kira asked. In exchange for your pledge of loyalty, said Sala, I will make sure of it. Then we will go with Ashi, said Kira. We will go to the White Citadel and pledge our loyalty. Excellent, said Sala. You leave at first light. Part 3. 
the ice city. The Aleut people once inhabited the lands now known as Osha. Long ago, in the ancient days of the old world, they were driven from their lands by fair-skinned Elians with strange and powerful gifts from the gods. Aleut hatred for the southern peoples ran deep in their blood, passed down generation to generation for centuries. From Dawn of the Third World Chapter 7 Nineteen of the company died in the mouth of the gods, leaving forty alive, but they had no time to mourn. Only the gods knew how many more giants lurked in the depths of the crevasses. Tori and her followers fled the treacherous maze of ice and headed north, toward the Aleut settlement of Ulak, and no sooner had they set out across the sprawling icelands than a fierce roar rose up from the mouth, followed by a series of others, building and building off one another into a haunting cacophony. Tori shuddered. The giants are calling to one another, Misha muttered. I think it's a cry of mourning, said Tori, unsure why she thought it or how she could know it, but she felt strangely sure. Tess had killed one of their brethren, and we must get far away quickly. Misha shrugged and pressed on, dragging a sledge filled with supplies behind her. All of them were shaken to the core. No one said more than a few sparse words. Tesla was pulled along on a sledge due to the injuries to her leg. Misha kept close to her, but the crooked girl remained speechless, withdrawing into her own mind, eyes staring off at a formless world. Her young brother, Jordy, was shell-shocked, but occasionally Tori noticed him regarding his sister with a querulous look, his eyes narrowing at her. Alec would not let them rest until they were well clear of the mouth of the gods and the frost giants that were rising there. The company trekked into the dark. The nights were growing much longer, Tori had noticed. Alec said that in the depths of winter there were times the darkness never ended, one black night bleeding into the next. Tori hoped she would not remain in the north long enough to see such unending darkness. Finally, they made camp their work illuminated by the lights of Anora, brilliant streams of haunting green hues. When the yurts were set, Tori took a look at Tessa's injured leg. It had been nearly crushed by a shard of ice. At the watchtower, Tori had brought Wren back from the brink of death, but she wasn't truly a Medici healer. The bones in Tessa's leg had been shattered, and Tori couldn't hasten the body's growth of tissue and fusion of bone. She could only fit things into place. And when she did, Tess felt every bit of it. But the young girl never screamed. She bit down hard on a strip of leather and held still until it was over. You're very brave, Tori said, squeezing her hand when it was finished. And strong as an ox. Tess nodded, but said nothing. Tori could tell she was trying hard not to cry. And she felt helpless to comfort her. What was there to say? Tori had no answers for what had happened, and Tori hated the trite things people often said when they were desperate to comfort others. The gods have a plan. We all have a time to sail on to the next world. What a load of Shenza, Tori thought. If the gods were real, they had lost all control over their plans for the world. Or perhaps we were wrong about the benevolence of the gods. Perhaps death and destruction was their plan all along. After all Tori had seen in the past few weeks, it was difficult to see the world any other way. Yet Mary's last words stuck deep in her mind. Keep believing there's good left, in Darien and in all this world. But Tori could not bear the thought that the gods would allow a lovely girl like Tesla to lose both her parents in a matter of weeks. Using pine from a damaged sledge, Tori fashioned a splint for Tessa's leg and a crutch to help her walk. This'll have to do for now, until that leg heals properly. Thank you, my saint, said Tess feebly. You can call me Tori, she said, touching the girl's cheek. We're no different, you and me. You're a watcher. Okay, Tess stood, 
supporting herself on the crutch. I'm sorry I can't do more, Tess. You'll need to ride in the sledge until we reach Ikala, but the crutch will get you around camp. Don't try to use that leg, you hear? Tess nodded. Tori wanted to talk to her. Surely she was full of questions about the meaning of her gifts. Tori had certainly been when her own powers emerged, but she sensed that it was all too overwhelming for the young girl. She needs to mourn. There will be time for questions later. They both went to join the others, but Tess left the supper fires without touching her food and hobbled to the outskirts of camp, alone. Tori knew she was continuing the late-night morning ritual her mother had begun for their father. Now Tess had both parents to grieve, and the confusion of an unknown gift arising moments too late. Misha watched her go and quickly rose to follow. Mish, perhaps it'd be... I'm just going to be sure she doesn't wander off too far. You heard the Aleut. Giants aren't the only things we have to fear this far north. Rogue Aleut clans wandered these plains. They had raided more than one trading company on this route, according to Alec. Even in this bleak world of nothing, there was war and betrayal. A fact that had Alec more on edge than Tori had ever seen him. Jordy watched his sister leave as well his face tightening with visible anger, then softening to the point of tears. She might have saved her, Jordy whimpered. Her mom. Tori squeezed his hand, overwhelmed with sorrow for the boy. He was little older than she had been the day her own mother abandoned her. I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. There's nothing Tess could have done. But could I have saved her? The thought had been nagging at Tori's heart the entire trek from the mouth. If only Tori had reacted quicker. If only she hadn't been overtaken by the beast's onslaught of ice. She was strong. She could have beaten that monster. But she hadn't been prepared, and it all happened so quickly. Why not? said Jordy, an edge to his voice. She's magic, like you. Tori forced a kind smile, in spite of the guilt rising within her. She thought of the ghosts of Gen. How many would haunt her now in that place? The boy should be blaming me. You've heard how I first revealed my power, haven't you? Jordy nodded, wiping freezing tears from his cheeks. You destroyed the Chancellor's gallows in front of the whole world. Did you know that was the first time I ever used magic? It was a subtle lie. Tori could not truly remember a time before then she'd used magic. She simply knew there had been a time. But those memories had been taken from her. The boy's eyes went wide. Really? My magic was revealed to me, much as it was your sister. I was trying to save someone, too. Who? The boy they were hanging on the gallows. He was my friend, but I wasn't able to save him any more than Tess could save your mom. Tori didn't tell Jordy that the boy had lived, that Tori had saved Darian, only to have him turned into a monster. We both were just a little too late. Tori squeezed Jordy's hand tight. Don't blame your sister. You need to be strong for her. You need each other more than ever. The boy nodded to his saint. Should I go find her? Tori smiled. Right now, I think Tess needs to grieve alone, but be ready when she returns. I will, said Jordy. I'll be strong. Your mom died to save you, Jordy. Never forget that. Now you should rest, said Benja, the old man from the mouth, coming up from behind the boy. Leave our gallo saint to her own thoughts a while. Jordy thanked her and then went to the tents with the old crooked man. The lights of Enora had calmed to mere traces of color, thin ribbons that wrapped around the twin moons of the new world. The sisters glowed with a violet hue. The others soon retreated to their own tents, and Tori was left alone at the fire for several minutes before Alec de Baruch took a seat beside her. He, too, seemed to be in shock, staring off into the sifting flames. His lips moved with silent prayers. 
I led those people to their deaths, he muttered eventually. It was the first time since they'd met that Alec had lost all traces of optimism. Tori shook her head. You cannot carry the weight of the dead, Alec. I insisted those rumblings were just the ice moving. I've traveled that passage a dozen times. We came through only weeks ago on our journey south. I've lived my entire life on the ice. I should have known. I could have stopped this, but I, I didn't want to believe it. The guardians of the Great White North were only myths. You couldn't have known. No one's seen a frost giant in hundreds of years. Not since the old world, said Tori. Alec merely nodded. Tori's stomach knotted up inside her, a dark fear creeping up. The world is coming apart, Alec said. It's like someone drove a spear into a crack in the ice, and now the entire sheet is breaking at the seams. Tori grasped his hand. There is still hope, Alec. The words seemed to come from outside her, just as they had the day she'd first embraced her role as the gallows saint, back in the caverns in the crooked teeth. They were the words Tori wanted to believe, though she knew she did not deep down. But a saint had to inspire others, so she spoke the words as much to Alec as to herself. Look at Tesla. She's a watcher. Our order believes the gods are bringing magic back to the world for a reason, bestowing gifts once more on ordinary boys and girls to raise up a new generation of watchers. There will be more. The world may be breaking, but it's not lost. Alec chuckled. Now you're sounding more like me than myself. More like Wren, actually. She pushed the thought from her mind. She sounds like a saint, said Misha, returning from the edge of camp. She took a seat beside Tori. How's Tess? Tori said. She's tough, but on top of her mother's death, I think she's pretty shaken by what she did in the mouth. Can't blame her for that, said Alec. It's always a shock when you discover magic, said Misha, perhaps remembering the day she too had unearthed her watcher gifts. It struck Tori that she had never heard how Misha had come into her abilities. It was strange. They had been through so much. In some ways Misha felt closer than a sister, and yet there was so much Tori did not know about her friend. I wish it didn't take tragedy to make it reveal itself, Tori murmured. Magic shows when it must, said Misha. That's what Wren would say. Gods, is he even alive? she wondered. She hoped desperately that he was, that all of the Watchers were, even the ones who had betrayed them. Alec poked a stick into the fire, stirring the coals. Well, that's good news, considering the state of the world. There should be a lot of magic rising up. The three of them grew silent. The lights of Anora surged in the northern sky, as though the ribbons were trying to choke out the light of the sisters. Misha finally broke the stillness. Tori, where do you think these beasts are coming from? First the Rulaks, then the Nosferati, now frost giants, all the legends from the old world suddenly roaring to life. Tori could tell Misha already knew the way she touched her arm as she waited for an answer. But even so, it was difficult to muster words to the fear that had been gnawing its way out of her since they'd escaped the Nosferati. I don't know how, said Tori, but I think it happened when I fought the Chancellor in the old world. I think I let them in. Chapter 8 in the village of Uluk, the company of Aleut and crooked refugees rested for three days to recover from their passage through the mouth of the gods. The isolated Aleut village was situated at the edge of the last forest, a small outcropping of tall, narrow snow pines in the northernmost foothills of the crooked teeth. The Tuva clan, tree folk in the common tongue, was glad to house the weary travelers in cabins made of logs and sod. The village was situated within a fort, with a tall and fierce-looking wall made of logs carved with points like massive spears. To protect against the rogue clans, 
said Alec, when Misha asked during their first supper. What happened? Why would they attack their own people? The Aleut are one family, but like most families, it is a dysfunctional one. When we were exiled to the White North, we banded together better than ever. But over time, there were quarrels. Many believe the Ice City is not our way. They say we are becoming like the invaders. The rogue clans left the unified people long ago. They wander in the north, small bands of hunters and warriors. They fight with one another. They fight with us. Sometimes their numbers are small, but they have been growing recently. Rumors have been spreading of a fierce warrior who has been uniting them. The elders have been growing worried. If the rogues ever banded together, they could threaten Ikala and forever change my people. Even within the walls of Uluk, they were not safe. In contrast to the sealskin tent Misha and Tori had been sharing, the cabins with their roaring hearths felt as warm as Melanesia. There the stilt huts were little more than a thin lining of reeds enclosing a bamboo frame. During the hot summers, Misha would sleep out on the beaches of her village. It was one such night when Misha had first seen Ala Sumai, and it was on that same beach, at the end of that glorious, horrific summer, that her father had discovered their moonlight trysts. After that, nothing could be the same. Here in the north, all hints of summer had drifted away like a morning fog. Despite a year in the crooked teeth, Misha had never grown accustomed to the northern chill, and in the great white north it was even worse. She had never been so cold in all her life as on this journey, and she mourned the day they left the warmth of Uluk's cabins to continue north once more. There are few logs in Ikala, said Alec, as though reading her mind. It lies beyond the northern tree line, but the walls are layered with firs and the hearths stoked with firestones. You'll be warm again soon enough. Don't worry. Misha smiled. What you and I consider warm are quite different things, I think. Alec clapped her shoulder. Stay strong, island girl. He laughed as he trudged ahead to join their saint. Tori had said nothing more about the beasts from the old world, and Misha had not pried. But Tori was retreating into her own thoughts more and more after what had happened. She had begun embracing her role as saint, and Misha knew she hated that she hadn't been able to save the Aleut and the Crooked Folk in the mouth of the gods. Misha shared her guilt. But the people in their company did not. They saw the Watchers as their saviors. They had killed the Frost Giant. The people seemed more devoted to Tori than ever and Misha had a feeling this had contributed to her mood. Uluk villagers outfitted the company with a pair of mammoths to haul their supplies. Immense sledges were loaded high and rigged so the beasts could pull them. The white woolly beasts stood fifteen feet at the shoulders and left tracks that Jordy could have climbed inside. Alec claimed that wild mammoths could split you in half with a swing of their mighty tusks, but those raised by the Aleut were more loyal than any horse. These two were docile and liked to have their trunks scratched while their sledges were loaded down with tent poles and provisions. The trek across the Icelands took two bitterly cold weeks, and Misha kept close to Tesla, who was begrudgingly riding the entire way on a sledge. At night, she hobbled around on the crutch Tori had made for her, and each evening she left the supper fires and escaped to the edge of camp to mourn her parents' deaths as the sun set over the mountainous sheets of ice. When Misha asked her how she was doing, Tess always quickly changed the subject. The girl loved Misha's tales of the islands, however, where there was no snow and the world was green and warm year-round. The girl was stubborn and strong, and Misha found herself caring for her as she once had her own little sister, Lena. Tess and Jordy shared their tent each night, along with the old crooked man, Benja, who had taken a grandfatherly liking to Jordy, as well as the boy he had saved in the mouth. Tori said that when she'd encountered him in the mouth, when the ice split wide during the frost giant attack, the man had seemed like a shell-shocked child. But Misha never would have guessed it to look at him now. The orphan boys clung to his side as if he were their father. There were others left without parents after the attack, and soon all the orphans looked to Benja. The old man grinned at the children 
told them fantastic tales, and helped them press on in the increasingly harsh conditions of the North. Benja had grown stronger from the horrors of the mouth. They all had. They had survived a frozen hell, and they would keep surviving. If only Tori could realize that. As they neared the ice city, they made camp in an outcropping of porous black rocks that felt like they were from another world. Violent gusts of wind made it difficult to raise the yurts. Snow whipped at their faces, hard as specks of rock. But even still, Tori wandered to the edge of camp. It had become her nightly ritual, and normally Misha left her to her thoughts, but not tonight. Alex said a storm was stirring. Tori crested a hill and looked out at the great white plains of the Icelands. Plains was an inaccurate word. It made the place sound like a peaceful, snow-dusted prairie. The Icelands were harsh. Jagged shards of ice and rock jutted out at harsh angles, making it difficult to maneuver the sledges across the gnarled terrain. They were forced to weave between the obstacles, and Misha guessed that their twisted path had added days to the journey. Misha reached the top of the hill and stood silently at Tori's side. Not sure I see the beauty that Alec does out here, Misha murmured. Tori nodded. She said nothing for a long time. It's not your fault, you know, Misha said. The Chancellor took you to the old world. He did this. Tori nodded wordlessly. Misha was about to leave her alone when Tori finally broke the silence. I've been thinking about Wren and the others. Anyone who didn't join the Chancellor, any that survived the catacombs, they're rotting in his dungeons, their blood getting sucked out of them every morning. Just like the Chancellor did to you. Tori turned to her and held her gaze. We have to help them, Mish. This world is only getting worse and worse. We have to end it. We will. Misha pointed to the camp behind them. Snow was beginning to fall, darting violently on the wind. Look at them. They will follow you to war. But will the others? Alex says that not all are as eager to... Misha's heart nearly stopped. She grabbed Tori's hand and pulled her to the ground. What's wrong? Tori hissed. Misha pointed out across the plain. Far off in the distance, near the horizon, there were dark shades figures, a great host of them, riding on strange white beasts. Rogues, Tori whispered. What are they riding? I think they're bears. Shivers shot across Misha's skin. Rogue warriors could tear their company apart. They had been marching for weeks. They were hungry, exhausted, and not equipped for battle. The two held very still, praying they hadn't been noticed. The host was riding in their direction, the shapes slowly growing larger. But suddenly, the wind picked up, stirring up whirlwinds of snow that filled the plains beyond. Dark clouds pressed in around the rogues, and the riders disappeared in the storm. Wind and snow cut at Misha's face, making her eyes water. She grabbed Tori's hand, and they hurried back to camp. While the Alu prepared for one of the legendary squalls of the north, Alec assured them, that it was very unlikely the rogue clans would have wandered this close to Ikala. They were within a couple days' march of the center of Aleut civilization. It might even have been bear rider scouts from the city, but Misha did not fully believe him. Despite his assurances, Alec increased the guard detail that night. The wind howled throughout the night, and the yurt shook as the fierce northern tempest descended upon them. Misha did not sleep through a moment of the storm. Misha smelled the sea one day before they reached the ice city. It was not as sweet as the islands, where fragrances were accented by flowers and ripening fruit, the scents of living things. This smell reminded her of the fish markets of the Triumvil, but it lifted her spirits all the same. The last night of their journey, Misha slept soundly and dreamed of the beaches of Melanesia. Allah came to her in the night, and the salt on her lips was sweet as sugar. It felt so good to be held close again, to be loved, but Misha woke up cold and alone. The firs beside her were empty. Everyone was already awake. Misha did not hurry to leave. The dream had been good. 
Usually her dreams of Allah ended in tragedy, but this one never turned dark, and Misha wanted to crawl back into the dream and return to the islands. That beach had been like a secret world she and Allah escaped to every night that summer. A world of midnight swims and nervous laughter, without social strata and honor and customs and arranged marriages. Her fourteenth summer was the last calm before the ensuing storm that had been Misha's life ever since she and Allah were discovered. You are a disgrace to this family. Her father's words still stung, but what he'd done after was unforgivable. Yet she still thought fondly of that summer, that first love. Her thoughts soon turned to the loves that had followed. Zaya Shalvar. Misha's feelings had been torn at the end, but her death at the watchtower haunted Misha's thoughts. Zaya had been lost in the devastation of the Rulaks. After Tori stirred them to a rage of violence, and Misha's guilt was increased by the fact that she had broken things off with Zaya hours before her death. And then there was Vashti Burodai. Her betrayal still stung deeply. Misha had to believe that it was not permanent, that the Yanavi princess would choose differently when this revolution came to Osha. She had to believe that none of the watchers who had joined the Chancellor were lost. She couldn't bear the thought of fighting people who had once been close as family. Misha was jolted from her thoughts when Tess came hurrying in, nearly tumbling on her crutch. We've reached the Ice City. You can see it from the top of the hill. Come look. Misha followed after, glad for a distraction. Even on a crutch, Tess flew across the ice. Her leg was healing quickly. They reached the top of the hardened drift of snow and looked out across the expanse of white, but white was all Misha saw though the scent of the sea was stronger than ever. I don't see it, Misha said. Tess pointed north. Look, there near the horizon, where the ice shimmers. I see the shimmers. That's the ice city. Alex says we'll be there by supper. The company was nearly finished packing up camp by the time they descended the drifts. Everyone's spirits were high as they set out on the last leg of their long journey from the crooked teeth. Misha joined Tori and Alec at the front of the company as they neared, and spires of ice began to take form on the horizon. There were four distinct spires that rose from the ice sheets like giant spears. For the four clans, said Alec. The Nukvana, the Bear Riders, the Tuva, the people of the forest, the Ikuvara, the hunters upon the ice, and the Karuva, the people of the caverns below the world. Which are you? said Tori. Shamans have no clan. We serve everyone. But before I was a shaman, I was an ice hunter. They fish the ice shores and hunt whales and seals from their kayaks. You've met the forest folk of Uluk. They send hunting expeditions to the Crooked Teeth every summer, and they supply what little timber we use here in Ikala. The bear riders tame the north bears like war horses, and the cave folk mine firestone the only source of heat in the north. We work together to provide for our people. The four spires, Misha soon discovered, were at least five hundred feet high, rising from a mountain of obsidian star rock. Four villages encircled the mountain, the buildings crafted from blocks of ice, and enclosing them all within one city was a wall of ice thirty feet high. When they were a mile from the city, a young woman rode out to meet them, accompanied by a dozen warriors on the backs of shaggy white north bears. The girl was darkly beautiful. In the afternoon sun, she left her hood down, letting her dark hair fly. The left side of her head was shaved to the skin, revealing a vibrant tattoo of red and blue markings that were strange to Misha. That is Skaya, said Alec. Your war chief? asked Misha. My sister. His tone betrayed an air of disdain. Alec murmured something, and then Tori held up her hand for the company to stop. Skaya Dulbaruk and her bear riders did not slow until they were nearly upon them. Misha noted that all the riders were women. Skaya's eyes went wide and passed from Alec to the two strange young women at his side. You were sent on a hunting party, Baru. Instead, you bring outsiders to our sacred city. Skaya said. 
Misha did not like the girl's tone. Saru, I bring refugees from the teeth, said Alec, dipping his head in a sort of bow. We have long traded with the crooked folk. Trade, yes, but we have never escorted them straight to the heart of our people, to our only stronghold. Our Madru is far from pleased, Alec, and the shaman sense more than crooked folk in your company. Her eyes narrowed at Tori and Misha. This is the gallows saint of Osha, Astoria Burodai, and her companion Misha Sufai. Misha felt as though the warrior's eyes might bore a hole straight through her. They are our allies, Alec said. There's no need to fear their gifts. Our people have always feared magic, said Skaya. Or have you forgotten why you were trained since boyhood to render it useless in the north? Our people once knew beautiful magic. Or have you forgotten what lies in the temple? Have you forgotten what our great shaman foresaw of the restoration of our people? They are darklings, Skaya hissed. That is all I need to remember. Their magic saved us from frost giants in the mouth of the gods. Skaya's eyes went dark, and her expression hardened. Yes, frost giants and rulaks wander the north once more and our traders return from their summer voyages with one ship lost, bearing tidings of sea dragons in the Channel Sea. To hear the tales, your darkling is the one to blame for this new threat to our people. Skaya pointed a long, tattooed finger at Tori. Tales told by our adversary, said Alec. The Chancellor bleeds lies. Tori is our ally. The High Elder will determine both their loyalties. Tell me. How many died during your journey through the mouth, Baru? Alec's face went tight. Nineteen. Skaya motioned to her riders. Bind them! A pair of fierce-looking women dismounted and approached. Each wore a necklace of long teeth and shared Skaya's shaved head and strange markings. Alec went pale, but he whispered quickly, Don't, Misha! It was then Misha realized she'd lost all sense of her magic. Was it Alec or another shaman? Misha did not know, but there was no use resisting. The warriors seized Tori and Misha by the arms. No, cried Misha. This is a mistake. Please. But Tori shook her head. Play along, she whispered. That is all we can do. Skaya's eyes went wide as she addressed them. Historia Burodai, the gallows girl of Osha. You are to be put on trial for the deaths of nineteen of the Aleut people in the mouth of the gods, for the destruction of one of our trading vessels in the Channel Sea, along with all its cargo, and the lives of the forty-three Aleut crew members aboard. Tori did not argue against the woman's claims. She merely nodded in submission. Misha was furious. How can they do this? None of this is Tori's fault. But Misha knew she was fooling herself. Whatever had happened, Tori was at the exact center of all the chaos in the new world. Skaya motioned to her warriors. Take them to the caves. The trial will be held at the sign of the empty moons. May the gods judge the gallows girl justly. The Aleut warriors bound Tori's and Misha's hands behind their backs and led them into the ice city. It was not the welcome Misha had envisioned at all. Part 4. Battle of Gods and Monsters Looking back now, I see it clearly. This was when the world changed. This was when the earth began to break apart at its seams. The last commander of the Metamorphi, as quoted in Dawn of the Third World. Chapter 9 When he was a boy, Darien Redvar saw his future in the mountains, sowing crops and tending to the Alkine herds his people had domesticated. He saw a life of peace, and if he would have fought, it would have been in defense of the Clavash Mountains of his boyhood, like his ancestors before him. Never could he have imagined that one day he would be sitting on the Chancellor's War Council as the commander of the Sky Guard. Yet here he was, at a great round table in the chamber of the High Council, a map of Osha spread wide before them. The council consisted entirely of high-born lords and ladies, Lord Fedra, Lady Dragonus, Lord Wallace, Lord Bara, Lady Tindair, Lord Wreath, and Lord Zamel, commander of all the Night Legions. 
And then there was Darian Redvar, a low-born Clavash boy raised in the mountains. A few months ago, he was but a common soldier in the legions. He was conscious that he was the only council member who did not descend from ancient ocean bloodlines. In this room, he was nothing. The families represented here had ruled Osha since the dawn of the New World. Darien had heard it said that the chancellors of the past had been little more than puppets in the hands of the Ocean nobles. The chancellors functioned as a face of absolute power that was manipulated by invisible strings. But things were changing, and if anyone resented Darien's rise to power or his low-born clavash presence in the room, they were careful not to let it show. Rulox had a way of minimizing the importance of racial tensions. The great two-headed monsters from the old world had left the crooked teeth fifty leagues north of the city and were marching south. All of Morrow El was preparing for battle, and Darien's sky guard might well be their best chance at survival. Even so, Darien let the nobles speak first. The beast will reach the city by tomorrow night, Commander Zamel said. An army two hundred strong. The northern hold of Griswold fell this morning. They're destroying farmlands up north, said Lady Tindayir. The ore fields as well. My ore fields, said Lady Dragonus coolly. What effect will our cannons render on the bastards, said Lord Wallace. The beasts stand four stories tall, said Commander Zamo. Darien grimly recalled his own encounter with the Rulocks at the watchtower only a few short weeks ago. The beasts had first served the Chancellor's scheme to destroy the fortress of the Shadow Watch, but in the mayhem the monsters had worked themselves into a frenzy. The legions had been forced to flee underground, and the Rulocks went on to devastate the entire north, and all of it had been enabled by the Chancellor's godstones. But the members of the High Council did not know this. They could decimate our city walls with a twitch of just one of their great necks, said Zamel. Their skin is scaled beneath their fur, thick as the length of your hand. Even a well-aimed cannon shot at one of their heads would only incapacitate half the creature. A mere three beasts fell at Griswall. What about those Morgothian bombs? said Lord Barra. His son had led a company beside Darien's at the Battle of Fire and Fury, which had ended the Morgothian Rebellion. Zamel shook his head. The Morgathians left only five of them in Goron El. The bloody heathens made sure they did not go quietly. They and their bloody god. Their alchemists slit their own throats before the end. Five bombs could still wreak some carnage, said Bara. His son, a legion general, had been killed by a firebomb at Goron El. Bara's face tensed with subdued rage, as though killing the Rulocks with firebombs might somehow avenge his son's death. Two were lost in the catacombs beneath the crooked teeth, said Zamel. One is being examined by our own alchemists, though they have not unraveled what substances render the bombs so explosive. That leaves only two remaining. The bombs wreak carnage, yes. They might kill five or six beasts, maybe even a dozen if well aimed. But the bombs will not save us any more than they did their Morgathian creators. Gods save us, murmured Lord Fedra. Gods? At this, the Chancellor stood, scowling. Medea Lorzar rose beside him, and she seemed to match his mood. Since revealing his sorcery to the Empire, the Chancellor had kept the woman very close. Before, she had only joined him when it suited his purpose, but now the Chancellor did not seem to feel the need to hide the sorceress who had helped him gain so much power. The lords and ladies had taken to calling her the Darkling Witch though not in the Chancellor's presence. The ghostly woman still struck a chord of fear in Darien, though he could not precisely say why. There was something unnatural about her. She was powerful, yes, but not nearly so much as the Chancellor. But Medea could see into his mind, if she wished. She had probed there once, before Darien had been turned into a morph. He had proved his loyalty then but that was before his mind had become haunted by nightmares. Old Mary still came to him in his dreams as much as he wished to forget her. What might Medea find buried should she decide to probe the depths of his mind again? 
Medea touched the Chancellor's arm, calming his rising anger at Lord Fedra's mention of the old gods. No gods will be coming to save you, Fedra, the Chancellor said coldly, but my sky guard just might. Your guard, Lady Dragonus laughed shrilly. She was a fiercely beautiful woman. Her form-fitting satin gown tapered past a slender waist to curvaceous hips and firm breasts teased from a strapless design that she had popularized amongst the nobles. Full, pursed lips formed an insidious expression as she looked the Chancellor in the eyes. She was a woman who got her way. Darien had heard rumors that the lady had murdered two husbands in their sleep. One had been found with a nightling, the other had merely proved inept. With her house's standing, both men had married into her name. Your grace, as best as I can tell, your little sky guard are the one responsible for our plight. My lady, said Lord Wallace, shocked at her forthrightness. Am I wrong? said Lady Dragonus, her eyes still fixed unwaveringly upon Cyrus Morrow. Why do we need saving? That is the question we should be asking. Surely it is an important question, said Lord Wallace, but now we must focus on surviving this devilish horde. No, said Fedra, the lady is right. Why do we need saving indeed, your grace? Lord Barra and Lady Tindayir nodded their agreed sentiment. It was the gallows girl, growled the Chancellor, as you already know. It was strange to see the Chancellor so rattled by these nobles. Cyrus Morrow seemed so fierce in the company of soldiers, but with the nobles, Darien had the sense they were nearly equals. The Chancellor was fighting for control of this council. Rulocks rise out of myth, hissed Lady Dragonus, and we are to believe some vague notion that the gallows girl conjured them up out of nowhere to escape the clutches of your morphs? A situation, I might add, that was due to your own neglect in killing her the first time. The Chancellor's revelation of magic power had rendered the lowborns awestruck, but in several of the nobles it had merely aroused more anger and suspicion. Their puppet strings were beginning to fray. Darien finally spoke up, standing to face the fierce ocean noblewoman. I am responsible for the gallows girl's escape, my lady. Not his grace. Yes, said Lady Dragonus. Her intoxicating eyes seemed to draw him closer. We heard, because you were raided by God's damned Nosferati, and where did they come from? The Chancellor had not publicly revealed the power of the Godstones, and he looked on with evident horror as Medea stood, holding out the vibrant green stones in her palm. The gallows girl used these, my lady. Medea said softly. Her purring voice seemed to ride upon the air, permeating the room. All were shocked at the words. Medea never spoke to anyone but at the Chancellor's bidding. Cyrus Morrow nodded. A pair of gems, said Dragonus haughtily. The gallows girl used the same stones the first Chancellor used to lock the beasts away, said Medea, her expression hardening. The god stones. The other lords and ladies showed fear, but not Lady Dragonus. Pa! she cried. You mean for me to believe some old world myth? Medea did not answer. She gritted her teeth, crossed the room, and took hold of the lady's wrist. The rest in the room looked on in horror. The chancellor regained his cool composure and forced a thin smile. Did he intend for this to happen? Darien wondered. What has that witch done with her? said Fedra tremulously. The others stood silent, mouths agape. The Chancellor answered with a continued smile. Moments later, the mists swirled again, and Medea returned with Lady Dragonus in tow. The lady cried out in pain. The stones were in her trembling hand, flowing with searing magic. Medea peeled the stones from the lady's blistering skin and stowed them in her black cloak. Dragonus clutched her hand to herself and moaned in agony. Darien noted that Medea kept her own hand hidden in her cloak, her face tensed in a slight grimace. 
It was not painless for her to use the stones either. It was Watcher blood that sustained her passage between worlds. What did you see? Lord Wallace said to Dragonus, helping her to her feet. It, it was terrible, Dragonus said, groaning. I, I saw the old world. The nobles gasped, but Darian and Zamel nodded knowingly. They understood the cost of its passage. Without Regenero blood, not even Medea or the Chancellor could survive the journey. Pray you never see it again, Medea whispered to the whimpering lady. The Chancellor stood tall, his dominance restored in the chamber of the High Council. The gallows girl unearthed a dark secret, lost to our world long ago, Cyrus Morrow said. Thankfully, I secured the godstones before she could unleash more carnage than she already did. Daja, he cried, turning to the chamber doors. The Parjan guard, who stood watch outside, hurried into the chamber, his long dreadlocks swaying from emotion. Take Lady Dragonus to see Sara, your healer, but let her skin scar over. I want her to forever remember her passage between the worlds. Aye, my lord, said the Parjan, taking hold of the lady's uninjured arm nonchalantly. The ocean woman regarded Daja with a momentary air of contempt, but quickly conceded and followed the Parjan out the door. Do not forget who presides over this council, my gentle lords and ladies, said the Chancellor. This is no longer the same world you ruled with my ancestors of old. The new world is different now. We are entering a new era, a third world. The remaining council members hid their displeasure at this revelation. Their expressions were as carefully molded as statues. Commander Redvar, said the Chancellor, turning to Darian, now that we've heard the lords and ladies' council, do you have a strategy in mind for defeating this oncoming horde? Darian stood, and all eyes rushed to him. It felt good to have the undivided attention of lords and ladies, and he forgot his dreams of Mary and his fears of Medea. War was what he was made for. He hadn't felt so confident since he'd joined the Night Legions. To have remained among the peaceful mountains of his youth would have been to never know his true capacities, his true gifts. He deserved to be here on this council more than any other person in this room, save the Chancellor, and perhaps Commander Zamel. He had not been born to this position. He had earned it. And besides, his plan was brilliant. I do have a strategy, my lord. Darian paused a moment. The idea had come to him as he surveyed the city in the past few days, though he had not been sure whether he should dare utter it before the council. But now that the godstones were no secret, he felt at ease to speak. Another demonstration of power might have all the ocean lords and ladies on their knees before the end. Tell us, said Cyrus Morrow mockingly, will fire bombs be our salvation? There was a flash in his eyes as they met Darian's, as though they held a great secret, known only between them. Darian swelled with pride. The Chancellor had been confident all along in his commander of the Sky Guard. No, my lord, not bombs, Darian said. He looked around the room. The lords and ladies regarded him with undivided attention. A lowly Klavash boy now commanded the respect of the greatest lords and ladies of Osha. Our salvation lies in the Sky Guard, in magic, though I will need the aid of your darkling witch. Darian smiled as he said the name the lords and ladies secretly used for Medea, and he looked each of the nobles in the eyes as he spoke it. He enjoyed watching them glance away nervously. They were afraid of him, too. Chapter 10 Reyna was not the only nightling in the White Citadel, but she was the Chancellor's favorite. A fairish girl, she had the black eyes and copper skin that signified the remnant race of the ruined empire. The ancient Fair dynasty was destroyed in the Old World, when the fair-skinned conquerors, from what was now known only as the Lost Continent, arrived. The Elians. First they took the Southern Isles, then they crossed the Channel Sea and expanded their dominion. Their descendants eventually formed the peoples of Osha 
Morgoth, and the Southern Isles. Since their conquest, the Irish history was a tale of blood and hardship, the land passing through many kingdoms over the past two thousand years, most recently the rule of Osha. Cyrus Morrow's grandfather had lost Fair to a rebellion sixty years previous, but even freedom had been written in blood for the Fairish. The realm seemed to pass on to another lord with each passing year, the Fairish clans in a near constant state of war and upheaval. Reyna claimed she'd been an attendant to one of the many men who'd claimed lordship over the southern subcontinent during the War of Nine Towers, before she ran away from the capital city of Rune Cayen and sold herself to a nighthouse in Morrow L. The Chancellor knew Reyna had lied about her past, but it was this boldness that the Chancellor liked about her, along with her effervescent beauty. Her skin was without blemish which made Cyrus Morrow doubt she'd ever been a servant in the ruined empire. Her body slender and strong, and whether it was genuine or not, her smile and laughter made him feel something akin to passion. Or perhaps Reyna simply kindled old memories of passion. Since Alara was stolen from him, about the only time he did not feel alone in the world was when he was with Reyna. For a few hours, he would forget all the things that haunted him, and in her arms he could even capture elusive sleep. But not tonight. Reyna lay naked, wrapped in a tangle of sheets, dozing peacefully, but Cyrus Morrow could not find sleep any more than he had found comfort with Reyna tonight. He rose from the bed and wrapped himself in a fine-spun woolen robe. The short summer had slipped away into an even shorter autumn season, and his chambers were growing cold even with the fire simmering in the hearth across the room. He would need to layer his walls with furs once this damned Rulock horde was taken care of. The nightling muttered unintelligibly in her sleep. The Chancellor did not carouse with nightlings often, but he'd hardly slept since the terrors of the catacombs. It was the first time he'd ever been so aware of his own mortality. Despite all his power, it would have taken but one bite from the Nosferati, and he would have joined their demonic clan below the crooked teeth, never truly living nor dying. One creature had landed upon him, teeth bared. If not for Vashti, he might have been bitten. And the undead monster had looked so much like him. It was that face that haunted his sleep. The Nosferati had looked just like his brother, Loras. If there are gods, they are mocking me. Cyrus Morrow thought as he paced his chambers. Of course, he knew it was impossible that the creature had been the reincarnation of his dead brother. Loras was utterly dead, along with Elara and both his parents, all of them thoroughly dead. And then there was the gallows girl. Ever since the Chancellor had made an example of the traitorous servant boy, he had been paranoid. A traitor right here in the White Citadel. How many more might be passing that bitch's symbol around his city? It could be anyone, Medea had cautioned him often. Soon Cyrus found himself searching through Reyna's cloak and nightling gown for hidden bits of parchment with a treasonous symbol. She had been thoroughly searched by his own guard before she came anywhere near the upper reaches of the citadel, but he couldn't help himself. Yes, Reyna swore loyalty to his reign. She was treated well for her station. The Chancellor had made sure of that. Her services were reserved only for him. She was given fine quarters in the central citadel, where she enjoyed the amenities of nobles. Fine clothes, delectable foods, and rare working hours. There were times the Chancellor even swore she felt some care for him, taking interest beyond the expectations of her role. It could be anyone, even Reyna. The gallows girl had ruined the one thing that still brought him pleasure. All night he could not shake the suspicion. Even the throes of passion had offered him little respite tonight. He replaced Reyna's clothes and stood before the fire. It was dwindling, so he stoked it himself. He did not like sending for servants in the night. Not any more. Everywhere he went, his suspicion was growing. Even the nobles of this very city were not above suspicion. If there was one thing he'd learned from watching his father and his father before him, it was that the nobles only loved their ruler 
so much as he was convenient for them. Alexander Morrow had bent constantly to their will, and even then there were some who had all too easily aided Cyrus's own schemes. Among them, Wren Andovier and Commander Reuben Solero. Now, the Chancellor knew, he was becoming inconvenient as well. Ilyana Dragonis might have been dealt with for the moment, but once the Rulocks were dispatched, it would only be a matter of time before another noble grew bold. Maybe I'll have them all taken to the old world, he thought with satisfaction. But it was not that simple. The nobles were the backbone of the ocean empire. Their slaves mined ore and salt. Their smiths built cannons and muskets and sabers. Their merchants traded with the companies of the Triumvil. Their fisheries, farms, and slaughterhouses supplied the city with sustenance. To replace them all in one fell stroke would be chaotic for the empire, even disastrous. He needed to build alliances, find those he could trust. It had always been this way. Even with magic, things were not simple. A truth that he loathed. Nevertheless, the Chancellor had loved seeing Dragonus's face when she returned from the old world. Her scar would not soon be forgotten. It was surely being whispered of throughout the city. Medea's brilliant act had secured the compliance of the nobles, at least until the war against the Rulocks was over. But inwardly, Cyrus Morrow feared that act would have repercussions. There was a knock at his chamber doors. Was it early morning or late night? He could not tell. The night sky had not yet begun to turn gray with the coming light. The Lady Medea to see you, my lord, announced the morph outside the room. Raina stirred. Tell that witch to bugger off, she moaned sleepily, and come back to bed. It's cold in here alone, my lord, she added pointedly with a drowsy giggle. The Chancellor smiled. Sleep on, my dear. I won't be gone long. Almost immediately, Raina was sleeping again. The Chancellor dressed himself quickly and withdrew. Medea was waiting in the antechamber, impatient arms crossed. It is time, Your Grace, Medea said. The horde will be upon us in two days. Can't it wait until morning? Do you want the entire citadel to know you are harvesting your own fiancé's blood? The Chancellor nodded. Very well, then. Let's be done with it. They slipped into the night and made for Vashti Brodai's bedchambers. Cyrus Morrow had been dreading this moment, though he knew it was only a matter of time. He hoped Lady Vashti would join him willingly on journeys with the Godstones. Her regenero gifts were essential to surviving the trek. But Medea would need to travel many times between worlds in the coming battle, and the stores of Tori's blood were spent. Sala will be furious when he finds out. The alliance with the Yanavi was fragile, especially until the wedding was official, and that matter was complicated enough as it was. The nobles were not at all pleased with an alliance with the barbaric herdsmen of the steppe. It had been necessary to avoid an attack while the legions were exhausted from the war against the rebel Morgathians, but the nobles took the news begrudgingly. The fact that their chancellor meant to wed a bronze-skinned sand girl only exacerbated the problem. He could not please everyone at once. Power is a game in which you please the right people at the right time, Cyrus Morrow thought. Nothing more. Harvesting Vashti's blood might strain the alliance with Sala, not to mention his coming marriage. But right now there was an army of Rulocks two days' march from the city. There was no getting around the matter. Medea led the way to Vashti's chambers. The marriage had not yet been announced outside the chamber of the High Council. To the rest of the city, the Yanavi princess was seen as an ambassador from the Red City. But Cyrus Morrow had restricted her to her chambers until this madness with the Rulocks was over, giving the lords and ladies the impression she was withdrawn and valued her privacy. Vashti was displeased, but he could not risk the uproar that would inevitably occur when the rest of the nobles found out their ruler planned to wed a girl of the Red City, at least not until his favor was restored. When your union is announced, 
said Medea. Your nightling will have to disappear, you know. The Chancellor nodded. Of course he knew. Medea was growing bolder lately, and he was not sure that he liked it. When he had first found her, she was grateful to be spared, eager to serve him, and she had remained quiet about the dark taste of his methods. But she was right, as she'd been right to use the godstones on Lady Dragonus today. He ought to have been the one to order it, though, no matter how brilliantly it had subdued the lords and ladies of the High Council. But then he admired such brashness. It was what drew him to Medea and Commander Redvar. Empires were not built by doing what you were told. His father had learned that lesson the hard way. They found Vashti awake in her chambers. She'd been crying, he could tell, and amazingly he felt a twinge of pity for her. The Yanavi princess had helped him take the watchtower. She had volunteered for her role in all this, but he of all people knew what it was like to feel alone in the world. He pushed the thought away. My dear, we've come... Don't patronize me, Vashti said. I know you've come from my blood, just like all the rest of my kind. You are not like any other of your kind, my dear, he said, touching her cheek gently. The Yanavi princess pulled away. Aren't I? Ren is locked away in the dungeons, and I'm locked away up here. We are both supplying you with blood. Tell me, what is the difference? I assure you, when this war is over, I will announce our marriage, and you will be free to roam the citadel as you wish. You'll have streams of attendance, anything you want. Vashti was silent. She gazed out the window. It faced the southern peaks of the Crooked Teeth, and beyond, across many leagues of mountains and forest, lay the vast plains of the steppe. I heard news from the Red City tonight, she said evenly. I overheard the servants talking. Damn the bloody servants. He thought of the boy Wren had killed and bit the inside of his cheek. He'd have whoever told her flayed. But he subdued his anger and nodded for his queen-to-be to go on. The Red City is no more, Vashti finished. Thousands of my people are dead. I am very sorry, my dear, truly, but your brother is alive. He and the other survivors journey to Pendra as we speak, and when these monsters have been dealt with, Osha will send further aid. Was it her? Vashti demanded. Was what whom? said the Chancellor. You claim that the gallows girl is responsible for the unraveling of our world. But I know you let the Rulaks through. She may have stirred them up, but you made it possible. He nodded again. So tell me the truth. The Nosferati, the sea dragons, the sailors speak of. Zavila! Did Tori let these monsters through from the old world? The Chancellor knew his next words must be truthful. I must please the right people at the right time. I don't know anything with certainty, my queen, but I do know it was not I who did it. I believe the gallows girl let them through, though I don't know how she did it. She's far more powerful than I thought, and far more a threat than I ever dreamed. Vashti came within inches of his face and looked him deeply in the eyes. I believe you, my lord, and that means that little gallows whore has slaughtered my people. I fear it is so, my queen. You need my blood to save this city, and I will offer it willingly. But if I am to be your bride, you must promise me something more than aid for the surviving Yanavi. I do not hold that alliance lightly. Anything for your people, said the Chancellor, hoping he would not regret it. For my wedding gift, I want the gallows girl. The Chancellor nodded carefully. As soon as these Rulaks are vanquished, I will send my sky guard to hunt her down. It could not happen soon enough as far as Cyrus Morrow was concerned. Vashti's eyes narrowed, and her face drew taut with subdued rage. When she spoke, the Chancellor could sense a tremor of anger. I want it to be finished. I want Tori's head, served to me on a platter at our wedding feast. The Chancellor nearly smiled at this, 
though he held it back. He could not reveal just how pleased he was by her redirection of outrage. He remained solemn and took Vashti's hand. For you, my queen, nothing would please me more. Good, said Vashti coldly. Now do what you've come to do. And far better than even the Chancellor could have hoped, Vashti Burodai gave up her blood with a fierce smile stretched across her face. Chapter 11 Maro El glowed peacefully with the light of ten thousand lanterns. Wisps of fog hung over vacant lanes, and the towers of the nobles jutted out like little daggers above the sprawling ocean capital. Darien's own tower lay north of the white citadel and rose above the city walls. From the perch of his bedchamber balcony, he could look out over the city to the plains beyond. The northern walls were weaker than the rest of the city. No invader had ever attacked from the north. But, in a sense, it was better that the walls would come down easier. Darien ran the stages of the battle through his head over and over, but so much would depend on the beasts. If there was one thing he'd learned, though, it was that the appearance of a sure victory could make the most cunning of enemies move foolishly. They could only hope that this would prove true with the Rulocks. A hand brushed his shoulder from behind, and he reached for his saber. Valeria laughed. Darien scowled. You shouldn't be here. All the city can see this. The sight of her ended his complaints immediately. Valeria Sardona smiled, her seductive eyes glistening in the lamplight. What's one more nightling visiting a noble in his chambers? Darien's heartbeat quickened. Valeria, his closest comrade and the woman he had been suppressing feelings for since their victory at Morgoth, was dressed in a silky ebony gown with a shawl drawn over her head, concealing most of her face in shadows, though wisps of her silver hair teased from the darkness and fell past her fair shoulders. Darien had never seen her hair down. It was always pulled back in the fashion of the night legions, and he certainly had never seen so much of her ivory skin. The gown fastened about her neck with thin folds of fabric and a near non-existent back teased him with the skin he could see and what he could not. Valeria was right. No one would mistake her for a captain of the Sky Guard. Her hand traveled from his shoulder and came to rest upon his bare forearm. His skin pricked with shivers, as though suddenly coming to life after months of hibernation. He saw her every day as they drilled the Sky Guard, but they could appear nothing more than comrades before the rest of the city and he had been filled with longing that had been driving him mad ever since he'd first embraced his true feelings for her, after surviving the Nosferati attack in the catacombs of the Crooked Teeth. Darien reminded himself that these were improper feelings for a comrade. He pulled away. I don't summon nightlings. My servants may get suspicious. Valeria's periwinkle eyes glared from the depths of her hood. I've wanted to do this before every battle we faced. Every time I wondered if I'd die and miss my chance, but not this time. Valeria pulled him away from the balcony walls and into the shadows, and he let his inhibitions disintegrate as she pulled him in. Her lips tasted of mint, and her neck smelled of sweet triumph spices. She had held nothing back in her nightling persona. His hands wandered into curls of soft silver hair, and her hood fell away. Gods, he had wanted this for so long. Darien pulled her closer, her body searing through the thin fabric of her gown. His hands traveled to her shoulders and down to her waist. Every bit of her was taut muscle, a body fashioned for war, not gowns, though he did not mind seeing her this way. When Valeria pulled back, he felt himself longing for more. Perhaps it was the nightling gown, but he knew it was for the best. That was incredible, he murmured. Valeria smiled, resting her hands on the stone balcony, and looked out at the city. I wish we could just hide away, pretend there is no war. Darien wished it too, but there was a war, and it fell upon them to protect the city, two foreigners who had somehow earned the Chancellor's favor. 
the Rulocks would reach the city by daybreak. Now it was the arduous stillness before all hell broke loose upon Morrow L, and they needed to be ready to fly at any moment. We're soldiers. War is in our blood. I only wish it, Darian. In all honesty, I crave battle. I've lived this fight a dozen times already, in my dreams. It's what we're made for, you and me. If there are gods, then that is why they brought us to life, to fight. He recited the mantra of the shadow camps, though his true thoughts were unsure. If there are gods, I think they are mocking us. Look, my hands are trembling, but it's not out of fear. It's anticipation, desire. My knuckles long to feel blood running from the hilt of my saber. My eyes long to train a musket on some soldier's head. We've seen little rest from war, but ever since we returned to the Citadel, I've longed for the day I would exchange city life for the battlefield once more. But sometimes I wish I didn't. I wish I longed for rest and luxury, families and trivial affairs. Me too. Do you ever wonder what we would do if all this ended? Valeria said. If the wars were over? She took hold of his hand. At times like this, yes. There's always another war to fight, Darian said instead. That's why I wish we could pretend. Darian wrapped his arm around her, and they stood for some time in silence. But even with her warmth beside him, his mind returned to the coming battle. It was true, he longed for it. It was the one thing he was good at. In the past few days, he had memorized every street, every wall, every tower in Morrow L. He knew where the cannons would have the best angle for fire. He knew the weakest sections of wall, where the beasts were sure to break through first. He knew the Rulocks would want to tear down the White Citadel most of all, the symbol of their oppression in the North since the days of the Old World. It will work, Valeria whispered, as though reading his mind. Your plan. It was her plan, as much as his, but he was the commander of the Sky Guard, and she'd insisted he take the credit when he presented his strategy to the High Council. It has to, he said. There are two hundred thousand people living in this city, and half a million across the meridian in the fringes. Only slaves, she said. It was the sentiment he should share, he knew. Your concern is in the city. They're not just slaves, they're comrades. I was a slave in the fringes. I served in the workhouses. I... You served in this estate, she finished. Darian nodded, thinking back to the days he and Tori had served Commander Solero in these halls, biding time until they were drafted into the Night Legions. Now Solero was a traitor lost somewhere in the catacombs, and Tori... It all brought me here. Darian said. I was one of them, and now I can save them. Your job is to protect the Citadel, protect the nobles. I don't give a damn about the nobles, he muttered darkly. Valeria turned to him. Careful, Darian, you speak treason. I speak the truth. All my years of servitude, I blamed the Chancellor for the injustices I witnessed. I went to the gallows to resist him. But now, being in this city... Sitting on their councils, I see I was resisting the wrong power. The Chancellor has been nothing but good to me. The nobles are relics of an ancient system of corruption. The Chancellor is building a different world, one where a clavash boy and a girl of the Isles lead Osha's finest soldiers. Truth be told, I think the Chancellor wants them dead more than I do. Valeria's hand rested on his own, and it calmed him. Osha is not the only land filled with injustice. My parents sold me into slavery in the Southern Isles. But I made the best of it, and now I'm here. One day, maybe I'll make things better for people like me, but... She turned and pointed at the looming crystal tower behind them. The White Citadel is our only concern today. The Chancellor and the nobles in that keep. We can't afford to consider anyone else. Darian nodded. He never had a chance to say anything further. The night was split by the piercing clangor of bells from the towers upon the walls. 
The ringing spread as each tower responded to the sound and rang its own siren bell. The towers lit up with torches, forming a wall of fire around the city. Valeria touched his face, turning him toward her. It lasted only a moment, and Darian wished it could last so much longer. This second kiss might be their last, and now, more than ever, he realized he longed for many more. To war, she said, pulling away. And then she morphed and disappeared into the night. To war, Darian muttered after her. It was still hours from daybreak. The monsters had crossed the plains faster than expected. Darian knew they were building speed for the attack. They hoped to surprise us in the night, but we are ready, more ready than those beasts could ever know. Darian cried out for his attendant, and the boy appeared with his armor moments later. The boy's name was Jan, a turned watcher of the Fieri Order, though Darian rather wished he was a Medici. A healer would be most valuable at his side today. But of course, Sara and the few other Medici were needed on the battlefield. Jan helped Commander Redvar don his thick leathern armor, though Darian knew it would help little if one of those monsters seized him with its fangs. Jan handed him his saber. The blade had cut through Morgothian heathens and undead devils, but it would barely scratch the thick hides of the Rulocks. This is my greatest foe yet. Jan was about to hand over his musket, but Darian stopped him. You keep it. The boy seemed confused. I need someone to cover my ass. The boy beamed with pride, and Darian knew he had chosen his attendant wisely. Jan longed to prove himself, just as Darian had once longed to prove himself to General Thrain. The ground rumbled, rattling the chandeliers within Darian's estate. To the wall, Jan said. To the wall. Together they took flight, sailing over the city, Darian on thick black morph wings, the boy on nothing but watcher magic. Below them, the streets filled with legions readying their positions within the city. Somewhere in the madness, Medea was preparing herself with watcher blood. To the battle of gods and monsters, Darian thought. Chapter 12 Morrow L. seethed with the throes of battle. Smoke shrouded the streets in a thick fog from cannon fire and rubble, but the pillared necks of a dozen rulocks cut through it as the beasts moved into the city. The northern walls held strong for less than an hour. It was enough time for the cannons to take out a handful of the beasts before the real plan fell into place. The two weakest points in the northern wall fell first, and just as Darien had hoped, the two-headed beasts began to pour through those two openings, forsaking their work on the other ends of the wall soon to fall. The legions fixed cannons on those openings and let hell rain down on the first beasts to enter the city taking several down. As the beasts fell, their comrades were fueled with rage and charged into the streets, swinging their mighty heads with fury. Valeria had concocted the idea of stretching wire from the rooftops, made from bound strands of forged steel and whittled down to a fine razor's edge. The wire was like a great scythe, decapitating the monsters as they surged into the streets with vengeful rage. One beast attempted to wrench a wire free with its teeth, ripping out its own jaw in the process. The wires held the onslaught of one or two beasts before the force would rip them free of their holds. The Rulocks surged forward to meet yet another wire at the next street. The beasts appeared to be overtaking the city, but with devastating losses. The gray cobblestone of Morrow L turned a strange purplish hue as Rulock blood bathed the streets. It was not long before the beasts figured out how to dislodge the wires by pummeling the towers that held them, but it was then the shadows deployed bombs made of pitch, ignited by a pair of fiery watchers. Flaming pitch and the stench of burning hair melded with the fog of battle. Valeria attacked next, leading a force of flying morphs and turned watchers, while Commander Zamel led his shadows in the streets below. The lanes filled with even more musket and cannon fire, the winds bearing thick plumes west and shrouding the far ends of the city. Darien was forced to watch everything unfold from his perch atop the white citadel, 
standing alongside the Chancellor on his crystal balcony. When the walls fell, Darian and Jan had retreated to a better vantage point. It pained him to be removed from battle so early, but it was the only way he could oversee everything, the only way he could direct his generals and adjust their strategy as the battle played out before him. More razor wires were being wrenched from their holds, and the beasts were surging forward, but so far things were going according to plan. Valyria had intentionally set fewer wires and flaming bombs along certain paths, making it easier for the beasts to press toward the citadel, but only along the ways they intended. When these paths converged along Citadel Road, the troops thinned in the streets and the Rulocks roared forward, straight toward the center of the city. It was a delicate balance. To leave that path wide open would make it too obvious that the beasts were being funneled through the city intentionally. It needed to appear as though they were forging this path on their own. The beasts will reach Morrow Square shortly, said Darian. While the nobles cowered within, the Chancellor had been watching the battle from the beginning, perhaps longing for the action as much as Darian. Medea is ready in the square, said Cyrus Morrow. Medea stood below the citadel, where once, a lifetime ago it seemed, Darian had been strung from the gallows at the Chancellor's drafting ceremony. Medea was filled with Regenero blood, which would allow her to cross back and forth to the old world and send these monsters back to the hell world where they belonged. Surrounding Medea was her company of morphs and watchers, the citadel's last defense. A brilliant plan, Commander, said the Chancellor. Your cunning may save us all. There is much battle left, my lord. The Chancellor smiled and clapped him on the shoulder. You have won my confidence, Commander. The beasts rage forward just as you predicted. A human foe might retreat, regroup, attack from another vantage point. But these are beasts consumed with rage. Darian nodded. Rage makes man and beast alike move without caution, my lord. We may have underestimated these beasts when they came through the portal, but the nobles overestimated their strength in the skirmishes further north. They did not have the Sky Guard, nor you in command. Thank you, my lord. When all is told, the nobles will bow before us, Commander, praising our magic army. The people will tell tales. The minstrels will write songs about how magic saved them in the battle of gods and monsters. Darian caught himself, momentarily imagining Ilyana Dragonis kneeling at his feet in desperate thankfulness. With a victory, all would hail the Sky Guard as saviors. They would be the heroes of Osha, merely gods. Jan tugged at his arm, and Darian was jarred back to reality. The boy pointed to the western ends of the city. Commander! Darian followed his finger, through the billowing smoke, to a place where the thick shroud was thinning as it spread across the west. Oh, gods! There was a breach in the western wall an unplanned breach. In the madness and smoke, a small company of Rulocks had circled around the city unnoticed. They were entering streets that had been rigged with no razor wire and were lightly defended. From that vantage point, they could rout the legions and watchers defending the streets in the north. Below, it appeared Valeria had also noticed the breach, for her legion of morphs and watchers was already flying to the western end of the city. A host of shadows followed after on the ground, but Darian feared it was not enough. I must go, my lord. I will not lose the commander of my sky guard. The legions will hold them. I cannot stand by and see this plan fail, my lord. We have two Morgothian firebombs. We can seal off the streets and turn them toward the others. Those bombs are meant to seal off the square, said the chancellor. It won't matter if the beasts never reach the square. If they break free of our intended path, they can storm the citadel from all sides, and the city will fall. The Chancellor had lost his cool assurance of victory. He surveyed the mayhem below, tapped his ringed fingers on the wall, and then nodded. Take Medea's legion as well. That will leave the square defenseless. As you said, Commander, none of it will matter if the beasts never reach the square. 
Take out those rulocks before they tear us apart on all sides, and be back before the horde reaches the square where all is lost. It amazed Darian how swiftly battles could turn from sure victory to such fear of defeat, but they could be turned back just as swiftly. Darian clapped Jan on the back. The boy was trembling. To war, comrade! Jan nodded fearfully, but clutched his musket tight. Together they took flight from the white citadel and landed in the square below. Medea stepped aside, and Darian stood upon the great stage where he'd nearly been hung for defection only a year and a half ago. But the Chancellor had spared him, perhaps for this very moment, to do what he did best. To me, comrades of the Sky Guard! Darian shouted, raising his hands. The watchers and morphs left their posts around the square and gathered around him. What news from the Citadel, Commander? Medea said. She wore leathern armor and a soldier's uniform. It was strange to see her wearing anything but billowy silks. The western wall is breached, and there are a dozen rulocks tearing through the city unopposed, Darian said. We must stop them or die in the attempt. The fate of Osha lies in our hands now, comrades. There was a momentary silence. This company was to be the last line of defense until the climax of the battle, when Medea would send the surviving rulocks back to the abyss. They were not to be sent to battle except as a last resort. And we are at the last resort. Oorah! cried Daja, the first watcher to step forward. We will not fail! Oorah! cried another. For death and glory! For the salvation of the new world! cried Medea, floating into the air above her company. Darian took his morph form, great black wings stretching out. His saber pointed to the sky and he rose to join her. The morphs and watchers cried out, Oorah! Oorah! and pounded their fists against their chests and clanged their sabers and readied their muskets. The watchers and winged morphs took flight, and the wingless morphs donned their giant warb-like forms, bounding through the streets, all following their commander into the heart of battle. Darian and his small band of soldiers broke through the thick of the smoke to find their comrades in a desperate state. The Rulocks towered over Valeria's company. Their twin necks were thick as tree trunks, and their heads reached four stories into the sky. Up close, the soldiers battling them seemed as absurd as a flock of sparrows against a dragon. They danced through the air, dodging, weaving about their heads like flies. Fieri launched balls of flame, and Conjuri launched rubble from the walls of Maro El, which kept the beasts distracted, but it would not hold them off long. From below, a small company of shadows fired their muskets to no avail. Valeria Sardona and another morph were frantically stretching razor wire above streets facing south. Darian knew it would not be enough to deter these monsters, but he breathed with relief to see Valeria still alive. Already a half-dozen morphs had fallen. Darian landed in a square a short distance from the fray. Daja! Corin! Darian shouted. Take the firebombs to Captain Sardona. If we don't seal off the southern streets, we're doomed. The two watchers were both enduro, and they would get the bombs set quicker than anyone else. They heaved the great sacks over their shoulders and flew away. The rest of you, when the bombs go, attack with everything you've got. Watchers, use your gifts. Push them together. Bring them to this square. Aye, sir. The watchers and morphs took flight. Medea. How much blood do you have? Darian asked. The problem isn't the supply, I'm afraid. Vashti's blood gives me her regenero power, but the travel takes its toll. It takes time to heal. I don't dare more than two passages now, or I'll never have the strength for the horde in Morrow Square. It won't matter if the beasts don't reach the square. Darian clasped her shoulder. Her cloak fluttered in the wind and he could see a line of vials at her belt. Then we must make them both count, he cried. Stay close to me, Jan, he shouted, turning to his attendant. You cover Medea, no matter what. Even if I'm dying, you cover her. She is the key to our victory. The boy nodded to him tremulously. Darian gripped the boy's shoulder. 
he had been afraid, too, at his first battle. Be brave, Jan. War is our great test, and we must not fail. The three of them flew to a tower overlooking the square below. There they could see every piece of this haphazard plan, and all they could do was wait until their part in it came and hope the others would not fail. Everything that followed seemed a haze to Darien. The streets shuddered with the detonation of the Morgathian firebombs. Shards of stone the size of horses filled the air. The two widest southern streets were sealed off in an explosion that brought down taverns and towers and shops alike, rendering the streets impassable. One rulock was taken in the explosion, both its heads crushed by massive debris. Shaking away chunks of rubble, a second beast rose back up, swung its necks in fury, and charged a small street. Valyria's razor wire did its work, slicing through bone and sinew, and the rulock's necks flopped like felled trees, exploding with rushes of dark blood. A third rulock tore maniacally at the towers holding the wires. As the beast ripped at the stone, the soft tissue of its throats was exposed, and a conjury launched two spears with the flare of his power, lodging them deep into both skulls. The other beasts veered from the explosion. Fire and debris filled the air, wielded by Conjury and Fieri. Morphs flew around their heads and lashed out for their eyes with blade-like talons. The Conjury with the spears took one more Rulok down, but another took him from behind and rended him in two with its teeth. The soldiers could do little against such mighty beasts, but still they managed to push them north. Before Darien knew it, their time had come. Three of the beasts had entered the square, pushed forward by a pair of fieri and a host of morphs. With Medea able to manage only two passages, Darien had hoped for more. The other five monsters were nowhere close, but they could not let these beasts pass. Now, Medea, now! Medea and Jan flew to the ground. Darien flew straight at the three beasts. Six heads towered above the streets, and Darien had to keep them all distracted. He flew on thick black wings, weaving in and out, narrowly missing sets of spearhead-sized teeth. The other morse took the cue and did the same. Somewhere in the madness he spotted Valeria. She swung her saber deftly, wounding the eye of one head, and managed to skirt away before the monster lashed out. The fieri let balls of flame fly at the beasts from behind, pushing them forward. They built speed and charged for the open lane beyond the square. But just then, Medea opened the portal. The square opened up, and suddenly beyond the square, rather than a street, there was a dull gray meadow. The Rulocks did not have time to slow their charge. The portal disappeared, and so too did the monsters. A cheer rose up from the sky guard. The watchers and morphs landed in the empty square, a sudden burst of relief and confidence coming over them. Darien felt it as well. We may win this battle yet. Valeria barked an order from the rooftops. This is not over, comrades. In case you've forgotten, there are five more Rulocks to be dispatched. Now fly and bring the last of them here. Oorah, they roared, and Valeria and the others disappeared beyond the rooftops. Moments later, there was a rift in the air, as though a giant invisible door had been opened. Medea staggered back from the old world, and the opening disappeared. But something was wrong. Her face was riddled with pain. She was bleeding from a wound in her shoulder. Jan sprinted to her side and supported her, but still she crumpled to her knees. Darian knelt beside her, morphing to his human form. What happened? She grimaced. Only crazed me as they were coming through the portal. It'll heal. Jan removed the spalder from her shoulder. The leathern armor was tattered and shorn, drenched in blood. The wound was deep, despite the Regenero blood coursing through her veins, and it was not healing quickly enough. Blood gushed like a fountain. Press it down, Jan, Darian ordered. Jan ripped a shred of cloth from his shirt and pressed it hard against her shoulder. The white cloth was soon crimson. Gods, I wish he was a Medici. The wound closed slowly, the blood magic weakened by the passage to the old world and back. 
Medea went pale with loss of blood before it was done. The air filled with a cacophonous roar. Darien saw one, two, four heads rising above the streets beyond, and then more. The other beasts were being herded into the square, and there was no way Medea had the strength left to open another passage to the old world. She needed time to heal, but they had to stop these beasts. Beyond this square, the streets branched out, and the Rulocks could wreak havoc on the citadel. That left Darien only one option. Jan, get her to safety. No, Commander, protested Medea. I'll be all right. I can open the passage once more. Darien had once feared the sorceress, but now he felt a strange bond with her. Battle had a way of sifting out old differences. It was how he'd grown close to Valyria. In the battle of fire and fury, something had changed, and they seemed to share something new, something that kept them alive. And with Medea, it was similar. The sorceress was brave, cunning, and unrelenting. A soldier he could proudly stand beside, and one he could not afford to lose. He took her hand. Her fingers trembled with pain. Regain your strength. You've a horde of your own to come in Morrow Square. Commander, what do you... He already had the godstones. She'd dropped them while Jan was pressing her wounds. He showed the emerald gems to her. Give me one of your vials, he commanded. She nodded grimly and squeezed his hand shut around the stones. I see what the Chancellor sees in you, Commander. Medea drew a vial of Vashti's blood from her cloak. When the time comes, close your hand over the stones and open your mind to their power. Think of the old world, and the stones will do the rest. I should warn you, Commander, it hurts like nothing you've ever felt. Darian nodded. Jan, get her to safety in the citadel, now. The first of the Rulocks entered the square. Jan and Medea staggered away leaving Darien alone to face the beasts. Chapter 13 The Yanavi princess's blood tasted strangely sweet at first. Then it went briny and then sour. It made his stomach churn, but he held it down. In moments, Darien could feel something coursing through him. He felt warm all over, and he became more aware of his body than he'd ever felt. He had never noticed the warmth of blood in his veins, nor the relieving sensation of each breath as its life-giving air spread through him. Nor had he ever so sharply realized how the intensity of battle managed to mask pain. Suddenly he felt it, like the instant agonizing chill from jumping in an icy pond. His neck rushed with pain. In the chaos, he had not even realized he'd been injured by one of the three Rulocks they'd already sent back to the old world, and now it hit him all at once. Blood desperate to return to his body, skin desperate to be closed off from the world. There was a tingling at his neck. Blood seeped back to its rightful place, and then skin closed over, fibers weaving in and out until all was restored. There was a jarring pain in his back as a bit of shrapnel, an old wound from the war against Morgoth, removed itself from his body. Darien felt more whole than he'd ever felt before, more alive, more invincible. It was incredible, all from watcher blood. And none too soon, the beasts were entering the square, first one, two, then three Rulocks. All of it happened so quickly, Darien did not think through his actions. It was all instinct. Valeria led the company, herding the last two Rulocks into the square. Darien held out the stones for her to see, and their eyes locked for a moment, and he knew she understood what he was doing. Without thinking, he cried out to Rivka, the god of his ancestors. Let this work. Let me see her again. The beasts were charging for the opening to the city beyond. Darien was the only thing that stood between them, and the Rulocks meant to trample him. He waited until the last possible moment. He closed his hand over the stones, and their warmth spread through him, searching for a host. Open your mind to the stones, Medea had said. And he did. Think of the old world. The warmth became a fierce burning sensation in his hand. His palms screamed, and his mouth nearly did the same. 
He could feel power leaving him, the stones doing their work. The beasts were upon him. A rush of energy. A gateway opened, and Darian found himself standing at the edge of two worlds. He stood aside as the beasts charged past him. Before they realized what had happened or where they were, he released the stones and the gateway was gone. He was alone with the beasts in a great gray world. He stood in a vast meadow. The grass was a dull gray. In fact, the entire world seemed to consist of shades of gray, as though all the color had been drained from it. He had been there once before, to help the Chancellor escape when Tori had resisted him at the watchtower, but that had only been a momentary glimpse of the horror of the old world. Realizing where they were, the Rulocks went into a frenzy, rearing up and thrashing their mighty heads around. When one caught sight of him, it lashed out with its neck, and Darian threw himself into the tall grass, narrowly avoiding the attack. His hand was searing with pain, and it wasn't going away. Magic doesn't work here. The ground thudded nearby as the beast attempted to crush him. Even Medea had not escaped their wrath. He clutched his fingers tight, but the stones were gone. Somehow, instinctively, he had released them as soon as he entered the world, his body seeking relief. Gods! He combed through the thick gray grass, looking desperately for the emerald stones. A great fanged head came bearing down, and he dove aside, wishing he had his morph wings. He crawled his way back to where he'd first entered the world. Another attack, and he dove ahead, then scrambled back. There was a subtle glow a few yards off a light gray glow in the dark gray grass. Another head swung into view, and he ducked. Of course. In here the stones would be gray like everything else. He dove for the glow, his palm closing over the stones. Warmth spread over him. A portal opened, and he dove back into the world of color and life. He landed in the square upon cold stone. There was a blaring noise ringing in his ears. This world was pain and confusion. His entire body seized with the pain. He felt like he was on fire. But he wasn't. Vaguely, he understood. I'm dying. And death was chaos. Motion swirled around him, bodies, sabers. The sky filled with blurs, and he didn't understand what was happening. Had there been more Rulocks than they'd thought? Had the battle lines fallen in the northern ends of Morrow El? He felt himself slipping away and was unable to resist, as though the gray world was pulling him back. Was he still holding the stones? He didn't know. He closed his eyes to the chaos. His mind numbed his body to the pain that coursed through him. It was a glorious relief. He could still hear the blaring noise. Warhorns, he thought vaguely but the noise was fading. His body was nothing. His mind was nothing. And then there was everything. His eyes spread wide. The pain returned with fury, and he was back in the square. Someone knelt over him, and he was shaking in her arms. No! Darian, gods damn you! Don't you dare! His vision focused on one thing amidst the world of blurs and pain and chaos. A face smooth, pale skin, and hair the color of mist, eyes that shone like sapphires against a cloudy sky. Valeria. Darian shot back to life at the sight of her. Valeria was peeling something from his hand, the stones. Slowly, relief spread through him. Oh, thanks the gods, Valeria muttered so only he could hear. The pain dulled again, but this time not at the expense of his consciousness. His mind sharpened, and he realized that the blurs were soldiers rushing past them, watchers and morphs taking to the sky, rushing to battle. What's happening? The beasts have reached the citadel. Darian felt as though he'd been stabbed in the gut. He was too late. He'd failed. They'd taken too long in sending the beasts to the old world, and now the battle was lost. Darian was not strong enough to fly. Not yet. But there was no time to wait. His body slowly healed, 
his skin pricking with sharp pangs as he and Valeria staggered through the shambles of streets and toppled buildings. Morrow L seemed more like a graveyard than the capital of the greatest nation in the New World. The bodies of comrades littered the streets, good men and women chosen by the Chancellor to defend the realm. Darien had been chosen to lead them all, and he had failed. His side was on fire from running. The godstones had left him weak, and his lungs ached with each breath. He had never felt so tired before. The cries of the dying and the roars of the triumphant beasts hung over the city as though they were echoing off the face of the heavens. We're too late, Darien moaned, clutching his side, staggering across a ruined marketplace. Citadel Road led straight to Morrow Square. The white citadel was visible from the very end of the road, but now the streets were enveloped in thick plumes of smoke. A smoldering corpse lay in a puddle of pitch, tiny flames lapping at the blackened remains. The sight made him thirsty for no good reason. Valeria wrapped her arm around him, supporting him beneath the shoulder. The battle isn't over so long as we're breathing. Darien laughed darkly. Look around you. Hundreds are dead. Thousands. The streets shuddered. The city is lost, Valeria. Valeria slapped him across the face. Those are not the words of the men who attacked the rebel king at the Battle of Fire and Fury. His skin ignited with pain, but this time it didn't last long. The pain in his lungs subsided, and he looked at his hand. The wound from the stones had closed over. Vosti's Regenero blood had done its work at last. Strength and adrenaline returned to him. Valeria gripped him by the back of the neck and pulled him close. We're still breathing, Darien. The streets around them were empty of monsters. The beasts might not have followed the intended path, but one thing was certain. They were all clustered in one place, Morrow Square. Darien pressed his hand against the stones in his pocket. He nodded to Valeria and drew close. The Rulocks are all in the square. We have to get the stones to Medea. Can you fly? I have to. His body was tingling with energy now that he'd healed. It was strange, as though his body were playing tricks with his mind. Moments ago he'd been staggering. Now he morphed and took flight with relative ease. Darien and Valeria became two dark forms in the haze of smoke, flying straight down Citadel Road. Morrow Square was a roiling, seething mass of blood, smoke, and chaos. The Rulocks filled the square, their immense necks swinging around like the tentacles of a giant sea dragon. There were dozens of them thrashing and tearing at the base of the White Citadel. The legions attacked from the entrances to the square, but their musket fire did little. The surviving Morse and Watchers attacked from the air, but their numbers were thinning, and all of them were tired and weak from battle. High atop the citadel, Darien spotted Medea at the Chancellor's side. Below, several of the beasts took turns charging at the palace. The largest of the Rulocks, a beast with dark gray fur who seemed to be their leader, roared and led the charge. Each attack echoed across the city. They backed up and charged again. Crystal shattered. Stone crumbled. Darien held the godstones high and caught Medea's gaze. She took flight. He knew it was a long shot, but Medea was their only chance. Valeria split off to rally the Sky Guard to drive the beasts forward one last time. Darien and Medea met in midair, hovering. He handed her the stones, but she only took one. This gateway will require us both. Medea took hold of his hand, and they descended. The leader of the Rulocks led a charge of four others. They backed up then galloped forward, ready to slam into the side of the tower with their massive bodies. All the legions, morphs, and watchers attacked at once. The horde pressed closer to the citadel. Darien and Medea landed directly in front of the attacking beasts. The portal opened, and pain shot through Darien's hand anew. The gateway stretched out in front of the entire palace, and Darien and Medea stood at the edge of it. Four of the Rulocks stopped, but the leader did not. He surged forward at full speed, swinging his massive necks. The impact launched Darien from his feet 
and Medea's hand was wrenched from his grasp. He landed twenty yards away. Instantly, the gateway disappeared, and the only thing standing between the Rulok and the Citadel was Medea. The beast backed up for another attack, but she did not move. Medea stood tall, facing the Rulok. Clenching the godstone with one hand, she fearlessly reached toward the beast with the other. The beast lowered its heads and charged. Medea did not move. Her fingers remained outstretched. Her eyes were closed in concentration, and the godstone glowed fiercely. The stone in Darien's hand glowed as well. His skin stung as the stone surged with power. Suddenly, the Rulok leader eased its charge. It slowed to a walk, and then stopped altogether, lowering its heads toward Medea. Her eyes were still closed, her hand held out before her, the godstone glowing with a fierce emerald light. Darien did not want to watch the woman be devoured, but he could not turn away. The Rulok did not open its jaws to rend her in two. It stood still. Medea opened her eyes, her chest heaving as though she'd run many miles. She stepped closer. She touched each of the beast's heads carefully, as one might a stallion that was first being broke. The beast did not move. Its breaths slowed. The monsters behind it stood immobile, watching their leader. Darien did not understand at first what was happening. Somehow, Medea was alive. She brushed the fibrous fur of the Rulok, and the monster held still. A low moaning sound uttered. It was the only sound in Morrow Square. The streets echoed with a nightmarish purr. Medea released contact, and the Rulok leader's eyes opened wide again. They were as settled as a mountain lake. The leader turned to the other monsters and released a strange growling sound, speaking to its soldiers. It was then Darien realized the battle had ceased. The Ruloks were all watching their leader, and the legions were all watching Medea. The Darkling Witch walked silently past the leader, and all around the Ruloks lowered their heads to her. One by one she reached out and touched their gray noses with her long fingers. She never said an audible word, but somehow Darien knew she was communicating with the beasts through her sorcerous mind and the power of the godstones. Part 5 Trial of Fire and Ice There is no place more deadly than the Great White North. For centuries, the survival of the Aleut was an unnerving mystery to the southern folk. The Aleut must have been blessed by their gods in some special way. Perhaps that is why no one ventured into their domain. They feared the power of the northern gods. From Dawn of the Third World Chapter 14 Time bled slowly beneath the ice city of Ikala. The cells where Astoria and Misha were taken were unlike any dungeons Tori had ever heard of. First of all, they were warm, beyond anything she might have expected this far north, where the harsh world above was composed of thick ice sheets, layer upon layer of snowfall, and fierce peaks of obsidian star rock. The porous stone beneath the city emanated a soft, seeping heat. Though they were given thick furs under which to sleep, Tori often lay on top of them, basking in the warmth of the cavernous cell. It was a stark contrast to the last cell she had called home, beneath the White Citadel, where Tori had endured the Chancellor's bloodletting for over a year. And it was a testament to the civility of the so-called savages of the Great White North. Tori supposed the notion had been perpetuated by the ancient Elian invaders to justify their conquests, which had forced the Aleut to become people of the mountains and ice of the North. The caricature of the savage Northmen was sustained even by the Yanavi, who were wild by any ocean standard. Nomads who spent much of the year wandering the vast steppe, living off their herds and the land. Tori remembered tales told around village fires during her childhood amongst her people. Tales of Northmen pillaging the tribes who ventured too far north, 
stealing horses and women and disappearing into the blizzards that raged across the northern steppe in winter. None of this eased her mind about her predicament. The fact remained that she was to be tried for crimes she had not committed. Halek Dubaruk may have been nothing like the Northman Tori had been told about in her youth, but it mattered little. He had still betrayed her. Tori lay awake upon her furs, tossing and turning. She swore it was hotter than any other night in their cell. Or perhaps it was all her pent-up frustration. She stripped off her woolen tunic and trousers and lay in her undergarments. Did Alec know all along? she wondered. Did he bring me all this way under the illusion of revolution? Or was he really that much of a fool? The Aleut soldiers who had greeted her had not seemed the least bit enticed by the thought of revolution, if Skaya de Baruch's reaction was any indication. And Alec had once again separated Tori from her connection with the forces behind the world. Her magic was useless in the north from the moment Skaya had greeted them outside the ice city. And who else but Alec could have rendered her so helpless? Misha sat up beside her and lit the lantern that had been given to them when they arrived. Can't sleep either? She chuckled as she took in Tori's lack of garb. Rough night? It's like an oven in here, said Tori. And of course I can't sleep. We've been waiting for weeks. Skaya said the trial would be at the Empty Moons. Should be soon. And not a single person has come to see us this entire time. No one's come to hear our side of these accusations. The only living soul we've seen is that guard who brings our food. She's been pleasant enough, said Misha optimistically. And the food is decent. Where in the abyss is Alec? What is going on up there? Misha sighed. They had been through this before. I trust him, Tori. You should, too. He saved you once. After he tried to kill me. From the way his sister spoke, he risked much just by bringing you here. We have to wait and trust he is on our side. Tori sat up, suddenly chilled. She drew the furs over her bare legs. He cut off our magic, Mish. We could have escaped. Why would he do that? Perhaps there are others like him who can obliviate magic. Tori heaved a sigh. Or maybe, said Misha, Alec feared what would happen if we fought back. Tori had considered this. She had been furious when she realized that Skaya Dulbaruk had not come to welcome the gallows girl but to imprison her. A dark rage had filled her. She had fought hard not to let it show. Even Misha hadn't realized it until Tori admitted it later. Tori had reached for her magic, desperate to lash out and flee, but it had been as though grasping for vapor, and all because of Alec. Then he was a fool, and a liar. He told us there was a God's damned army up here. Misha smiled. What? said Tori, annoyed. Your fire is coming back. No more of that Shenza about all this being your fault. She hadn't had much time to think on it. She had been a fool, a puppet in the Chancellor's hands, and she wished she could go back and prevent the deaths of Zaya and the others. But the devastation of the beasts was not her fault. The Chancellor had made all this possible. He had tampered with power he did not understand, and he had forced her to use it as well. Nineteen innocent people had died in the mouth of the gods. Who knew how many more had died elsewhere? And that blood was on the Chancellor's hands, just like the blood of lowborn slaves and soldiers of Osha. Tori would not take it upon herself any longer, and the longer she waited beneath the ice city, the more determined she was to destroy Cyrus Morrow and free their friends. And that possibility is dwindling the longer we sit in this damn cave. Tori gritted her teeth. It doesn't matter if it's Shenza or not. What matters is that we are down here useless while things get worse all over the new world. Misha smiled again. What? We'll need that fire when we get out of here. Tori glared. If we get out of here. There was a creak as an immense iron door opened across the room. Tori and Misha shot to their feet. Two Aleut guards escorted Alec Dubaruk into the room. 
The shaman looked more regal now. He had donned fine white furs and dark breeches. His stubble from their journey north had been shaved smooth, and his dark hair was pulled back. Tori pushed away the fleeting thought that he looked handsome. Well, it's about time, Tori said. Alex stopped a short distance from them, both guardswomen remaining close to his sides, hands at the ready on upright spears. The shaman met her glare, then glanced away sheepishly. Er, would you mind dressing yourself, Tori? Tori glanced down at her exposed legs and thin undershirt. She quickly pulled on her trousers and woolen tunic. Alex smiled, still blushing. Thank you. It was a little distracting. Tori nearly smiled back. She hated how easily he could disarm her, that she had to remind herself she was furious at him. Where have you been? Alec remained calm. You've been treated well? Y yes, but... You've been warm and fed? The guards have not harmed you? Tori huffed. Yes, they've been fine. Good, he said steadily. By your tone, I was worried that something... My tone is like this because I'm bloody pissed at you, Alec de Baruch. You brought us all this way only to throw us in prison? Alec scowled. The guards' women stood expressionless beside him, but their fingers tightened around their spears. That was my sister's doing, Tori. And yes, this is more complicated than I'd hoped. But I have been working hard to defend you in the preliminary discussions before your trial. Preliminary discussions? You said your people were raising an army. You said they were ready for their restoration. I did. Alec raised his voice, and it made Tori glad. She wanted to rile him. I was not lying, Tori. Restoration has been prophesied for many years among the shamans, but many others are not as ready to seize it as we are. I think they're more than not ready, Tori shot back. I think you're an idealistic idiot. Alec was quiet for a moment. He sighed, and his eyes met hers. They were a warm brown and glowed in the lantern light. Perhaps I am. Tomorrow we'll tell. But Tori... Alec drew near and took hold of her hands. His fingers were warm and sweaty. He was nervous. I... I need you to trust me. Tori pulled away and crossed her arms. Did you do it? She demanded. Did you take away our magic? Alec's eyes fell. I am not the only shaman with this ability, but yes, I did. At least he's honest, Tori thought, but she scowled all the more. I'm not here to apologize. Then why are you here? said Tori. I have news from Osha. Tori's stomach felt queasy. Misha squeezed her hand. The others? Misha asked. Alec nodded. Many survived your encounter with the Nosferati, it seems, including your captain. Ren, was it? Tori and Misha nodded. But I'm afraid that's the only good news. While we were traveling north, the horde of Rulocks from the Crooked Teeth made its way to Osha. They attacked Moro El in an attempt to take back their realm. Good, said Tori. I hope they ruined that city. Alec shook his head. I'm afraid it gets worse. Magic is no longer forbidden in Osha. The Chancellor revealed his power, and he has formed his own magical army. He calls it the Sky Guard. They are led by your friend, the Gallows Boy. T Darian? Tori could barely utter his name. She had been a fool to entertain Mary's hope for him. Alec nodded. He led the defense of the city. The Sky Guard and the Night Legions fought valiantly against the Rulocks under Darien's leadership, but it was a hopeless resistance. The Rulocks broke through the city walls and were prepared to raise the White Citadel, but that is when she intervened. Who? said Tori. They call her the Darkling Witch, but her true name is Medea Lorzar. She subdued the Rulocks. She saved the city. Tori remembered her well from the watchtower. The last she had known, the woman was lost when the legions fled to the catacombs. That would have been too convenient. Subdued, said Tori. You mean she sent them back to the old world? Alec was silent for a moment. No, she communicated with them. Word of it is spreading all across the new world. 
the Rulaks withdrew their assault on Osha. They made peace with the Chancellor. Tori could not believe it. The thought made her sick. After all the Chancellors of old had done to the beasts of the old world. How? Tori finally said. How did she do it? Alex shrugged. They say she spoke to their minds. It was an unparalleled demonstration of power for any age of the world. Medea is being hailed as the savior of the North. People everywhere are spreading tales of the Chancellor and his darkling witch. Gods, said Misha. The Chancellor unleashed hell upon the New World and has managed to set himself up as the bloody savior from that very same hell. He claims you're the cause of all this, Tori, said Alec. And, and the people of Osha believe him. There were rumors of lowborns stirring, calling themselves the saints of the North, but this has lessened since the battle. Tori felt squeamish. This would not help her case before the Aleut elders. Her innocence rested on the claim that the Chancellor was the one who had unleashed the mayhem of the Old World beasts. But with the attack on Maro El and the Chancellor's miraculous victory, her claims would seem all the more unfounded. You've come to tell me it's hopeless, then, said Tori. Alec's eyes betrayed his uncertainty, though his words claimed otherwise. Nothing's hopeless, but things are not going well. The elders are skeptical as ever, and my Madru is chief among them. Who is your mother exactly? said Tori. Why didn't you ever tell me about her, or any of this? We would have avoided the North altogether. Alec glanced at the guards' women, and Tori realized they had been sent to watch him as much as the two young watchers. My Madru is Farah Dulbaruk, elder of the Nukvana, the Bear Rider clan. She is also the High Elder among the four clans. And I'm afraid she will be the hardest of them all to convince. Her lover was the captain of the trading vessel that was lost in the Channel Sea. Tori wondered if things could possibly get any worse. And even if somehow the others should decide to believe us, with this news from Osha, they are even more wary of any notions of restoration or war. And we have no allies. You have the crooked folk said Misha. More would join us, I'm sure of it. You spoke of the Witch Queen of the Southern Isles, said Tori. Or was that more of your idealistic Shenza? It's not. Alec's face tensed. I saw the Queen in a vision, not long before I left for the Crooked Teeth. Not long before I found you. I believe she will play a part in all this. But all of those futures depend on convincing the elders of your innocence. Alec would not meet her gaze. Look at me, said Tori. Alec did. What will happen if they find me guilty? Alec gulped, but he held her gaze as he answered. If the elders find you guilty, you will be tried by fire and ice, and unless the gods intervene on your behalf, you will die. Misha gripped her hand. Tori felt weak. Had she really come all this way, only to be sentenced to death in the one place where her regenero abilities could be rendered useless? Then let me speak to them, Tori said, more irritated than ever about being left helpless underground. Alec sighed. You will have your chance to defend yourself at the trial. But you should know our elders do not highly value the testimony of those wishing to defend themselves. It is, by its very nature, self-serving. That is the other reason I've come. The trial will be held tonight at the rise of the empty moons. But before that time, they wish to speak with you, Misha. Misha nodded, but she did not hide her grim expression. The guards' women lowered their spears and stepped forward. Misha squeezed Tori's hand. I'll convince them, Tori. Alec managed to smile in Tori's direction. The guards took Misha by the arms and let her out. Alec followed. And Tori was left alone in the dungeons beneath the ice city. Chapter 15 Alec Dulbaruk led Misha through the winding passages and narrow stairways cut straight into the star rock foundations of the ice city. Their path was lit by pale blue crystals, which glowed with a warm luminescence. 
Misha had not noticed the strange light the last time she had journeyed down these halls, for she and Tori both had been bound and blindfolded. The guards followed close behind, but Misha was not bound this time, which she hoped was a good omen. These stones are incredible, said Misha, gesturing at the curious sources of light. What are they? The crystals were the size of her fist, held by iron clasps fixed to the cavern walls. Alec paused, and with a gloved hand retrieved one of the glowing stones from its hold and handed it to her. Misha flinched as it touched her skin, expecting it to be hot, but it did not burn her. It's cold, she observed. The stone glowed brighter against her skin. Where does the light come from? Alec's lips parted in a smile. We call it ice fire. Its light comes from within, rather like glowworms. Glowworms, said Misha, perplexed. Alec laughed. He gestured down the hall, and they carried on. Misha marveled at how light the stone was, as though it were hollow. My friend, you have not lived until you've walked through a cavern by the light of glowworms. They give off their own light and shine on cave walls like the night sky. Ice fire, however, is more of a mystery. We do not understand the source of its light. It may be the crystal itself, or perhaps some tiny luminous creature that feeds off the minerals within, or perhaps it is fueled by a strange magic. But it is our main source of light here in the ice city. Fuel is scarce for fires, and we use what little wood can be found this far north for shelters and building ships and kayaks. Ice fire was a blessing from the gods when it was discovered shortly after our arrival in the Icelands. It gives light to the north in the long dark winters, much like the lights of Anora. Alec handed the crystal to one of the guards and ordered her to restore it to its rightful place behind them, which she did with evident irritation. Misha swore the other guard drew even closer during the brief time her partner was missing. Ice fire, said Misha as they pressed on. And the trial of fire and ice, Alec finished for her. It would determine the future of their plight in the north, the future of their revolution, the future of Tori's life. There is a reason the trial of the gods was given that name. Ice fire is one of our most beloved gifts from Anora. Where does it come from? The crystals form deep below Ikala in ancient caverns. We believe Anora once lived here, long ago, when the gods still walked the earth. We send hunters into the depths to harvest them. Do they burn out, the crystals? So long as they remain connected to their madru, the earth, they shine without end. Up here they last a few weeks. They continued on in silence and Misha tried to steel herself for the interrogation to come. She felt a weight on her mind she had not felt since her fourteenth summer with Allah. Tori's life might rest on her words, on the answers she chose for the elders' questions, just as Allah's life had once rested on her answers to her father's questions. Misha pushed the dark memory away. She would not fail this time. But what was she to say? Tori had opened up the portal to the old world, as the Chancellor claimed. She had stirred them up when she resisted the Chancellor. And Alec's mother wanted to believe the claims after the death of her lover by sea dragons. Tori herself feared she had let in those other monsters. The truth was, Misha did not know what to believe. Had the Chancellor done this? Intending to turn the world against the gallows girl all along? Or was it some catastrophic accident? Either way, there was no denying one thing. Tori was involved in this devastation. Should she lie, then? Or would Alec's mother see right through her? When the stone tunnels turned to a massive hall made of ice, the guards lingered behind, standing watch at the iron door to the dungeons below. The halls of the palace were massive, supported by thick pillars that towered at least fifty feet to the arched roof all made of intricately carved ice. The halls were filled with Aleut dressed in thick white furs, much like the giant furs lining the icy walls. Misha wondered what animals the furs had belonged to. Mammoths? North bears? Shadow cats? Misha's breath misted in front of her face now that they were above ground, 
and she pulled her fur cloak tighter. Most of our dwellings are below ground, said Alec as they walked. Misha wondered if he was telling her all this to distract himself. If so, she was glad for it. It was so warm in our cell. The rock gives off heat from the world below, throughout the city's foundations. The ice insulates the walls of the palace well enough, but the comfort of the underworld is unmatched this far north, so most endure the darkness for the sake of warmth. I can't imagine why, said Misha sardonically. She had never longed more for the warmth of the islands of her childhood than here in the north. They crossed several similar halls, filled with warriors and fishermen and children and hunters. The palace seemed to be the hub of the city above ground. Traders hauled carts filled with fish, lamp oil, and furs. But the busiest carts were those dealing in goods from the south, grain, fruits, spices, even jewelry. Many people watched them pass, their eyes settling on Misha, which made her uncomfortable. She supposed that few of them had ever seen outsiders, let alone an island girl from the southern reaches of the continent. The crowds dwindled as they reached a narrower passage with a guarded entrance. The throne room doors were decorated with ice-fire crystals and glowed with a beautiful luminescence that reminded Misha of moonlight on the beaches of her homeland. She paused outside the doors and touched Alec's arm. The guards stood watch with one hand at their spears. Your mother, said Misha. She sounds like a fierce woman. What can I say to convince her? Alec shook his head with a sigh. My Madru is a hard woman, but she loves her people. Her duty is to the well-being of the Aleut, first and foremost. You must convince her that letting the gallows girl live will be to the advantage of my people, that it will not bring more pain and suffering in the North. Haven't you already told her that? Tori could bring restoration for your people. Alec grimaced. Unfortunately, my Madru and I do not see things with the same eyes. Where I see opportunity, she sees needless suffering for our people. She has heard my pleas. But she hardened her heart to me long ago. I should warn you, though, the elders will see through any lie. Then what do I say? Misha felt helpless, as though the verdict had already been determined. Speak wisely and speak the truth, but be cautious what truths you choose to share. Alec nodded to the guards, and they pushed open the doors. Misha fought back the urge to retch with nervousness. The throne room was bordered by immense ice pillars, and between the pillars stood rows of guards, lining the hall all the way to the four ice-fire thrones set upon the dais. One throne for each elder, Misha assumed. A woman sat erect upon one of the glowing thrones, her fingers forming a tower near her chin, as though deep in thought. The room was silent as Alec and Misha approached, but as they neared, Misha realized that the throne was not occupied by the High Elder. It was occupied by her daughter, Skaya Dulbaruk. Misha glanced around, but there was no one else in the throne room. None of the elders had come to hear her plea for Tori's life. The fierce-looking young bear rider leaned forward as Misha and Alec approached the Aleut thrones. Alec cursed under his breath. Where's Madru? Skaya's expression betrayed a hint of bemusement. She was taken away by tribal matters. I'm sure you can imagine our high elder is a busy woman. A host of refugees have joined our already teeming city. Hunting is growing sparse as winter descends, and much of our supply for the long night was lost at sea. Thanks to your gallows, girl. Alec threw back his head with exasperation. The trial is hours away, and Misha's testimony is vital to our case. Skaya's brow rose. Which is why our Madru asked me to hear the island girl's testimony in her stead. You? said Alec, his hands running through his long hair. Skaya rose to her feet and descended from the throne. I am a captain of the Nukbana daughter of the High Elder. I've killed more rogues than most of my kin. Why not me? She and Alec stood eye to eye for a moment, and then they clasped shoulders in a formal greeting. The Aleut siblings were nearly identical in height, 
but that was where the similarities ended, as far as Misha could tell. Alec was a shaman, while his sister was a warrior and a hunter. Alec was lanky, even beneath his thick cloak and long leather sleeves. Skaya's muscular arms were bare beneath her fur cloak, despite the chill. Tattoos wove around her left arm in red and blue cyclical patterns, identical to those on the side of her head, where her long, dark hair was shaved. Alec's face was soft and kind, while Skaya's was stern and fierce. But her expression softened as she released her brother's grip. Your fight is not with me, Faru. You know that, don't you? Alec nodded, though Misha was not convinced. We may have our differences, Skaya went on. You whisper prayers, while I prefer the way of the spear, but I harbor no ill will toward you. I wish I could say the same for our Madru, and she is the one I must convince of Tori's innocence. And where in the abyss is she? Misha could tell Alec cared for Tori, but there was a desperation in Alec's voice that worried her. Skaya's expression turned grim. You know as well as I, our High Elder does not heed the counsel of shamans, least of all you. Alec nodded, though Misha noted a sad mistiness in his eyes. Then it's already been decided? Skaya shook her head. I did not say that. The warrior turned to Misha, looking her up and down. Misha was conscious of the fact that she had been wearing the same clothes ever since she had left the watchtower. Though she had been able to wash herself in their cell underground, she was relieved it was cool in the world above, so the stench of her garments was subdued. Convince me, my lady. Misha could not decide if Skaya was mocking her or simply attempting courtesy. Misha had not been addressed so formally since her childhood. My name is Misha Sufai of Melanesia. Misha held the warrior's gaze. Her features appeared perpetually hardened, perhaps due to her station as a captain, but Skaya managed a hint of a smile. Defend your gallows girl then, Misha. What are we to make of the Chancellor's claims? Skaya returned to her seat upon the throne, leaned back in a slight slouch, and crossed one leg over the other. Her smile faded and Misha felt naked under the girl's scrutinizing gaze. Misha knew there was no way she could lie. She straightened up and began. The Chancellor blames Astoria Buridai for the havoc that is being wreaked throughout the New World, and he is not fully wrong. Skaya's eyebrows rose. But he is a master at disguising truths within lies, Captain. It is true that Tori brought back the beasts of the Old World, I was there when the Chancellor took her there and forced her to bring them back. Took her to the old world, said Skaya querulously. With godstones, Skaya sat up straight. So they're real. Misha hoped this was a good sign. The Chancellors of old, the descendants of the conquerors who drove your people out of Osha, used the stones to create this other world where they banished the creatures of the old world. Misha hoped that bit of ancient history might register an emotional effect, but Skaya's expression had resumed its mildly interested appearance. Misha went on. That is how all these beasts have returned, seemingly out of myth. Cyrus Morrow used Tori's magic to open a portal between the worlds. He wanted to unleash the Rulaks to destroy our fortress and the Crooked Teeth. We were mounting a rebellion against him. Hmm... Skaya drummed her fingers on the icy arms of the glowing throne. She looked fiercely captivating in the blue light. The glow softened her smooth skin, and Misha wondered how old she was, likely little older than herself. So you saw the Chancellor take her to this other world? asked Skaya. Well, in fact, Misha had only heard the account from Tori. She had remained with Zaya and the other Watcher prisoners while the Chancellor dealt with Tori. Well, uh, no, I did not witness it, Captain. But you saw her coming back with the Rulaks, then? Misha shook her head, fear beginning to penetrate her resolve. I heard only the accounts of others who witnessed the attack. I was imprisoned inside the watchtower after the Chancellor invaded our fortress. Skaya nodded. Because you were rebelling? 
so you did not see who, in fact, let in the beasts from this other world, nor how it was accomplished. No. I see. Skya remained expressionless. Misha clenched her fists in frustration. No, I did not see it, but I heard the story from Tori. She is my friend, and I trust her. She did not willingly let the Rulocks in. The Chancellor forced her hand. She was trying to save the rest of us. The Chancellor threatened to kill us all, to exterminate our kind, just like his forefathers. She had no choice. She had no idea the devastation the monsters would cause, and she deeply regrets that choice. You're saying the Chancellor used the Gallows Girl to let in the beasts that attacked his own capital only weeks ago. The beasts got out of his control, but it was his scheme. Tori was a pawn in his plot to dominate the North. Skya thought for a minute. Believe me, Misha, we in the North hold no love for the Chancellor or Osha, but you must admit the Chancellor's subduing of the Rulocks in Maro El does not help your case. That was his witch, Medea, who was there when the Watchtower was attacked. And what of these other beasts? The frost giants who attacked my people in the Mount of the Gods? The sea dragons that attacked our traders in the Channel Sea? What are we to make of them? How did they return to haunt our world? Was it Tori who let them in as well? I... I don't know. Skya nodded grimly. Well, what do you think? Misha threw up her hands. What difference does it make what I think? Your mind is already made up, so why are we even speaking? Alec tried to cut her off. Misha, you... But Misha was through with this political game. You want to know what I think, Skya Dulbaruk? I think you and your elders want to believe the Chancellor's lies. I think you want an excuse not to seek your restoration. You found comfort in exile. You keep warm underground with your fire stones and your pretty ice fire lights. No one in the world cares what you do in the North, and you've come to enjoy that isolation. You fear bringing attention to the North by harboring the Gallows Girl, and so you believe the Chancellor's words, because they are convenient. But you do not know the injustices of the Southern world, Captain. You think we do not know of their cruelty? Skya's eyes grew wide. Need I remind you, it was they who drove my people from the land they call Osha. Misha fought back a smile. She had hit her mark, but she did not hold back. The Chancellors still rule your homeland with cruelty and blood, and you fear the cost of leaving this place and taking back your home. You fear the unknown enough to sacrifice my friend to save your own skins. Skya glared down from the throne, and Misha swore the ice fire light grew darker. You dishonor my people with such words, Misha Sufai. Alec stood beside Misha, shaking his head at her brazenness. Skya Dulbaruk's eyes were alight, and Misha felt as though the captain's gaze might cut straight through her. But Misha did not quit. You dishonor yourselves if you think killing Tori will save you from the same fate as those in the South. One day, the Chancellor's wrath will turn to the North, and you will regret killing the one true hope the New World had. Skya stood, towering over her now. That is what you think, little island girl? Skya descended the steps and stood over her. The guards drew closer. Misha could feel the bear rider's hot breath on her face, and she worried the young warrior was going to pummel her. Skya was trying to show her dominance like curs did among packs of wild dogs in the poor districts of the Triumville. But Misha held the warrior's gaze. Yes, that's what I think. And if you and your mother ignore this opportunity, if you kill her, you'll be no better than the slave traders and highborns of the southern world, looking the other way for your own comfort. The captain of the bear riders reached for her, and Misha winced. But to her amazement, Skya did not strike her. She clasped her shoulder in a firm but comradely fashion. Few are bold enough to speak that way to me, Misha Sufai. You presume much about me and my people, but I can sense your sincerity. Misha was not sure what to say, so she nodded. You truly believe the gallows girl is the hope of the new world? I have seen the way the crooked refugees and some of your own people responded to her on our journey here. I think people across the world will rally behind her. I think a story of Burrow might just be able to change this dark world. 
With magic, said Skyr. We do not trust magic in the north, you know. It was used against us once, so we learned to dismantle its hold on us. Magic has returned to the world, whether you like it or not. And if it is left to the Chancellor, it will mean the end of the new world as we know it. But with Tori, magic might just save us all. Skya managed a hint of a smile, and she squeezed Misha's shoulder. Her touch was remarkably warm. I like your spirit, Misha Sufai, and you have said what I hoped to hear. Alec looked up with surprise. She did? Misha's body relaxed a little at the words. Yes, Baru, and I am not the only one. Another young woman stepped from behind a pillar where she had been listening to their conversation. Her silver hair fell in waves over her shoulders. She was dressed in a regal sapphire gown with sparkling sleeves that reached her wrists. The finery immediately betrayed her otherness in this place. No Aleut or crooked refugee dressed so finely or without furs. She wore only a thin shawl over her gown. Her breath did not mist the way Misha's did, and her eyes shone like ice fire. Who are you? said Alec, his hand flying to the hunting blade at his belt. The woman smiled nonchalantly. Don't you know my face, Alec Dulbaru? I remember yours. What? From our visions, of course. Our, our visions? They work both ways, you know. The woman smiled, and Misha was struck by the way her presence seemed to dominate the room. Misha could not take her eyes off the stately young woman. It reminded her of the time the Prince of Malai had come to Melanesia. There had been a parade, and young Misha had watched the young boy until he completely disappeared from sight, marveling at his attire, his procession, his noble air. She felt the same presence from this woman now. Alec's eyes spread wide with amazement, and his hand relaxed at his blade. My visions! Incredible! You mean, you've seen me as well? Of course I have, Alec Dubaruk. Where did you think the visions came from? The gods? The young woman chuckled. Well, yes, actually, said Alec. I've had other visions, in fact, or apart from the ones of you. The woman's eyes sparkled with fascination. Really? For those of us who are not involved in these visions, would you all mind explaining what in the abyss is going on? Asked Misha. Alec pulled himself together, his eyes leaving the woman for the first time since she appeared. He straightened himself. This is Seren Letal. Misha did not recognize the name. And? She's the witch queen of the Southern Isles. Now Misha was intrigued. The infamous sorceress of the Southern World had come here. But how? Alec said, turning to the queen. Skaya interjected. You told me of your visions of the queen before you left for the crooked teeth. And you thought them ridiculous, said Alec. I did, until we heard word from Uluk of the events in the mouth of the gods and the gallows girl who was journeying with you. While our high elder prepared to seize her upon your arrival, I sent word to the southern isles. I have very much wanted to meet your friend, Isha, said the witch queen who struck Misha as far more relaxed than any dignitary Misha had ever heard of. Her voice was soft and wispy. Her presence was strong and demanded attention, but not in a harsh way like the Chancellor's. No one had even bowed when she revealed herself. But how did you arrive so quickly? said Alec. Sorcery, said Sarin Natal. And after hearing your words, Misha, I am glad I came as fast as I did. There is much I wish to discuss with your gallows girl. She will testify before the elders tonight, said Skaya. On Astoria Burodai's behalf. Alec shook his head in disbelief. I, I am sorry I doubted you, Saru. He embraced his sister, and though a little stiffly, she returned it. For the first time since arriving in the north, Misha felt relief. With Skaya and the witch queen on their side, Surely the elders could not argue for Tori's execution. But her relief was short-lived. 
the ice fire doors spread wide with a groan, and a young soldier crossed the room. When he reached them, he bowed to Skaya and then to Alec. Captain, shaman, the elders have requested your audience in the assembly. The assembly, said Alec incredulously. Now, said Skaya, a dark look crossing her face. The soldier nodded. The trial is not till moonrise. Misha's stomach nodded beneath her skin as she realized what had happened. The soldier shook his head. The trial is over. That's why your Madru asked you to handle the throne in her stead. Chapter 16 The trial was a farce, and Tori knew it the moment she was taken from her cell beneath the ice city. Alec's mother came to take her from her cell only minutes after Alec and Misha left. Farah del Baruch did not bother to explain herself as two guards led Tori down the blue-lit passage, while the High Elder led the way to the city above. Tori knew what was happening, and it was confirmed the moment she reached the round assembly chamber of the Ice City. The room was filled with Aleut of all ages, and even a few crooked folk, but Alec and Misha were nowhere to be seen. It was clear the elders had never intended that Tori might go free. Their trial was swift and pointless, the witnesses cleverly chosen, the questions of the elders worded to work against her. Most had already testified before Tori even arrived to hear their scapegoat accusations. According to one young impressionable witness, Tori had let the frost giant wreak havoc on their company in the mouth of the gods, failing or perhaps intending to fail in her attempt to fight the old world monster. And if it hadn't been for Tesla, they might all have died. It was truth shrouded by lies. So the entire trial went. Crooked refugees were brought forward, and their regard for the gallows girl changed drastically the moment the tribal elders informed them that Tori had been the one who had unleashed the Rulocks upon their villages. It was a truth Tori could not deny and though distorted against her, she could not reason her way out of the blame. She had pressed her hand against the portal, alongside the Chancellor, the Godstone searing her palm. It had been her blood that worked the stones to bring that devastation upon the crooked teeth. One Aleut sailor even proposed the absurd notion that he had seen the gallows girl's sorcerous face in the mists moments before the sea dragons attacked the trading fleet in the Channel Sea. The four tribal elders devoured the Shenza like pigs to slop. The entire charade seemed to take only minutes. Tori kept glancing at the doors, hoping that any moment Misha and Alec would come to defend her. Surely the elders would allow someone to defend her side of things. But no one came. The accusations mounted, and the assembly began to grow angry, goaded by the elders and their predetermined case. When it was clear the verdict was all but decided, Farah Dulbaruk finally addressed Tori before the assembly. You have heard the charges made against you, gallows girl. Farah Dulbaruk's face was cold with unabashed hatred. By your own admission, with the use of dark sorcery, you let the Rulocks that destroyed the homes of these poor crooked folk through this demonic portal. You stand accused not only of the slaughter of hundreds of crooked folk, but of nineteen of my kinsmen in the mouth of the gods, as well as forty-three brave souls lost in the Channel Sea. I shudder to think how many more have died across the new world from your actions. What say you to these accusations? Tori stood before the assembly. She had no connection to her magic. It had not returned to her once she'd arrived in Ikala. She had no help from Misha or Alec or anyone else. She had nothing but words. So Tori held her head high and addressed the assembly, holding on to the fading hope that she could convince these people she was their ally, not their enemy. Good people of the North, you mourn your dead and you long for justice, and I do not blame you for that desire. Crooked folk, you have lost many innocent lives. Alut, you have lost as well. I mourned those we lost in the mouth of the gods, alongside many of you, as we marched across the Icelands. Mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, 
good people who did not deserve to die in such a terrible way. But you are not alone in your suffering. The whole world is suffering. It is true that I had a hand in their deaths, though I am afraid not in the way you would like. I was forced to choose, and I resisted the Chancellor. This act stirred up the Rulocks. They destroyed our fortress as well. All these deaths, the Watchers, the Crooked Folk, the Aleut, they were all at the hand of a common enemy. Yes, said the High Elder, waving her hands in mockery. You would have us believe that the Chancellor of Osha unleashed the very creatures who devastated his own city. Tori fought back the urge to lash out. She unclenched her fists and spoke evenly. With all due respect, Elder Baruch, it is clear your beliefs are set regardless of what I could ever say to convince you or anyone else. You have taken my only witnesses from me and ensured that no voice but my own can defend me. My own testimony is self-serving, and so you will likely disregard it no matter what I say. The High Elder huffed and crossed her arms, but the Elder of the Karova clan gestured for her to go on. You should know that killing me will not keep you safe forever. I fear the losses in the mouth and the Channel Sea are only the beginning. The old world has returned to us with all its curses. Whether you will believe me or not, it is true. The Chancellor did this. Like all the Chancellors before him, Cyrus Morrow's only goal is to spread his dominion across the world. And if he has truly subdued the Rulocks, as the tales say, then I fear that soon he will use these monsters from the old world to rule the new. Killing me is exactly what he wants. Elder Baruch laughed darkly. Tori noted that the other three elders did not share her sardonic mirth. If this is your attempt to persuade us, you have a curious way of doing it. It seems to me that appeasing the Chancellor is the one thing that might spare us this dark tide in the South. Why shouldn't we do as he wants? Tori stood tall. She looked out upon the faces of those in the assembly. She could sense their fear. For centuries you have lived apart from the world, and though it has required much sacrifice, you have grown strong in this isolation and for centuries the world has been content to ignore what happens here in the White North. But that age is over. Farah del Baruch approached her, but Tori did not stop. She focused on the people of the assembly. This was her last chance. Magic and monsters have returned to the world, and they will shape it, one way or another. People of the North, you have seen it. You have seen Rulaks and Frost Giants and Sea Dragons returned. If you kill me, you may appease the Chancellor for a while. But how long until more monsters slaughter your people? How long until the Chancellor decides to subdue the peoples of the North? The time will come when no one can fight because all are spread too far across the world. Now is the opportunity your shamans have foreseen. I know you long for restoration. So join us and fight, Osha. Take back your... The High Elder's back hand ended her plea, and Tori crumpled to the ground. The taste of blood filled her mouth. Her jaw ached, and it did not heal. The shamans made sure of it. Enough! cried Farah Dubelruk, standing over her, veins surging at her temples. Do not pretend you know anything about my people, Darkling. You know nothing of the North. The High Elder turned to the other elders. We have heard enough of this sorcerer's lies. The girl has confessed to the crimes of which she has been accused. What shall our verdict be? The elders circled up, and the assembly went silent. A pair of guards seized Tori by the shoulders and jerked her to her feet. Tori did not fight the guards. She knew it was no use. She had no power over them with magic any more than she had through words. Blood poured from the corners of her lips. Rage surged inside her as she watched the High Elder's vehement whispers. Tori longed for her connection to the energy behind the world. It had become such a part of her, the truest part of her, and if she was going to die, she wished to feel fully alive one more time. The other three elders nodded their heads submissively at Elder Baruch. Tori could tell that her words had worried them, 
but she feared it did not matter. The elders conferred amongst themselves for only a few moments before they turned to the assembly. Farah del Baruch was the first to speak. The Nukvana find Astoria Borodai, this darkling known as the Gallows Girl, guilty of murder. The elder of the Tuva spoke next. Guilty. And then the elder of the Iguvara. Guilty. And finally the elder of the Karuva. The man held her gaze for a moment, and Tori thought there might be the slightest chance he would dissent. But then he spoke. Guilty. The assembly began to chant. Guilty. 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 And how do we deal with murderers in the north? cried Farah del Baruch over the din. The chant morphed then. At first it was muddled and hard to distinguish, but then Tori pieced together the words. The chorus unified into a dark cadence. Fire and ice! Fire and ice! Fire and ice! The high elder raised her hands and the crowd quieted. Take her to the pyre! The crowd roared. Before the guards dragged her away, Farah Dulbaruk leaned close, a wicked smile on her lips. Let's see the gallows girl rise from death in the north. Chapter 17 As Tori was led to the stake, she was shoved and cursed. Children threw rocks, their parents volleyed insults. But little Tesla threw herself in front of the procession. No, you can't do this, she's good! Tess was shoved aside by one of the guards, and the poor young watcher was slow to rise, her legs still weak from her encounter with the frost giant. Her brother Jordy helped her up and Tori met their gazes as the guards shoved her on down the main thoroughfare of the ice city. Don't you listen to them, Tess. Your gifts are good. Misha will help you learn them. Tess choked back a sob. Okay. You take care of your sister, Jordy. The young crooked boy nodded to her, but his eyes were not filled with the sorrow his sisters were. He was expressionless and Tori felt sure he'd been swayed by the High Elder's words, like all the other crooked folk. She had let the Rulocks through that destroyed their homeland, and no one but Tess protested as the gallows girl was led to the pyre. The guards shoved her onward, poking her back with the butt-ends of their spears. No one was coming to save her. Alec and Misha were nowhere to be found. The crooked folk had turned against her, and the Aleut were growing more furious the longer the procession went on. Did Alec play a part in this scheme? Is that why he's disappeared? Tori wanted to think not. She wanted to believe in him, but it didn't matter. Either he was a traitor or a fool, and regardless, she was going to die, and no one was going to come. Farah Abdul Baruch had made sure of that. Tori had never before wondered what it would be like to burn to death, but she hoped it would end quickly. In her last moments, she thought strangely of her nemesis at the watchtower. Years ago, Vashti Burodai had endured this same fate at her father's hand. But her budding Regenero gifts had kept her alive. Ren and Kale had rescued her, brought her to the watchtower, all so she could betray the Shadow Watch. In a way, Vashti's own burning at the stake had led to Tori's, to this moment. She pushed away the hollow bitterness she felt. It seemed pointless, considering the circumstances. Vashti had had her reasons, and Tori supposed Elder Baruch had her reasons as well. Perhaps the Chancellor had his reasons, just as Wren had back at the Watchtower. And all their reasons had mounted into a death sentence that Tori was weary of running from. She had been dancing with death since the day of the gallows, and death had finally matched her steps. They reached their destination at the center of the city, where a great pyre of pale snow pine had been set up in an open square. Farah Dulbaruk stood before the pyre. The other three clan elders stood beside her, holding lanterns made of blue ice fire. Tori realized that no one carried torches here in the ice city. Aleut light seemed to center around the mysterious crystals. When Tori had been chained securely to the lone pole standing from the base of logs, 
The high elder raised her hands for silence. My kinsmen, Elder Baruch said, addressing the hundreds of people gathered to watch the gallows girl die. Centuries ago, invaders arrived on the shores of our world, bearing fair countenances and dark magic. They drove our people from our homeland, and we fled here, to the great white north, cursing the darklings and their sorcery. Thanks to the blessings of Shalom and Enora, our shamans learned sacred arts to render that darkness useless here in the north. We have lived in peace ever since. We have made a new home, safe from the curses of the southern world. But now this darkling has brought those curses upon us anew. At the hands of this gallows girl, monsters have been brought back to haunt our world. And as is common of such things, our people have suffered at the whims of darklings. Astoria, Burrow Die, you have been found guilty before the elders, before the people of the great white north, and before the gods. You shall be executed according to the customs of the north, a punishment reserved only for those who delve into the darkness behind the world, the trial of fire and ice. Farah Dulbarug held up a glowing blue stone. Its veiny markings made it seem like some sort of living thing. It reminded Tori vaguely of the Chancellor's godstones. A serene feeling of acceptance came over her as the High Elder brandished the crystal. Her end had come. Enora gifted our people with her lights in the sky and in the earth below so that we might see in a dark world. The ice fire stone pulsed in the Elder's hands. May Anora bring justice to the north. The crowd cried out with a guttural roar. It transformed into a chant. The people swayed to the rhythm, and Tori realized it was a sort of ritualistic prayer. Then the world went silent. The high elder cried out in the tongue of the north, holding the ice fire crystal high, and then she cast the stone into the pyre. To Tori's amazement, the crystal shattered with a flash of blue flame. The kindling wedged between the logs was the first to ignite. The elder of the Tuva cast the next stone, and more kindling caught fire. When the elders were finished, a large flame had caught at the base of the pyre. The clansmen and women proceeded to cast more stones handed to them by the elders. A procession passed by, old men and young children, warriors and mothers bearing infants. All were part of this dark ceremony. Ice fire shattered upon the wood, and the glowing blue flames grew larger and larger, rushing from log to log. Tori steeled herself for the pain to come. She resisted tears. She thought of the way Darian had once bravely faced a martyr's death. He had been so strong. Tori had stolen that death from him, but she knew there could be power in her own death now. The realization seemed to come from outside her. Do not forget those who suffer in the southern world, Tori shouted. Do not forget your restoration. Your time is near. At these words, the faces of many of the Aleut people changed, and Tori thought that perhaps there was hope. But then the flames grew darker until they reached a violent hue, lapping at Tori's feet and then her legs. Tori kept expecting to feel searing, agonizing heat, but instead she only felt colder. A sharp chill cut through her woolen garments and her fur-lined cloak. The ice fire consumed the wood, crackling and hissing, like any fire. But this fire felt utterly different. The larger the flames, the more she shivered. Tori's boots disintegrated and her feet grew numb. The flames lapped at her legs, up to her fingers. She could not feel them any longer. And then, with fury, the pain came. Tori screamed only once. She clenched her teeth and held in the agony. She would not give the elders the satisfaction of her torture. She pictured Darian on the day of the gallows, and she straightened herself. She would die bravely. Her exposed toes cracked and peeled with the searing cold. She clenched her fists so that her nails tore into her palms. Sharp pangs shot up her raw and aching legs. She bit down on her tongue and held in a shriek. Her spine felt like it might shatter inside her. 
Her chest felt heavy as the flames rose higher and higher. Her mind was fading. Elder Baruch was saying something. People were jeering. And poor Tesla was crying, down on her knees, her brother holding on to her hand. The flames grew higher, singeing Tori's hair. Her clothes began to burn and fall away. Her skin was blue, and she could not move her body any longer. Tori's mind drifted away. The numbness returned, the terrible pain faded, and in the flames, Tori saw a strange face, ugly but smiling. It welcomed her to the world beyond. And then she felt at peace. Chapter 18 Alec and Skaya sprinted from the throne room, and Misha ran after them, joined by Soren Latal. The main halls of the palace were empty, and so was the assembly chamber. They soon realized why. The entire city was herding down the main thoroughfare of Ikala, chanting a dark mantra in the ancient language of the Aleut. They are taking her to the pyre, said Skaya, her eyes lit with rage. Misha's heart filled with dread. How can this be possible? How could Alec's mother be so ruthless? They can't kill her. They can't. Alec cursed and pressed into the crowd. Skaya followed, shoving her way violently. Misha wished she had access to her watcher gifts. She wished she could fly over this teeming mass and find Tori. They could still escape if only the barrier could be removed from her magic. But there was no time. Misha lowered her shoulder, ready to shove her way through or be trampled in the process. But a hand held her back. It was the Witch Queen. What are you doing? Misha shouted, jerking her arm away. Saving your friend. Misha stepped away from the crowd. What are you saying? It is clear the gallows girl has already been condemned. Even if you do make it to her before she is consumed by fire and ice, what will you do? I'll free her, or I'll die trying. I know a way that may not require your death. What way? Misha demanded. You must follow me. Where? To the outskirts of the city. But they're taking her to the heart of the city. We'll never make it in time that way. The crowds are too thick. The queen gripped Misha's hand. You must trust me. It is Tori's only hope. The queen sprinted back through the empty palace, the way they'd come, and Misha raced after her. She had never felt so slow, despite the fact Misha and the queen were sprinting through the ice city. Soren Latal flew down the halls on light feet that barely seemed to touch the ground. When they reached the northern entrance to the palace, they emerged on a dark, abandoned lane. The queen did not hesitate. She raced down the street, turning corners with sheer confidence. The din of the procession ebbed into a dull roar, like distant waves on a pebbled shore. Soren led them farther and farther from the place Tori was being executed. Misha cursed herself. She was a fool for trusting this strange sorceress. Yet Soren Latal might be Tori's only hope. The queen had arrived by magic, and Misha hoped desperately it was something the god's damned shamans couldn't render useless. They reached the rolling hills of ice and star rock that surrounded Ikala. The wind whipped across the ice and stung Misha's face as they ran. She worried she would lose her footing on the slick surface. They crested another hill, and Misha noticed a glow beyond the great mound ahead. The queen raced over the steep hillside, and Misha saw a schooner sitting upon the ice. It was one of the strangest sights Misha had ever beheld. It looked as though the ship had been capsized during a storm. What other explanation was there? Except the ship was not smattered upon the ice, though it must have been thrown several leagues inland. It sat upon an icy plain, glowing with a soft, golden luminescence. Specks of light were fixed upon the rigging, the deck, and the taffrail. It was majestic, and it made no sense why such a thing would be out here beyond the city. Was there a frozen lake beneath the ice? The queen sprinted across the snow. Little gay, she shouted. Ready the sails! The golden light grew fiercer, and as she neared, Misha realized it was not the light of lanterns that created the ship's glow. It emanated from tiny creatures, 
At the queen's voice, they flitted around the ship on tiny golden wings. Strange markings slowly lit up along the sides of the ship. Glyphs written in a language unknown to Misha. The characters were not rooted in the common tongue, nor the ancient tongues of the southern world. Misha sprinted after Seren Latal up the gangplank. The ship trembled beneath them as they reached the stern. The queen pulled a lever. The sails unfurled, but not only the ones fixed to the mast. Two great expanses of sail stretched from either side like white wings. One of the tiny golden creatures shot over to them, a thousand others swarming all around. Misha had heard tales of fairies in the old world. They were said to be among the loveliest creatures of the ancient days, though their seductions led many to their demise. But this fairy was not seductive in the least. Up close, the creature was abhorrent. Its face was twisted, and dark horns protruded from its skull. It hovered before the queen, bowing in the air, its wings vibrating with the speed of a hummingbird's. Leaving so soon, my queen? What is being wrong? The trial goes so poorly? Misha had expected a high voice, but the fairy's was low and grave. No time, Lirke. Get us airborne. The queen gripped the helm. Airborne? Misha shivered. Lirge let out a screeching cry in a strange language. But it must have been an order, for at his voice the world filled with the shrill buzzing of the demon fairies. Seren gripped the helm tightly. More luminescent glyphs appeared on the deck, and then the sails. The ship lurched beneath her feet, and Misha fell to her knees. Where to? cried Lirge in a shout that was uncanny for his small size. The center of the Ice City, said Seren Latal. The ship arched back, the snow and ice groaning beneath the weight of the immense craft, and then it eased into the air. Misha scrambled to her feet, gripping the ship's rail, watching with wonder as the ship rose ten, then twenty feet, then higher. Misha could see the blue glow of Ikala looming beyond. How is this possible? Seren Latal grinned, the wind whipping through her silver hair. Those shamans can't stop the magic of the Krokala. We're going to save the gallows girl. The Krokala flitted all around the ship, shifting the sails, and then the ship's wings caught a gust of wind and they veered sharply. At the center of the ice city, a great burst of blue light shot into the sky, and Misha prayed that they would not be too late. Chapter 19 A face appeared in the blue flames, but it was not who Astoria expected to meet at the moment of her death. It was small and twisted like something from a nightmare. The world was swirling chaos. A roaring cacophony filled her ears. Flashes of blue and golden light swelled around her in madness. Tori thought she had died and been sent to the abyss to atone for all the suffering she had brought upon the world. She had heard tales of the wretched souls who lived in darkness, pleading desperately for aid from anything that crossed their path. The horrid cries grew louder and louder, the shrieks of the undying. A hellish face shot past her, and then Tori felt her hands again. She could move her fingers. They were free, her chains had fallen away. But that was foolishness. Tori was chained to a pole of snow pine. Blue flames engulfed her with the cruel fire of the north. These were hallucinations of her dying mind. Her thoughts began to grow foggy again, and she knew she was near death. She closed her eyes. Pain returned in fury, and the numbness that had overtaken her fraught body vanished. Tori cried out, thinking the flames had reached her face, overtaking her entire being at last. Her eyes shot open. The strange, fearsome face reappeared right before her eyes, glowing in a golden light like the fires of the southern world. Its light seemed to cast away the blue glow of the ice fire. The face belonged to some sort of fiery creature with tiny horns. It hovered in front of her, long nails glistening from its slender fingers like talons. It had stung her face, or perhaps stabbed her, and she had felt the pain. By some miracle, Tori could still feel it, and she emerged from the deathly fog in an instant. 
the creature shot toward her. She cringed. Is this the last stage of my execution? A delusion of the dying? But the thing did not sting her again. It pulled desperately at her cloak, which hung in shreds from her frozen shoulders. And then there were more golden creatures, glowing like the floating lanterns of the triumphal. They tugged on her body, and their tiny hands felt warm on her frigid skin. These things were not attacking her at all. They were trying to help her. Something stirred within Tori's mind, and with the last fragments of strength she possessed, she took a step forward, then another, and another. Tori stumbled free of the blue hell and collapsed in the snow, gazing up at the sky. Glowing specks flickered in the heavens, and there was something more, something out of place. Massive golden sails filled her vision, floating in the sky. But it couldn't be. Alec's face flitted in and out of focus, locking the light, but Tori's mind was fading once more. His face seemed to be glowing and flickering as well. The world was blurs of color and light. Voices called to her from some distant place. The roar had been replaced by soft whispers. The last thing Tori recalled was searing pain crashing over her body in violent waves, but the blue flames were gone and she knew that pain was a sign of glorious life. Tori dreamed of the southern world, of the hot, humid merch houses of the Triumvul, like the one she had labored in as a child. The work had been easier there. The southern merchers were not as harsh as the masters of the northern world. Her labor had been softer, as many other things had been during her years in the Triumph. Tori strolled the streets of El Karen, the floating lanterns hovering over the city during one of the many festivals. Her mum was there, and they strolled together, and they did not have to hide their magic. She dreamed of the beaches of Melanesia as Misha had so often described them during their journey north. Soft sand squished between Tori's toes, and gentle waves lapped at her ankles, and the sisters shone like the eyes of the gods upon her. She felt light and happy. Darian was there, too, walking down the beach, and Tori did not fear him. He turned to her, standing in his human form, smiling, the way he had when they served Solero back in another lifetime. And yet it was not the same smile. It was warm and safe and free, in a way it never could have been in Maro El when they had lived to serve others. He called out to her, and his voice was light and serene. Tori ran to him, and he pulled her into an embrace, and they both cried, but they were happy tears. We made it, Darian whispered. We survived. Tori didn't speak. She just held him, grateful he was alive, grateful they were together and free. The southern world was beautiful. Insects chirped from gigantic leafy trees. Colorful birds soared across the sky in the moonlight. Everything was so full of life but it did not last. Tori swam out of the dream world and awoke in a blue light that pierced the beauty and filled her with fear. She sat up with a start, terrified that she was still in the fire, that her escape had been a delusion. She found herself not in a world of flames, but rather in a bed of soft white furs in a room beneath the ice, illuminated by the light of ice fire crystals set inside a lantern so it filled the room with a soft glow. Her sudden movement sent waves of pain crashing up her spine. I'm alive, she thought, never more grateful to feel pain. Judging by the number of bandages that had been wrapped around her body, she was just barely alive. Her skin felt like it was boiling. She was about to examine what was hidden beneath the linen wraps when a voice interrupted her. Alex says you can't touch those. It was Tesla. The crooked girl was smiling at her. She stood up from a chair made of what Tori guessed was whalebone. The room was carved out of obsidian stone, so smooth it reflected the light in shimmers. I can't believe you're alive, Tess said. The young watcher touched her hand, and Tori squeezed it, grateful to be able to perform such a simple task. Me too, Tess. Guess you showed them, didn't you? Showed them what? Her voice croaked. 
Her throat felt dry and grainy. That you can't kill a god. Tori smiled. It hurt to smile, like her skin was stretched too tight over her jaw. She felt nothing like a god, but she did not argue with the girl. Tess fetched her some water, and Tori drank it greedily. What happened, Tess? How did I survive? The memory was hazy and made no sense. It must have been part of her death visions. Tess was beaming. The gods saved you. The gods? Fairies, actually. It was Misha. Her friend rushed to the side of the bed and sat, clasping her hand tenderly. Tori recalled the ugly face in the flames. Fairies? But they were so hideous. Misha laughed. Better not tell them that. They're Krokala, demon fairies, but they seem a bit self-conscious about their looks, if you ask me. They're still here? They're in with the witch queen, said Tesla ecstatically. What? Tori's head was beginning to hurt. Misha nodded. It's true. The fairies served the witch queen of the Southern Isles. She came north to see you. And not a minute too soon, either. Alec entered the room, accompanied by his sister, Skaya. Her presence was met with no animosity from Misha or Alec, which confused Tori. How did I survive? said Tori. I mean, I'm healing, aren't I? Alec nodded. When you stepped from the pyre, it was seen as a sign from the gods. According to the laws of fire and ice, if the gods intervene in an execution, it means the defendant was innocent in their eyes. I commanded the shamans to withdraw the barrier from your magic, and your body began to heal. Alec carefully unraveled one of the wraps around Tori's arms, revealing swollen red skin that was moist and oozed a yellowish liquid. The unwrapping felt like it might peel all her skin away as Alec unraveled past her wrist. Tori felt sick at the sight. The very air stung her arm. Her head ached. Her whole body ached, for that matter. Skaya handed her brother a jar, and he lathered a salve on the skin. Our medicines helped as well. You were barely recognizable when we brought you here, but your wounds are nearly recovered. Tori did not feel like it. She shuddered at the thought that her entire body looked like her arm. Where are we? Beneath the ice city, said Skaya. My bedroom, as a matter of fact. Yours? Tori thought Skaya was the enemy. After all my madru put you through, I thought it was the least I could do. I'm sorry about our first meeting, but I hope you understand I had to put up a good act to fool her. Alec gripped his sister's shoulder. She sent word to the witch queen. If not for Skaya, my madru would have succeeded in her mummer's trial. Where is she? Tori demanded. Don't worry, Tori, said Alec. The elders must heed the will of the gods like all others. You are safe now. You have been for three days. I slept that long? Tori was overwhelmed. Her head hurt and she lay back down. The act stung her all over, but she was relieved to be here amongst friends, alive. You should rest, Alec said. We'll talk more when... But Tori was already fading into the dream world again. Tori did not wake again for two more days. Alec was dressing her wounds, and she woke to sharp stings in her legs. A young Aleut girl spread the salve while Alec wrapped the linens gently around her knee, all the way to her ankles on both legs. Once wrapped, though, the pain eased. Minus the wraps, Tori wore only a cotton shift. I don't see you blushing now at seeing me undressed, Tori managed. Her lips stung and her voice cracked. It felt like years since Alec had come to see her before the trial, before his mother rigged the entire charade. Alec smiled but did not speak until he was finished. He handed the young shaman the remaining linen wraps. Thank you, Bella. The girl nodded and left the room, taking the old bandages with her. I'm sorry, Tori, Alec said. Perhaps I should have had another dress your wounds. I had Bella apply the... No, said Tori, a slight smile rising at Alec's modesty. I'm glad it was you. How does it feel to have seen the gallows girl without any of her mysteries? 
Now Alec did blush. Believe me, there are still plenty of uh, mysteries. Tori chuckled, then tried to stop herself because it hurt. She squeezed his hand, which hurt less. I'm teasing. I know. Anyway, it was not exactly the first time. For Bella or me, your clothes were nearly burned off in the pyre. The uh, whole city saw you. I'll bet that was a sight. Alec frowned. It was horrible, Tori. I am so sorry this happened. I should have seen through my Madru's schemes. Tori didn't want to think of it. She changed the subject. I didn't realize you were a healer as well as a shaman. They are one and the same in the north. How are my wounds? Tori grimaced as she tried to raise herself to a seated position. It hurt, but it was not agony. Alec helped her, propping a pillow behind her back. Your legs took the worst of it. Your face is healed, and your upper body is getting close. We removed the bandages yesterday, though the skin may be tender for a few days. But your body recovers incredibly fast, much quicker than I ever might have guessed. I've never seen anything like it. You should be dead, Tori, many times over. That wasn't my doing. Is it true about the Witch Queen? Did she really save me? Or was that only part of my fever dreams? Not a dream. Seren Natal has been waiting for you to recover. What is she doing here at all? I'll let her answer that. Bella returned with a tray of flatbread and strange purple fruits shaped like tiny hearts. Tori tried one. The texture was strangely pasty, but it was sweet. I've never had these before. Are they from the Trium? Alec shook his head. Gem stars, the only fruit that grows in the north. We harvest them from the world below. They grow only where ice fire abounds. Tori was amazed at how much life was able to survive in the great white north. It was as though, just like the Aleut people, nature had managed to adapt to whatever surroundings it found itself in. Still, she doubted she would ever behold that strange blue crystal with positive feelings. Though it seemed to be the source of most life in the north, including the Aleut, the very light in the room made her feel uneasy. Tesla poked her head through the door. Alec, the queen is here. Let her in. Tess smiled at Tori before she hurried off to fetch the witch queen. Seren Latal walked with a regal gait, but Tori could tell it did not come naturally to her. It was practiced formality. It reminded her of the way she held herself when she was attempting to appear more proper than she was back almost too straight to compensate for years of labor. True nobles moved more fluidly. The queen took a seat in a chair by the bedside, and her shoulders relaxed. A golden blur hovered near her shoulder, and then alighted upon the armrest. Tori recognized the face from the pyre. Tori gestured to the grotesque fairy. You pulled me from the fire. The Krokala's features seemed to be hardened in a permanent scowl, but it nodded to her. The queen giggled. She was captivating without doubt. Her porcelain face shimmered in the blue light, and her silver hair was smooth as silk. Her sapphire gown hugged her body. She wore long dark sleeves that left only her palms bare. She looked Tori up and down, then shook her head. Incredible! You have not disappointed, Kaluska. Thank you, milady. Seren, please. You are not one of my subjects, and if your rapid recovery is any indication, we are equals, you and I. I owe you my life, said Tori. A life I was eager to save. Why? Seren Natal leaned forward in her seat, a sparkle flashing in her eyes. Well, if we believe your shaman boyfriend here. Alec blushed. Oh, er, we're not. Tori enjoyed watching him stumble over his words. The queen giggled again, almost childishly, and Tori wondered how old she was. Seren Latal waved her hand dismissively. Well, whatever he is, Alex seems to think our fates are entwined. I don't believe much in fate. I've seen too much hardship in my homeland. But Alec may convince me yet. I have been searching for you since the day you escaped the White Citadel but my spies lost track of you when the watchtower fell. Valyria, said Tori, 
remembering how the southern islander had whispered words of hope shortly before she and Misha escaped. She was one of mine, yes, though I have not heard from her since, which is more worrisome than you might think. Why? Tori asked. She helped us escape the Chancellor. I'm sure she wouldn't. She ought to have come with you. Instead, she returned to the White Citadel and helped lead the defense of Maro El against the Rulaks, alongside the Gallows Boy. I fear her loyalties waver, but I won't burden you with my troubles. But they weren't Saran's alone. If Valyria's loyalties wavered, what might that mean for Darien? She had seen the way he looked to her. Saran went on. At any rate, I've hoped this day would come for some time. I've had my own battles to fight with the return of the sea dragons in the isles, and I had lost hope of ever finding you. After communication ended from Valyria, then I received a raven from Skaya Dulbaruk, and here I am. But why have you been looking for me? Osha has been gaining power in the world. With the fall of Morgoth and the alliance with the Yanavi, the Chancellor is nearly uncontested in the Western world. And now, with monsters bending to his will, I fear he will soon set his sights on the Isles. While you've been recovering, Alec and I have been conspiring. You came to the North to raise an army, yes? Tori nodded. My fellow watchers are locked in the Citadel. I seek justice for all the Chancellor has done to my kind. Seren smiled. Good, but I am sure you know that a few spears, and even bear riders, will be little match for Osha's forces. My people have been free for less than a century, and that time has been turbulent. We have warred with each other as much as the oceans or the fairish. We are not a unified nation, just rivaling island kingdoms whose allegiance moves with the wind. But that is changing. Under my rule, most of the isles sail under one banner for the first time in centuries, and with the right show of strength, that alliance may last centuries. Show of strength, said Tori. That's where I come in? Where we all come in, said Alec. I want to wage war against Osha, said Seren Latal. Unite my people against a common enemy while the time is ripe. Bring the Chancellor to his knees. And I want the peoples of the North to join us, with you leading them alongside me. Tori shook her head with frustration. In case you didn't notice, the Aleut very recently tried to execute me. Alex squeezed her hand. Your return from death has swayed them. The elders have declared you innocent before the gods. And with Skya's support, the bear riders would follow you into battle. I know that my people have done a terrible wrong. They tried to kill me. I, I know. And I know that we do not deserve your aid, Tori. But they will follow you. Your last words in the flames were, do not forget your restoration. And with your miraculous survival, they are ready to believe you. They are ready to seize their restoration. They are ready to follow you into battle. And besides, it is the best chance your friends in the Citadel may have. Tori breathed for a moment, trying to take in all the information. She could not even get out of bed yet, and she was supposed to lead an army into war. But she knew Alec was right. Even from the flames, Tori had not cursed the Aleut. Their actions were stirred by the injustices reigned upon them by the Chancellor. She thought of Wren and the other Watchers. More than ever, she wanted to see Cyrus Morrow dead. Finally, she spoke. She looked from the Witch Queen to Alec de Baruch. I will lead the Aleut against the White Citadel alongside you. Then it is to war, said Seren Latal solemnly. The words filled Tori with an unquenchable flame. This was what she and Misha had wanted since they'd escaped from the Chancellor's clutches in the catacombs. Now they had an army. To war! Part 6. The Forbidden Symbol There were legends in the old world of beings more ancient and mysterious than the Watchers. Some claimed they were as old as the world itself. Some claimed they were the last of a failed generation gifted with powers beyond all else in existence, powers they could not handle, even the power to overcome death. If not gods, what else would you call them? 
from New Histories of the Old World. Chapter 20 It was late evening when the company of Yanavi entered the ocean city of Pendra, yet the festivities showed no sign of waning. The main thoroughfares of the trade city thrummed with the beating of drums and the chanting of old victory ballads. Kale recognized the rollicking verse of The Great Bear of Galahan, the rousing cadence of The Ride of the Raven King, and the bawdy chorus of The Milkmaid in the Hay, as Ashi led them through the city in search of a tavern. They had ridden hard for two weeks from Vliani, and finally they reached the edge of Greater Osha. Kale had been dreading the return to his old homeland and all that lay in store for him there. They were heading to Morrow El, where Ren and all the other watchers he had betrayed were in captivity. Except, of course, for the ones who had joined the Chancellor's Skyguard. And Kira, for reasons Kale could not quite ascertain, wanted to join them. Is Kira truly willing to do this in exchange for her sight? Kale had often wondered during their journey. Or is there an ulterior motive? If so, what? He could not figure it out, but it felt like some sort of cosmic justice that Kale should have to face his brother, and in doing so, he would be betraying him again by joining the Sky Guard. Why in the abyss would Kira want to go to Morrow El? But Kale knew he had lost all right to question Kira's motives, and she had thus far shown no desire to share her plans with him. He had asked once, and she had swiftly changed the subject, and Kale knew she still did not trust him. All his life, Kale had made a habit of running from his problems. It was why he was called the Exiled Lord. But Kira was one to be in the middle of everything. It was what had gotten her captured by the Metamorphi, and likely how she had gotten them both caught up in Sala Burodai's schemes in the Red City. It was a trait he simultaneously admired and despised. Ashi checked with half a dozen inns, but they were all full. Kale had never been one to long for beds or roofs, but Ashi had been adamant they rest the steeds a full day before they set north for Morrow El, and the five Ilya men who accompanied them had been more than eager for a warm meal. Women traditionally prepared the food in Yanavi culture, but Ashi was no typical Yanavi woman. She led the expedition and had no intentions of bothering with food preparations, nor the extraneous baggage of bringing a kitchen wench and provisions. They had lived off kayla jerky and dried dates for the past two weeks. Even so, with the chaotic frivolities surrounding them, Kale detested their choice to stay in the city more than ever. It would seem your legions did not lose their war against the beasts of the old world. Ashi muttered sardonically as they passed through the city center. Here the crowd and mayhem were even thicker. The place pulsed with energy. My legions, Kale almost said, but held back. Ashi knew little of Osha, but she knew enough to know Kale bore no love for the Empire. She was only antagonizing him, a habit that strangely endeared her to him. Kira was speaking to him on occasion, but she remained cool and distant. She had spent much of the ride brooding silently, and so Kale endured Ashi's jibes without complaint. Laughter and cheers collided into a joyous cacophony all around. The very air Kale breathed seemed to be alive with celebration. Dancers twirled through the cobbled thoroughfares, troubadours belted their tunes, and nightlings hung on the arms of nobles who watched the festivities in the city center from their balconies. But the nobles were not alone in their sultry indulgences. A trio of street wenches rushed their small company. Two latched onto a pair of Yanavi men, and the third wrapped her slender fingers around Kale's arm. Ashi was guiding Kira's steps through the crowd, and Kale thought he felt a twinge in Kira's mind, but it was hard to discern amidst the hive of minds that swarmed around him. Ah, a party from the rolling hills, the wench on Kale's arm cooed. Had a long journey, have ye? Only a copper for a warm bed and all the frills. She stroked his arm. Kale nearly choked on the young girl's cheap perfume. Her skimpy blue gown left little to the imagination. Her eyes were caked with dark cosmetics and her skin was caked in oil. 
Or is it sweat? Gods? Kale's stomach lurched at the thought, but she pressed closer to him. He tried to shake free of her grasp and move on, but the wench held fast. No need for your beds tonight, Kale said, pressing through the crowd. But she followed along gleefully. Come now, rest your weary legs a while. I don't mind doing all the work. She giggled, and her warm cleavage pressed against his chest. Her breath tasted of cheap ale and hessa, a pipe tobacco from the triumvil. Her hand gripped his traveling cloak and pulled him even closer. Kira stepped in suddenly, and despite her blindness, rested the wench's hands free of his arm. Keep your hands away from my husband, wench, if you know what's good for you. Husband, Kale thought. Of course, he knew it was simply the quickest way to be rid of the wench so their company might find rest. You can join too if you like, the wench chortled. Don't mean to leave no one out. It's a day of celebration, don't you know? She flung her arms out extravagantly. The battle of gods and monsters is won, and the empire remains stronger than ever. Aha! Ah, she tossed the wench a copper coin, taking hold of Kira's arm to steady her. Off with you. There's plenty of other patrons for your ilk in these streets. The wench caught the coin and left with a glint in her eyes, though her gaze lingered on Kale longer than he liked as she disappeared into the crowd. Ashi drove off the other wenches in a similar manner, to the apparent dismay of Olivar Raji, one of the Ilya, who grumbled about the overwhelming ratio of men on their expedition. Ashi looked like she wanted to slap him, but she held back and pressed on. Kira said nothing else, but she held onto Kale's arm for guidance the rest of the way to the tavern, an act that forced Kale to fight a bemused smile. They were accosted by no more street wenches, and they soon arrived at their final destination, the Raging Boar. The inn, too, was filled with raucous festivities. Kale, Kira, Ashi, and the five Ilya all squeezed around a small table in the corner of the room. The innkeeper came by after some time. A portly, fairish woman, with graying dark hair and dark eyes, she glanced at their company with amusement. It's been a time since I saw an ocean, a jackin, and I heard a yanavi in the same company. But if today be any proof, the gods are yet performing miracles. What'll it be? She glanced around as though trying to determine who their leader was. Her eyes widened when Ashi spoke. Dinner and rooms, if you have any said Ashi. Aye, we've got a room or two to spare. The innkeeper eyed Ashi with suspicion. If you have coin. Ashi huffed and produced a satchel from her cloak. It jingled to the innkeeper's satisfaction. What's for dinner? asked an Ilya named Kesh. The innkeeper guffawed. Boar, of course. The girls will be out in a minute. The woman bustled away, close to hysterics. The boar was cooked to a crisp and was nearly as tough as jerky, but it was warm and fresh, and no one in the company complained. The ale was better, though a little sour, but it relaxed Kale's senses after the second mug. He was able to tune out the ringing of minds in his cerebro sense and listen in on conversations. The Battle of Gods and Monsters, as the attack of the Rulocks on Maroel had come to be called, had been a near slaughter. From what Kale overheard, the legions and the Sky Guard had fought valiantly, but still the beasts raised much of the city to the ground, killing thousands. It was the final moments of the battle that particularly caught Kale's attention. He kept catching bits and pieces, but it didn't quite make sense. Everyone was praising some darkling witch. Kale caught the arm of a serving girl as she came to replenish their drinks. We've been traveling for some time and have not heard all the details of the cause of this celebration. How exactly was the battle won? The serving girl's hazel eyes went wide. You entered? A bloody miracle it was. The darkling witch stopped the old horde of beasts at the base of the white citadel. Who's this darkling witch? said Kale, a fearful realization teasing his mind. No one knows exactly. She's been close in the Chancellor's company for months now, they say one of the sorcerers from his sky guard. Some say she's the one who turned him from the ancient ways of the chancellors. Her name is Medea Lozar. 
The Darkling Witch saved the whole bloody city, the whole empire, more like. At Medea's name, Kale's stomach nodded, his suspicions confirmed. How exactly did she save the city? She calmed the bloody beasts, said the girl, with evident reverence. Spoke to them inside their minds, they say. The Rulocks quit their onslaught and bowed before the citadel. They say the beasts do her bidding now. The girl shook her head. Can't believe you endured. She ran off to tend to other patrons. Kale turned to Kira and Ashi. They shook their heads. Medea, said Kale, shuddering as he recalled his last encounter with the Darkling Witch when she invaded his mind and uncovered the location of the watchtower. The thought made his fists clench. She subdued a whole herd of Rulaks, said Ashi in disbelief. What does that mean? She did not sound as pleased as she ought to have been, considering the Yanavi were the Chancellor's allies. Kira shook her head, her blind eyes closed. Medea's name brought back memories for her as well. Memories of Kale's betrayal. He resisted the temptation to sense her true feelings about those memories. It means, said Kira slowly, if there was any doubt about the Chancellor's might in the new world among the lowborns, it's gone now. Any thoughts of rebellion in the name of the gallows girl have vanished. Ashi grimaced. Look at these people, Farish, Mugathians, Oceans, are celebrating the Chancellor as some savior. A bard struck up a new song about the victory called The Chancellor and His Darkling Witch and the tavern soon rollicked with a chorus celebrating the return of magic to the Empire. Looks like we've made the right choice in joining them, Kira muttered. Kale did not know what to say. He soon excused himself and left the inn for some fresh air to clear his mind. The air was far from fresh in Pendra that night, filled with tobacco smoke and the mixed aromas of roast meat, spilled ale and cheap perfume. Kale wandered the streets alone, he left the main thoroughfares and soon found himself in narrow side streets that were, to his relief, relatively quiet. What in the abyss are we doing? he wondered. The Chancellor was growing more powerful than ever, and he and Kira were heading into the heart of it all. And if Kira truly wanted to join the Chancellor... A cold breeze gusted through the streets, and Kale pulled his cloak close to his chest. He thrust his hands in his pockets and his fingers brushed against a strange bit of parchment that he hadn't put there. Where did it come from? he thought, pulling it from his cloak. A chill rushed through him as he unraveled the paper. Scrawled upon it, in black ink, was the image of a gallows with a broken beam. The infamous sign of the gallows saint. Written upon the faded parchment, below the symbol, were three words. The viper's lair. Kale's heart thundered in his chest as he pulled the hood of his cloak tight, swiftly crumpled the damning piece of parchment, and kept moving. Pendra was the inland trading center of Greater Osha, a bridge between the east and west of the New World. Traders came all the way from Jerka and the Triumvel to deal their spices, dyes, stallions, and slaves. The main thoroughfares were wide and straight and contained many open market squares but beyond the city center, the place was a wending disarray of progressively dingier lanes and more decrepit buildings. The ocean lords and upstanding merchants kept their estates near the center of commerce. Kale wandered into a notably poorer district. The masonry was ancient and crumbling, and the streets composed of nothing but dirt. How had the symbol wound up in Kale's pocket? And why would someone deliver it to him, specifically? It made little sense. He was but a traveler in a company of Yanavi traders to the eyes of anyone in Pendra. The crowd was thick, he thought. It might have been anyone, but... He recalled the wench's hands at his cloak, the way her gaze had lingered with him even after she had disappeared into the celebratory masses. He had thought the wench was simply trying to seduce him, maybe even pick his pockets, which contained no money anyway. Kale might have spent the past couple months largely in the underworld of the Red City, but he knew what that gallows symbolized. The low-born resistance against the Chancellor was perhaps not as dead as Kira suspected. 
but with Cyrus Morrow's revelation of his sky guard and Medea's miraculous demonstration of power in the battle of gods and monsters, Kale doubted what hold the so-called saints might find. But it seemed that some of them remained in Pendra, and they were trying to contact him. But why? At his first opportunity, Kale cast the parchment into a small rubbish fire at the corner of a hard-panned street. He was near the outskirts of the city, a desolate district clearly populated by lowborns. A small group of shabbily clad men and women were gathered around the fire, warming their hands, and Kale joined them briefly, so as not to seem too eager to be on his way. Lowborns rarely had a reason to hurry anywhere in such places. His cloak was dusty and weathered from two weeks on the steppe, and his face was masked by even more weeks' worth of beard. Despite his ocean features, he could easily pass for an unassuming servant. The lowborns around the fire passed around a pipe of Hesse and chatted about the strange times, though their fascination with the Chancellor's darkling witch seemed more subdued than that of the crowds in the city center. He reached out for more with his senses, but found nothing of substance. No unspoken animosity or thoughts of revolution. They seemed amazed, if dubiously, at the tidings, but nothing more. No resistance could possibly be gaining followers, Kale thought. I should ignore it. Besides, I owe it to Kira to help her regain her sight. Still, the wench lingered in his mind. Was the parchment from her? And why was he so curious to find out? He did not want to join any resistance. If anything, he wanted to flee the Western world altogether. Who ye serve? A man with a graying beard asked Kale. He passed him the pipe, and Kale drew in a long breath. It was laced with something that gave it a slight tangy flavor. Smoke filled his lungs, he exhaled, and a warm relief followed. He took another pull, then passed it on. House Barra, said Kale without hesitation. Ain't seen you here before, said a woman, missing two front teeth. Serve me lord's merchers, said Kale, donning a lowborn flair to his speech. Used to tend a warehouse in Barra El, first time in Pendra. Me master is joining the festivities with all the lordlings, so I came out to see the city. Your master, said the woman, he don't serve Barra himself. Her tone conveyed the answer she sought. To serve a lord directly would be cause for mistrust, even if he was lowborn. Far from it, said Kale. Me master is but a low mercher. Small goods, sealskins mostly. Triumphal glove sealskins. Kale could have sworn the firefolk were eyeing him suspiciously, but he told himself it was his own paranoia. Well, ye found about the worst part of the city to visit, said the bearded man with a laugh. Aye, chorused another. Kale shared a laugh and a thin smile. I've served me master in the fringes. This place is a lordling's estate compared with the best of that hello. The lowborns seemed to appreciate the compliment. They passed him the pipe again. Is it true? asked the toothless woman. What they're saying about them rulocks? Kale nodded. Ain't seen em myself, but heard as much to believe it's true. Gods, said the bearded man, Rulocks. Never would have believed it in my lifetime. And that witch, said a hunchback man, she bloody combed em. Kale swiftly changed the subject. Say, I'm looking for a place called the Viper's Lair. You heard of it? The bearded man guffawed. Aye, I heard of it. Looking for a bit of fun, are ye? His eyes narrowed. The Viper's Lair is a night house near the city centre. Modest place, but I reckon the price is o'er your coin purse if ye serve but a low mercher. Ah, likely true. Story of my life. Kale made to leave before the interrogation grew antagonistic. A night house, thought Kale with strange satisfaction. So it was that wench. Hey, said the woman as he backed away from the fire. Why ye looking for the viper's lair if you don't even know what it is? There's plenty of night houses you might have landed in. Kale hesitated for a moment. His pulse quickened. Ah, I heard a mercher mention it, just in passing. Said the viper's lair was the best part of Pendra. The woman shrugged 
apparently satisfied, but the lowborns eyed him warily as he turned away. When he had turned the corner, he sprinted down the next street. He left the lowborn district as quickly as he could, glancing often over his shoulder to be sure no one was following him. He made a direct path for the city center of Pendra. He knew it was folly, but he felt an uncanny need to find out why the parchment had been given to him. This want made him fearfully excited. Chapter 21 Kale had only ever been to one night house in his life. His uncle took him to one of the finest in Morrow El when he was barely fourteen. It was his cousin's birthday, and Kale's uncle thought it best they both earn their manhood for the first time to commemorate the occasion. The establishment, called the Scarlet Lace, had been illuminated by red-tinted lanterns, and thin scarlet draperies lined the entrances to bedrooms where the exotic nightlings took their lordlings after seducing them over fine wine and conversation. Kale's cousin, Tylan, had reveled in the evening and bragged about his conquests for weeks afterward, but Kale had been relieved when the entire ordeal was over. It was not until he met Kira that he fully realized why the place had not brought him the same satisfaction it did other lordlings. As a young girl, Kira was one of the Halcya of Jerka, slaves forced to attend their masters in whatever way suited them, much like Ashi had in the Red Palace. When Kale had first fallen for Kira on the Isle of Jala, she had been slow to warm up to the idea of romance. All her understanding of intimacy had been in the context of slavery. The thought that others had used her in such a way against her will enraged Kale, and he understood why the practice had not appealed to him in his youth. Though the nightlings appeared as though they reveled in their profession, Kale knew it was all a facade. At best, the nightlings were a product of their environment, forced to take the job for lack of better opportunity. And at worst, they were slaves forced to do their master's bidding no matter how shameful. The Viper's Lair was a modest tavern by any standard, and Kale doubted such a place would find any business from the lordlings of Morrow El. This was a house for soldiers and traders. Within, the main room looked much like any other inn. The tables were poorly crafted and packed with patrons. A bard strummed his lyre in the corner, and serving girls bustled about. These serving girls donned far more risque attire than the servants of the raging boar, and there were other girls bustling about, girls with oiled skin and dark cosmetics and slitted gowns revealing long, smooth legs that teased at what was hidden beyond their silken shields. There were no curtained doorways, as in Morrow L, but Kale made note when a sun-specked Morgothian girl led a staggering member of the city watch up the staircase to a line of closed doors above the balcony. Kale did not see the wench anywhere. He took a seat at a long table, ordered an ale, and waited, wondering if all of this was a grave mistake. The bard struck up the Chancellor and his darkling witch, and the patrons sang along. The song was growing popular, it seemed, though this bard spun new verses of his own. Nightlings sat on the laps of guards and common merchers, male and female alike, swaying to the music. But still, no sign of the street wench. How had anyone known he was coming to Pendra? How could they know he was associated with the gallows girl? Was there a watcher in this city? Another cerebro? He jumped when the wench from the street brushed his shoulder. Rest easy, traveler, she cooed sweetly. It's only me. Kale spun swiftly, then calmed himself. The wench took an immediate seat on his lap. He felt awkward with her bosoms in his face and her perfume stifling his breath. He thought guiltily of Kira, though he wasn't entirely sure why anymore. What do you... The wench touched his lips gently with her fingers and shushed him. He flinched, but she smiled. I said, rest easy. She leaned in close, her lips brushing his ear as she whispered. No patron runs upstairs right away. The nightling arts are slow and seductive. She giggled. Kale realized her low-born accent from the street was now lost. She spoke well for a street wench. Play along, Kale. I'm Nyla, and never fear, 
You'll have your answers. How does she know my name? Kale's nerves were on fire, but he obeyed. He placed his hands at the wench's hips, as he'd noted the other patrons doing. Nyla sipped from his flagon of ale and leaned into his chest, bantering seductively. Are you weary? she said, louder now, her lowborn accent returning. Uh, uh, yes, Kale said. It's been a long ride indeed. Where do you hail from, handsome? Kale tried to recall his tale from the rubbish fire. It was best he did not draw attention to his party of Yanavi. A merchant company from Bara El. Ah, she said, a coastling. And what brings ye to the viper's lair, little mercher? She poked his chest and arched her back, and Kale felt even more uncomfortable. I've heard tales of the exotic nightlings of Pendra, and I knew I must see them with my own eyes. He tried to sound as though he was attempting to woo her. Kale wanted to leave this place as soon as possible, but he needed to know why this wench had given him the message. And the more he played into the role, the quicker she would take him to one of the upstairs rooms. Nyla draped her arm around his shoulder, leaned back, and laughed. The loveliest nightlings in the Empire are here at the lair, but I'm afraid I'm not one of them. A proper dirty girl from the streets I am. The wench howled with sensuous laughter, and a nearby patron caught Kale's eye. He caught a good one, then, the greasy man bellowed. Kale managed an awkward smile in return. Nyla shrugged flirtatiously, then downed the remainder of his ale and slid from his lap, holding onto his hand. Come, little coastling, let me show you the true reason the nightlings of Pendra are renowned across the land. Kale followed. Nyla's entire gait was a practiced seduction. Her hips swayed with each step. Her fingers traced over his hands as she led him up to the door at the end of the long line of rooms along the balcony. She closed the door slowly. Nyla leapt upon the bed and sat, crossing her legs beneath her, leaving Kale standing in the middle of the room. The space was sparsely decorated, and the bed was dressed with plain linens. Kale supposed the matron of the house did not see the need to splurge on needless niceties. No one stays long in these rooms. Nyla giggled. It came so easily. Kale wondered if this was the woman's real laughter. There was no one to perform for any longer. You're a terrible actor, you know, Nyla said, her proper speech returning. A coastling? Gods, please, your voice has no lilt. Kale scowled. He had known plenty of coastal lords during his youth in Maro El. What do you know of the coast? Have you ever been? Nyla raised her eyebrows and leaned forward, a grin teasing her lips. It struck Kale how young she seemed up close. She was barely a woman grown. I am close with folk from all over the New World. They whisper all night in my ears. Coastlings speak lightly, Kale, like the ebb and flow of the waves. The wench was well-spoken, indeed. Strange for a nightling. How did you find me? Do I know you? Kale had been trying to figure out how she knew his name, but he couldn't place it. Nyla laughed. I think not. I never forget a face. Why did you give me the sign of the gallows? Shh! Not so loud, Kale. She glanced at the door cautiously. How do you know me? He demanded. She lowered her voice. We share a mutual friend who asked me to find you when you arrived in the city. His thoughts went straight to the Chancellor. All this was a trap. Kale's senses flared. His nails dug into his palms. He nearly ran straight from the room, but he had to know for certain. Nyla leaned forward, resting her chin on her hands in a childish fashion. She blinked. Even her blinks had a calming, seductive nature. Her long lashes drew in his gaze. Who asked you to find me? Kale said at last. Lazarus Delai. Kale took a sharp breath. His fists clenched. What? It couldn't be possible. Lazarus was dead. He had died on the Isle of Jala, along with all the other watchers. Kale had seen their leader's body. The man who had recruited him and Kira and all the others. He had held Lazarus's wrist and checked for a pulse after the morphs attacked their small community. 
That's impossible. Kale slumped back against the door, feeling uneasy. Nyla jumped up and helped him over to the bed to sit. So you saw him die then? Nyla spoke the words so nonchalantly. Kale nodded. It made no sense. Dead was dead. There could be no coming back from that, could there? How do you know him? How is he alive? What does he want from me? Shh. Rest easy, traveler. Nyla smiled, reverence evident in her voice when she spoke. Lazarus is the one who showed me my gifts, just as he showed you yours. Your gifts? said Kale. Nyla pointed to her head. A cerebro, said Kale. She nodded. That's how I convinced you to come here. I marked you the moment I felt your mind in the city center. Marked me? Of course, why else would he have come here so foolishly? It was not his nature to be so curious. I, I didn't even feel your effect on my mind. The thought was incredibly unnerving. Nyla smiled and brushed his cheek. Your old master trained me well. Why the gallows? Please, Nyla cooed. Haven't you figured it out by now? Lazarus Delai is the one organizing these low-born uprisings. Your old master is the leader of the Saints of the North. Kale felt queasy again. What does he want with me? Why do you think, Kale? Nyla said, drawing nearer. He wants you to join him. Chapter 22 Kale pulled up the hood of his cloak shielding his face, and left the night house unsure what to do or what to believe. His mind told him it was impossible that his old master was still alive, but his instinct told him there was no way Nyla could have lied. She had not tried to guard her mind from him, and he had sensed the sincerity of what she'd said. Was it possible that his old master had incited the uprisings of the past year, ever since the day of the gallows? Uprisings which had all but ceased since the attack of the Rulaks. The Lowborn's hope in the Gallows Girl was waning. After all, she had not saved them from an attack by Old World monsters. The Chancellor had. Which was why Lazarus Delai needed Kale's help when he arrived in Morrow L. It was all too much to take in. Kale longed to talk with Kira, but he did not even know if he could trust her. And if Ashi knew of it, then who knew what she would do? They had promised to look after Vashti, and joining a rebellion against the Chancellor was exactly the opposite of that. Furthermore, Kale did not know what he wanted. He felt helpless, as though the gods had deigned to forever place him in no man's land, torn between two impossible destinies. He had made some terrible mistakes, and those mistakes had come at great cost. He longed to right what he had wronged in the world. He had not realized just how much until they set out for Morrow L. The closer they got, the more he feared Kira had made a terrible choice. But what was the greater good? Was there any good in the world, or only lesser evils? Kale cursed and darted through the streets of Pendra. The festivities were finally dying down. It was the depths of the night, and the lanes were clear save for the occasional drunkard. The central room of the raging boar contained a few tables of patrons, and a bard strummed a drunken ballad in the corner, but otherwise the place had quieted down considerably since he left. Gods, how long was I gone? he wondered. He hadn't thought of the others, nor the effect of his sudden departure. He had left in a fit of irritation, and the others had surely missed him by now. After getting directions from the innkeeper, he hurried to their room. Kira and Ashi were standing outside the door, and he tensed. He could sense their anger, even without delving into their minds. Where have you been? Ashi hissed as he neared. I sent Oliver looking for you two hours ago. I thought you were just stepping outside. What could he say? He shrugged. Went for a walk. What does it matter? The city is in celebration. Kira spoke with an even tone. We were followed through the city today, Kale. Kale's stomach twisted. Did she know about the wench? Someone knows we are here and they are keeping tabs on us, said Ashi. Who? The Chancellor? said Kale. What reason would he have to track us? We're coming to join his Skyguard. 
unless the Chancellor suspected something. Perhaps Cyrus Morrow had been tracking Nyla or another of the saints. Perhaps this was all another of his schemes. Perhaps Kale had been wrong about Nyla. I don't know who it was, said Ashi, but I don't want you disappearing like that again. You swore an oath to Sala to remain with us and to protect Vashti. Why did you run off? Kale was about to lie, but Kira cut him off. I know why. Her tone was cold. Your cloak reeks of cheap perfume. You were at the night house. Kale gulped, but he could not deny it. Nor could he explain himself. Not in front of Ashi. I, I... At the mention of a night house, Ashi glared at him. You can't be serious. Kale did not know what to say. Kira's voice was like ice. Well, we can only hope your pleasures did not put us all in mortal danger. She did not say another word, but her grimace told all for Kale. She'll never forgive me, he thought. Kira's movements were slow and calculated. She retreated to the room, carefully closing the door behind her, leaving Kale alone with Ashi. The Ilya woman shook her head. I've got to hand it to you, Skyblood. You're the biggest horse's ass I've ever met. A nighthouse? Really? Kale glared at her. Enough. You didn't draw attention to yourself, I hope. Kale shook his head. I gave an alias everywhere I went in the city. Then you knew we were followed as well? I sensed them, but I could not tell who they were or what they wanted. Kale hoped his lie was convincing. He had not suspected Nyla until he discovered the gallows symbol, and he had sensed no one else. Ashi eyed him for a moment, then gestured at the door. We are all sharing one room. It's all they had available. I took the first watch. I think you may as well take the next until Kira is asleep. Ashi left him, and Kale stood in the hall, leaning back against the doorframe. Within, he could hear whispers, but Kira's mind was more walled off to him than ever. Kale cursed. It was all a stupid misunderstanding. But could he explain to Kira what had really happened? Would she believe him? What did she want from this journey? Kale had trouble believing Kira would join the Sky Guard in order to restore her sight. She was up to something, but he did not know what. One thing was certain. She did not trust him. And he was not sure he was trustworthy. Part 7. Army of the North they were a silent, sleeping threat. The world had all but forgotten about them. But an army in the north could change the world forever. From Dawn of the Third World. Chapter 23 Astoria spent several days recovering from wounds sustained during her execution. She slept for most of it. The rest she spent with Alec, Misha, Tesla, and Jordy. The young crooked boy had given up his cold feelings toward her from the trial. Geordie apologized repeatedly, as had all the others she had come into contact with since the trial. But the memory of their swift turn would not be easily forgotten. She did not fault the people for this. They had believed a lie. Farah Dulbarug had brought about the whole ordeal. Over the past few days, the other elders had visited her, offering their own deepest apologies for their errant judgment. They saw her rise as a sign from the gods. If Tori would have them, they would follow her into war. Faradul Baruch, however, did not show her face in Tori's chambers, and Tori feared she had not seen the last of the High Elder's schemes. The day that Tori's bandages were removed, Seren Latal came to visit her. The fairy, Lirge, hovered above her right shoulder. The creature did not seem to speak much. When Tori had thanked him for saving her life, he merely grunted and said, It was nothing. It was more than she had heard him say to anyone but his queen. Seren Latal had come yesterday to discuss war strategies with Tori, Skaya, and the Aleut elders. Skaya and her Nukvana were already training a large volunteer force of Aleut and Crooked Folk. The Witch Queen sought to act quickly. Combined with the fleets of the Isles, 
they would soon have a force to be reckoned with. Today the queen came only with Lyrge. She wore an obsidian gown that covered her arms to her palms and a collar that reached her chin. The material was thin and shimmered like it was covered in tiny stars. The queen wore no cloaks or furs that Tori had seen, just her long-sleeved gowns. Tori smiled at her arrival. Already she was growing fond of the queen and felt she could relate to her in a way she could with few others. Someone else young who bore great responsibility. Don't you get cold? she asked. Saren the Tall smiled and shook her head. I have not felt cold in some time, nor heat. I'm jealous, the queen shrugged. It is not as wonderful as you might think. The senses are a gift, so we may feel life in all its glory, as well as its misery. You are not always this way? Saren Latal shook her head. Magic comes at a price. I think you know this more than anyone, and that is all I will say on the matter. I do not expect you to reveal the secrets behind your own magic, so I ask that you grant me the same courtesy. My father taught me to keep friends close, but not so close they know the scent of your stench. Tori laughed. Sound advice. My father was an ambitious bastard, the queen smirked, but in that he was not wrong. Tori knew it was wise they keep their secrets. If things did not go well, the Chancellor would not hesitate to exploit them in whatever way he could. He had done just that with Kale in Vliani, and with Vashti and the other turned watchers. Tori feared for Ren and the others, but knew she must move wisely and without emotion. The watchers were not their first priority. After all, infiltrating the White Citadel would not likely happen until late into the invasion if they reached it at all. I am always cautious, but I hope you know that I trust you, Astoria, said Seren Latal, touching her arm kindly. Her hands were neither warm nor cool. And I trust you, said Tori. She leaned forward in her bed, and for once the act did not come with pain. The queen smiled. I am glad, because I am afraid I must ask you to trust me even more than you already have. What do you mean? I am leaving. We have much to accomplish and little time to do so. I've already sent ravens to the kings and queens of the isles, calling for a war conclave. But I cannot go alone. If I make claims that watchers and northmen are going to war, I must bring emissaries. Tori knew where this was going. I've already spoken to Misha, said Seren. She has agreed to journey with me, along with Garen Dulnarsut, elder of the Ikuvara. Tori hated the idea of losing her friend on the eve of war. Misha had become her closest confidant over the past few months, and the thought of moving forward with this war, not to mention being stranded in the north without her, made Tori feel uneasy. If all goes well, in a few weeks we will all be reunited in battle. Tori nodded. I would have no one else go as emissary. Misha is my most trusted ally. I've noticed. I know well the cost of losing dear allies, and so out of good faith I will be leaving one of my own. Lirge is a prince among the Kokala, and a dear friend. He will remain with you until I return. Lirge made no comment, nor showed any expression on the matter. He hovered above his queen's shoulder and merely nodded to Tori. There was a knock. Misha, Alec, and Skaya entered. I leave you to your farewells, said Seren Latal. Misha, we fly in an hour. And with that the queen left them. Lirge darted after her on soft golden wings. Misha hurried over and hugged her. Then, remembering herself, she pulled away. Gods, I'm sorry. Does it still hurt? It's all right. Tori hugged Misha again tightly. Though it stung, she didn't care. I won't be gone long. The Southern Isles, said Tori. I've known nothing but tales. I can't wait to hear about them. I want to know what the floating mountains look like. Aren't those myths? Tori smiled and shook her head. There are many things we found are not myths that I wish were, but islands in the sky are a sight I hope is real. Misha squeezed her hand. 
We're going to save them, Tori. We're going to kill Cyrus Morrow and rescue them all. Tori hoped it was true. She knew it would not be so simple, especially considering Vashti and the others who had joined the Chancellor. She feared that many more of her friends would likely die before all this was done. But she did not voice these fears. Yes, we are. Skaya drew near. Misha, you should get ready. I'll help with your things. There was a twinkle in her eye that Tori did not miss. She had noted the way Misha stole glances at the Aleut warrior over the past few days. Skaya brushed her shoulder, and Misha smiled in a way Tori had never seen before. I'll meet you in the square for the send-off, said Alec. We both will, said Tori. Misha and Skaya left. Alec shook his head. I am not sure that walking is such a good... Tori shifted her legs to the edge of the bed. Just help me, will you? She grabbed onto his shoulder, and he held onto her waist. The pressure was uncomfortable, but she ignored it. You planned this all along, said Alec noting her woolen breeches emerging from beneath the bed of furs. Tori had intended to walk today the minute Bela removed the last of her bandages. She had quickly asked the Aleut girl to help her into real clothes again. She'd felt like a child lying around all day in a cotton shift. It took more energy to stand than Tori expected, but she managed. Each step was slow and deliberate and sent slight tremors up her thighs, but she was relieved she could still move. Alec helped her into layers of wool and a thick fur cloak. Tori gripped Alec's shoulder tightly as he guided her through Skaya's sitting room and out another door, which led to a wide passage carved straight out of the star rock. The ground was warm beneath her feet. They followed the passage to an immense cavern. It was like a giant dome beneath the earth. The ceiling rose well over fifty feet, and people bustled about it like it was a market square in Morrow L. The Underrealm. Most of my people live down here below the surface once winter descends. It is too cold to hunt or do much of anything in the world above, but down here it is warm and livable. It's incredible, Tori marveled at the way the Aleut managed to adapt to the harsh conditions of the North. The more Tori walked, the more her strength increased. The barriers were gone from her magic, and she was healing. Misha and Skaya met them near the end of the thoroughfare beneath the earth. Misha wore clothes of the north that Skaya must have given her after the trial. Misha kept by Skaya's side, and they shared sweet smiles as they crossed the underground dome. It made Tori glad to see her friend happy again. They had been through so much darkness there were times Tori had wondered if they would ever feel happy or safe again. But now Misha was filled with glorious hope, and it helped Tori find that hope as well. Skaya led the way up a narrow staircase carved straight into the rock, and they emerged in one of the immense receiving halls of the Ice Palace. Tesla bombarded them as they entered the streets of Ikala, giving Tori a warm hug and Misha a cold glare. What's wrong? said Misha, patting her shoulder. Benja says you're leaving. The old crooked man was panting as he arrived from chasing after the sprightly girl. Apologies, my saint. I tried to stop her from bothering you. Tori waved her hand dismissively. Tess is never a bother. Is it true? Tess demanded, glaring up at Misha. Misha stooped down to one knee. I'll only be gone a few weeks. Tess crossed her arms. You're supposed to help me train. We've only had two lessons. Misha smiled. There'll be plenty of time for more lessons. Not before the war. Misha brushed the girl's messy hair out of her eyes. Tess, you won't be fighting in this war. I want to fight. Your day will come, Tori said. But for now, Misha is right. You're too young for war but I promise to train you while Misha is away. Tess did not argue, but she stormed away, and Benja, hurrying after, hollering back over his shoulder, Apologies again, my saint! She has every right to want to fight, Tori said. She's a child, Misha said. Tess has seen more than many see in a lifetime. You're not thinking of letting her fight? Tori shook her head. No, but she'll make a fine warrior someday. 
I hope she never sees war, said Misha. I wish I never had. Tori said little else, but she feared that this war was only beginning. They would do well to look to the future, and Tessa's gifts would be an asset for that future. A crowd was gathered in the same square where they had come to watch Tori's execution only days before. But rather than a pyre, an immense ship sat at the center of the crowd. Strange runes glowed along the sides and thick sails of the vessel. Tori had thought the flying ship part of her death dreams, but the sight of it now was even more magnificent than she remembered. The sky ship floated a few feet above the ground, and a long plank stretched up to the deck. Alute men and women hauled crates of supplies, and Seren Latile stood upon the aft deck, watching as they approached. The Witch Queen looked godlike at the glowing helm of the skyship. It struck Tori how coincidental it was that at the same time in history that the Watchers were regaining strength, another form of magic would also rise up in the world. She did not truly believe in fate, but moments such as now made her wonder. Skaya Dulbaruk had sent for her, and if not, Tori would be dead. And Alec had seen visions of them both. What was she to make of that? The last of the supply crates were boarded, and Seren Latal motioned for Misha to come aboard. Misha hugged Skaya, then Alec, and finally Tori. See you soon, said Misha, squeezing her tight. See you in war. It was a dark thought but one that brought smiles to both their faces. They were going to save their friends. They were going to fight the Chancellor, and that was reason to be glad. Misha kissed Tori's cheek, and then she ascended the gangway. Alec supported Tori as they watched the ship lift into the sky. Garen Dulnarsuk waved as the skyship soared over the city, and the Aleut clans cheered. It was a marked difference from the death cadence they had chanted in this square only days ago. It amazed Tori how quickly and easily people's minds could be swayed. As she made her way back through the crowd, her arm around Alec Dubaruk's shoulders for support, the people smiled and waved and tried to catch a brief word with her. The Aleut saw her as a god once more, or at least someone sent by the gods. But will that sentiment remain? Tori wondered. Tori had still not seen Farah Dubalruk since her execution. Chapter 24 The world was breathtaking from the skies. It was almost painful how quickly Ikala and the Icelands faded into the distance as the skyship soared. It had taken Misha weeks to reach the ice city. Many had died on the journey, and now she was leaving it behind in a matter of hours. Soon the smooth plains of ice were displaced by the jagged peaks of the northern teeth. According to the Witch Queen, they would fly over the boundless sea for most of the journey to avoid notice from the continent. They would pass Osha in a matter of days, returning to the seas below at night so Seren and the Krokala could rest. They would reach Elia, the port capital of the Southern Isles, in less than a week. The air was sharp on Misha's skin despite her thick furs. Gerendul Narsuk soon retreated to the cabin below decks, but Misha remained on the foredeck for several hours, taking in the sights. The northern sky was clear, but she could see large plumes of clouds on the hazy horizon. It's amazing, isn't it? said Seren Latal. The queen leaned against the rail, the wind rushing through her silver hair magnificently. She still wore only her thin, long-sleeved gown. Why does the world look so skewed from up here? asked Misha, gesturing to the southern horizon. Is it an effect of the air? I believe it is because the world itself is curved. It's only a theory. But Oskolai, who taught me in my youth, was an ardent student of the stars. He built a powerful looking glass, like a sailor's but much larger, to magnify their appearance. I spent many hours studying the strange bodies beyond our world. All of them appear to be spherical just like the sisters in our night sky. Why shouldn't our world be just so? Perhaps the stars themselves are merely other spheres beyond our reach. Misha thought it hard to comprehend. She had always been taught the world was like a great plate of glass. If you traveled far enough, 
he would fall off the edge into the abyss and share the fate of all those on the lost continent who disappeared without a trace so many years ago. But then she had been taught many false things in her life. She liked the idea of other worlds, though. It reminded her of the ancient teachings of the Watchers regarding the afterlife. It's a beautiful idea, said Misha, watching as the horizon began to bleed with brilliant colors. You said the scoli of your youth, but you look so young. Surely it hasn't been that long since you were a student. The queen giggled, the sunlight dancing over her smooth face. I suppose I am still a youth. I began talking that way to make myself seem less of a child as I gained power in the Isles. My nineteenth summer just passed. So young, thought Misha, and yet so formidable. Like Tori. But the queen seemed to shoulder the weight of her station in a way Tori had not yet mastered. She had the stature of someone far older. You think me a child? said Seren. Misha shook her head and smiled. Not at all. Age means little, I think. I've met merchers and privateers who act like children, and I've met children who are braver than most seasoned soldiers. She was thinking of Tesla. Misha wished she could have stayed back to train the girl. Tess had a spirit she would miss while she was separated from the others. You speak wisely, said Saran. I suspect you were forced to grow up at a young age as well. Misha nodded. She was forced to grow up the day she fled Melanesia. No, even before that, ever since the summer Allah died. The witch queen touched her shoulder kindly. My scholai once told me to never let anyone look down on me for my age. He said that the hope of the world lies in young folk. Your scholai sounds like a good man. Yes, indeed. Seren's face twitched like there was more she wanted to say. Your house must not have been as lowly as I've heard to afford such a brilliant teacher. Seren smiled but shook her head. He should have been the most expensive one in the Isles, but like most people ahead of their time, he was an outcast among the southern scholarat. And on top of that, he was blind. No one wanted him. He was the only teacher my family could afford. Blind, yet he built a looking-glass for the stars, said Misha, bewildered. He could work better with his hands than most can, even with their sight. He used to say that losing his eyes helped him discover everything there is to see without them. But he was always saddened he could no longer see the night sky. I described everything I saw through his night-glass. In exchange for my assistance with his studies, along with his daily household tasks, he taught me everything he knew which turned out to be far more than my parents ever could have dreamed. Misha detected a tremble in her voice the more she spoke of the scholai. Does he still teach you? Seren gazed out at the stunning sunset. He died for teaching me about the old world, about magic. Morphs? asked Misha. Seren Natal shook her head. Osha is not the only place where magic comes at a cost. Her jaw clenched. But things are changing, aren't they? I hope so. The witch queen said no more and soon returned to the helm. Once the sun had set, Misha retreated to the cabin. Her room was small, but then Misha had never required much space. She had brought only a rucksack with a change of clothes and a small trunk with extra furs, which she was glad for. Though they were traveling south, it was still frigid up in the sky even in her cabin. Misha sat on the bed and dug in her pack, retrieving a small blade that Skaya Dubaruk had given her. It was no ordinary knife, however. It was a small shank made of ice fire. I hope you won't need it, Skaya had said, but this will kill anyone you stab in seconds. The crystal shatters and poisons their blood. You don't trust the queen? Skaya gripped her shoulder. I trust her but I've never seen a transition of power that went uncontested. And the Southern Isles, of all places, is not known for peaceful conclaves. I doubt the Queen is bringing you along only as proof of our alliance. And I'd personally like to see you come back to the North. Misha held on to the memory and smiled. She could nearly feel the warmth of the Bear Rider's fingers. 
Skaya was nothing like Vashti or Allah or Zaya. Vashti had been fierce, but had never been one to share much affection. Allah had been too soft for this world, and the world had overcome her. And Zaya, the Medici had always been a mistake, a feeble attempt to move past Vashti. Now Zaya was dead too. Another tragedy left in Misha's wake to haunt her dreams. She pushed the thought away. Skaya was different, and Misha liked this about her. She shared Vashti's fierceness, but she had a soft side as well. However, Misha's feelings were torn even about considering such a thing right now, and not just because they were going to war. Despite the betrayal, despite all the horrible things Vashti had done, Misha still cared for her. It was not the same. It could never be the same. But as much as Misha longed to finally move on, she was unsure she was ready. She toyed with the ice fire blade in her hands. The handle was made of whalebone wrapped with seal skin, and it glowed softly when she removed it from its sheath. The same strange stone that had nearly killed Tori might very well save her life. Misha hoped she would not need it. A chilly draft coursed through the room. Misha stowed the blade away and went to her trunk to grab her Kendrak furs. But when she undid the latch, she found no furs. Instead, a small head of bushy dark hair popped out of the trunk. Misha instinctively struck the flints at her wrists, forming a swift flame. But she let it die just as quickly when she realized who was in her trunk. Tesla? The girl smiled sheepishly as she crawled out of the cramped space. What are you doing here? I, I had to come, Tesla protested. Gods, I'm glad I found you. There still may be time to turn back. Misha made for the door. Wait, Tess hollered, running after her. Please. Misha stopped and turned. Tess, you can't come. Do you hear me? It's too dangerous, and you need to train back in Ikala. Tesla crossed her arms over her chest. I don't want to learn from Tori. What are you talking about? She's the gallows girl. She doesn't have time to train me to fight. You're a child, Tess. Children should not go to war. The Chancellor killed my mom and pa. The girl's voice was shrill, and she shook with anger as tears streaked down her cheeks. He ruined my home. You don't understand. I have to fight. Misha stooped to a knee and placed her hand on the girl's shoulder, meeting her gaze. Tessa's eyes were alight. I do understand. I want to learn from you, and I want to help at the war meeting. How will you help? said Misha. You can't control your gift. I could hear what you and the queen were talking about on deck. Tess hopped up on the bed, and Misha sat beside her with a resigned sigh. You could? Tess nodded. She was talking about her star teacher or something. Misha raised an eyebrow. When did you realize you could do that? At Tori's trial. I listened in from outside because they wouldn't let me in. Misha was always amazed at the astonishing way Watcher abilities reveal themselves in times of need. Not only could Tess manipulate sound like a shrill weapon, as she had when she killed the Frost Giant, but she also had highly sensitive hearing. Please don't take me back to the Ice City, Tess pleaded. What about your brother? Benja will take care of him. I want to help. I know I can't fight in some big battle, but I can help now. What do you expect we'll need to hear at the Conclave? The Isles have lots of kings and queens, right? One rules each Isle, said Misha. Well, I was thinking the others probably don't all like that the Witch Queen is getting so powerful. That is likely. Maybe one of them is plotting something, and if they are, maybe I can find out. Misha smiled and patted the girl on the knee. Tess had a point. Her ears might very well prove invaluable if something were to happen. All right, you can stay. But you stay with me at all times unless I say otherwise. Clear? Clear. Misha got up and made for the door. Then, let's start your training. Where are we going? The mess hall. The Kokala are the rowdiest bunch I've ever seen during meal times. How will that help? Tess asked as she followed after. Don't I want it quiet? 
I could barely hear you and the Queen, and there were hardly any other sounds then. You need to learn to tune out the noise. The din of buzzing demon fairies was cacophonous before Misha even opened the door, and despite the likely discomfort in her watcher sense, the little crooked girl was beaming as they entered. Chapter 25 Tori and Alec watched from the side of a large training arena at the edge of the ice city as Skaya and her nuke Vana led the northern recruits in spear drills. The Aleut were skilled hunters, and Tori marveled at their ability to hit targets, both while standing still and from the backs of mighty north bears. Their skills with bows and the few muskets that had found their way this far north also proved encouraging to watch. Their hunting prowess would prove invaluable in the war to come. The crooked folk were untrained, but many had some experiences in close combat from their ruthless cage fights. Most of the Aleut had very little training in proper combat. The Northmen had few human enemies. There were small rogue clans farther north, like the ones Tori and Misha were sure they'd glimpsed during their journey across the Icelands. But according to Alec, the bear riders dealt with them in swift order when they ventured too close, and they did not often dare attack the larger organized clans of Ikala. This was the one thing that made Tori nervous about marching these people to war. Both groups were filled with strong and resilient people, but other than the bear riders, they were not warriors. The night legions would outmatch them in close quarters any day. Tori's soldiers were eager to learn, however, and they were filled with a hunger that no legion shadow could possess. They had known only tales of their homeland. For centuries they had known only injustice because of the sins of the chancellors long ago. What they lacked in experience they might just make up for in fierce determination. Skaya drilled them for hours on end, and none complained. They were improving noticeably each day. Skaya and Alec paired off to demonstrate a sparring routine, leaving Tori to observe alone. Lirge hovered nearby, watching the regimen with interest, though he kept enough distance not to speak. The fairy was not social, but he always kept close. He seemed to unnerve many of the Aleut, but Tori appreciated his silent presence. She'd had few moments for reflection since her body healed. There was too much to do, but there was much yet to consider. And despite Lirge's hideous features, he had a reassuring effect on Tori, in a way that few other people in the North did. After all, it was the demon fairy who had saved her life, and he had sworn to serve her just as he served his queen. And with Misha gone, and Tess stowed away after her, Tori liked having him near. The training arena filled with a song of clashing spear points. Alec and his sister whipped their weapons around quicker than most could wield a saber. Tori loved the paradox between Alec's peaceful spirituality and his impressive martial skill. Skaya taught the new recruits how to make use of the entire spear, including the whalebone shaft, to block an attacking spear or saber. The soldiers observed closely, then paired off to practice the maneuver. Next, the soldiers perfected lethal thrusts on dummies made of wood and sealskin. Terra Dulhesic, elder of the Tuva Forest Clan, and Lyran Delvanuk of the Karuva had been observing the drills for some time from a distance. For a short while, their high elder had joined them, but Farah Dulbaruk did not watch long. Terra approached as Tori took stock of her new army. Tori had been waiting for one of them to disturb her ever since the high elder left, as the two elders seemed to be making a point to talk to Tori when given the opportunity, as though trying to prove themselves. Lirge hovered closer as Terra Dulhesic neared. What do you think of them, my saint? the elder asked, leaning against the ice wall surrounding the arena. Tori could not explain why, but something felt forced about the question, and so she did not reveal her true thoughts. They are coming along well. Their hearts are filled with hope, and they are very skilled. I will be proud to lead them into battle. The woman nodded calculatedly. And we will be proud to march with you. But not all of you said Tori evenly. She met the elder's gaze. 
Elder Baruch did not observe her soldiers long. I assure you, my saint, the High Elder will not provoke you. We have allied ourselves with you and the Witch Queen. Yes, and we march south in a matter of weeks, and I have yet to meet with the eldest of the four clan leaders. Will Elder Baruch be marching to war with us? Elder Hessek eyed Lyrgay, who hovered in place with rapid wings. I, I cannot speak for her, my saint. It was as good as a no. Well, I am glad to have your support, Elder Hessek, said Tori, gripping the woman's arm in a comradely fashion. Her tone conveyed the necessity of that continued allegiance. The elder managed a smile. You bear the support of my people. That is all that matters, my saint. A good chieftain heeds the will of her clan. But does Farah Dulbaruk feel the same? Tori forced a smile, then returned to observing her soldiers. Elder Hessek soon took the hint and moved on. It was strange to think how only a few days before the elder had stood by while Farah Dulbaruk rigged the trial of fire and ice against her. While Tori was grateful for the support of the other three elders, she did not trust them. She had seen the way they had bent to their high elder's will once before, and she had clearly not thrown her lot in with this war. Alec returned to her side, having finished his demonstrations. He was grinning, and Tori's mood brightened. He stood close to her, so their arms brushed. Tori was grateful to still have him with her. She felt so alone and set apart in her role as the gallows saint, and with Misha gone, this feeling had only intensified. She missed the days at the watchtower, when she had been one of many watchers bent on revolution. Sure, she had still borne the weight of being the gallows girl, but she'd had Wren to look to for leadership and guidance. Now, with even Tesla gone, Tori was the lone watcher in the Great White North, and the Aleut were all looking to her. She wished desperately for the simplicity of days on Oran's mountain with Wren. She could hardly find time to practice her own gifts. Since her recovery from the trial of fire and ice, she had begun waking early to focus on her magic, which had hardly been used since the Chancellor's attack on the Watchtower. Her conjury skills were strong when she had time to focus on the objects she manipulated. But that was not how battles worked. She needed to be reactionary. The Frost Giant had defeated her because she couldn't control her gifts without thinking and she could not afford to let that happen again when they marched against Osha. The northern soldiers stowed their weapons away. Skaya led them on a conditioning exercise into the deep snow beyond the city, shouting orders from her north bear while the soldiers trudged along at a swift pace in only their fur boots and mukbluks. Alec and Tori walked back through the city. What did Elder Hessek want? Alec asked as they neared the central square. She asked what I thought of the army. And? Their hearts are strong, said Tori. But? Alec offered a thin smile. But I wish we had more time. Alec sighed. Autumn is nearly over. If we wait any longer, the ice will set in, and we will be forced underground. And if we wait through the winter, the opportunity will pass, said Tori. I know it. Queen Seren will not be able to muster the Isles for some distant future war. What made matters worse was the latest news that had arrived by Raven that morning. The Chancellor had issued an incredible reward for any information leading to the gallows girl's whereabouts. The Queen-to-be wanted her dead for a wedding gift, and the Chancellor meant to oblige. Considering the Chancellor's victory over the Rulocks, and the fact that Osha blamed Tori for the return of the beasts, things were looking bleak. Rumors tell that morphs are scouring the teeth for signs of my whereabouts ever since Vashti's wedding request. It is only a matter of time before they come to the north. Now is the time to strike. She was trying to convince herself. Alex stopped and looked her in the eyes. It is the time, Tori. You know what the Chancellor is capable of? How can you be so confident? I have faith. How can you put so much faith in some vision? What if this is a mistake? What if your Madru is right and I am leading your people to their destruction? 
Alec took her hand. He wore fur-lined gloves, just like Tori, but she wished fleetingly she could feel the warmth of his hands on her bare skin. Come with me. I want to show you why I believe. Tori followed him through the city. They entered the Underrealm through the Central Palace, but they did not stop when they arrived in the main underground chamber. Alec led the way through a narrow passage and then down a winding staircase carved straight out of the stone. The passage wended deep beneath Ikala, and the deeper they went, the warmer Tori became. At the end of the passage stood a lone iron door. Beside the door were several hooks made of long, white North Bear claws. Alec removed his cloak and hung it up. Tori did the same. He removed his boots and woolen layers until he wore only a pair of linen pants. No shirt. Tori did not mind seeing him this way. Though he had no warrior's build, he was lean and his muscles were strong and defined. You'll want to wear less. It's very warm beyond the door. What's in there? said Tori, as she too removed her many layers. She stripped down to her small shorts and undershirt. Alex smiled. Do you remember where my visions of restoration first came from? You said your grandmother saw a vision of a winter lily, which you believed was me, but I've never met your grandmother. Alec nodded. It would be difficult, considering my madram's been dead since I was a young boy. But you said she was the high shaman. She is. I don't understand. How could a dead woman serve your people's religion? Who better to teach us of what is beyond ourselves than someone who has been beyond the boundaries of our first existence? Alec pushed the door open. Steam gushed from the room within, and Tori was struck with an intense heat. Blue ice fire crystals lined the walls, illuminating the strange room in a soft sapphire glow. At the center of the space, a small pool of water bubbled and gushed with steam. Tori instantly began to sweat. The pool glowed with a different light. It was silver. Small streams glowed on the floor like silver veins leading from the heart of the earth, all of them converging in the pool. This is the inner temple of the Alut, where the high shaman resides to offer guidance until one of her followers is chosen to take her place. Where is she? asked Tori, glancing around the room. Alec pointed at the pool and stepped in. He held on to Tori's hand. It's hot, but it will not burn you. The pool was waist deep. As they entered, steam rushed and water churned violently. The air grew so thick Tori could not see a thing. For a moment it was hard to breathe, the air was so heavy. But as she inhaled, the sensation went away, and soon Tori felt as though the steam were filling her, like wind in a sail. Alec held tight to her hand, and she was consumed by warmth, but it was not from Alec, nor even the pool itself. It was a strange presence pressing all around her. The room disappeared, and Tori stifled a scream. Tori no longer felt the water or the heat. She felt disconnected from the world, as though she were in a dream, except she was aware it was a dream. It reminded her of the feeling of her nightmares in the forest of Gen. The only constant was Alec's hand on hers. A face appeared in the mist an elderly Aleut woman with stark white hair. Mala Dulbaruk, Tori thought, the high shaman. Her face was not fully present. It came and went, wafting in and out of focus like driftwood on the tide. But her voice was steady and seemed to come from all around the room. You've brought a visitor, the shaman said. A good friend, Madram, said Alec. Only a friend, the shaman said with a chuckle. Her face dissipated and the mists swirled around, but Tori could have sworn she felt a hand brush her face. It startled her, but she was not afraid. She wished the touch had lasted longer. I recognize your face, Astoria Burrodai. That is your name, isn't it? Yes, it's an honor to meet you, shaman. Call me Mala. The shaman's face drifted back with the mists. She was smiling, and Tori felt warm all over. 
You've seen me before, said Tori. Aye, said Mama. The Aether is full of eyes, and many of them have been watching you with much interest. Alex said you knew I would come to the north. You knew Queen Seren would come too. The face disappeared, and Tori was engulfed in mist, as though she were being consumed by a mystical warmth. The air echoed with faint laughter. Nothing is known, child. There are many eyes, and they see many things. Though I am pleased you did decide to come to the north. But Alex said you saw the restoration of the Aleut. Mala's face reappeared and nodded. Years ago, I envisioned a dream built on hope, not sight. You want me to tell you whether you are doing the right thing, whether you will win this war, and I am afraid I cannot give you the answers you seek, Astoria. Well, what are we doing then? Tori instantly regretted her demand. I'm sorry, I've never spoken with the dead. Mala chuckled. That's not what the dead say. They remember you. Suddenly, Tori was taken back to the forest where many ghosts had tormented her. The forest of Gen. It's like this room, isn't it? The veil between worlds is thin in Gen, as it is here. Our temple is far more controlled than the haunted forest, said Alec reassuringly. How can you bring back the dead? said Tori. There is no such thing, said Mala. As death? Mala laughed. Death is an idea invented by those who have not experienced what lies beyond the corporeal world. What does lie beyond? That knowledge is reserved only for those who lie there. Some things must remain a mystery. It is the way of things. Can you see anyone from this temple? Tori asked. Or is it only for you, Mala? This temple is merely a looking glass, but it was not made for me, nor my people, for that matter. We discovered this veil, as we discovered the veils in Gen before the alien races stole that place from us and let the ghosts run free. Only the gods know the limits of this veil. There is someone you wish to see? Tori nodded. Your Madru, said the high shaman. Hmm, I am not sure that would be wise, my dear. Please, Mala. You've seen her before. In Gen. That memory haunts you, said Mala. I can sense it. What makes you think this time will be different? This place is different. Aye, child, it is. But the dead are best left to their own schemes. Says the dead shaman who shares visions of the future. The mists swirled and the room rumbled with laughter. Mala's face drew near. If you are sure. Alec gripped her hand tight, but Tori held Mala Dubaruk's gaze. I'm sure. Mala did not respond. The mists swirled as though they were the eye of a storm, sparking and singing with a strange energy. And then a face appeared. A face Tori had not seen in eleven years. The air felt warm all around her. Tears filled her eyes. She could hardly believe it. Mom! Tori was engulfed in a phantom embrace. My little love! It was her, really her. Her mum's voice sounded like the most beautiful melody. Mom! Tori reached up to touch the face in the mists, but her hand passed right through the vapor. It's only a looking glass, remember? said Alec, still holding her tightly. Yes, it's me, said Celine Burrodai. I've been watching you, little love. I knew you would remember your gifts when the time was right. I'm so proud of you. Tori choked back a sob. Mom, you, you died because of me. Don't waste your sorrow on the dead. I died because Alexander Morrow ordered it, and now you fight his heir. You bring hope to many, my love. Watchers, lowborns, it was well worth the sacrifice. Gods, I miss you, Mum. I'm so sorry. Tori felt tense all over. 
She was so angry at Osha's long legacy of oppression. Her mum had been murdered for possessing gifts the current chancellor now manipulated for his own gain. A buried rage kindled within her. I'm going to get revenge. For you, for all the Watchers and Lowborns who have suffered. I am going to end the morrow reign with the Chancellor and his traitor of a queen. Her mum's face disappeared, and the mists swirled. Mum? Tori reached into the mists. They were colder now. Then the face returned, and Tori was filled with relief. You have been through much, my love. I do not blame you for your anger and hatred, but please don't take it out on Vashti Burodai. Tori started at the name. Her mum knew who the Yanavi princess was. Her fists clenched. It had been bad enough that Vashti had betrayed the Shadow Watch, but now she wanted Tori's head as a wedding gift. What do you mean? How can you say that? Vashti is a traitor. She's my enemy, the enemy of our revolution. She wants me dead. Tori was engulfed again in mists, and she felt like she might suffocate. She may be your enemy, but she is also your sister. A sinking feeling dragged at Tori's gut, jerking her from the mists. Mom! But Celine Burrodai was already gone. The mists faded, and Tori and Alex stood again in the looking-glass pool. The water had calmed. But Tori had not. She felt nothing but rage. Alec wrenched his hand away. It had gone white from her furious grip. Tori felt power rise up in her like water from a breached dam. She screamed. The ice fire crystals that lit the temple flickered and then exploded, and the room plunged into darkness. Part 8 The Hangman Ilesa Volonai Venasa Elonai Utlesa Sheshonash, Elesa Renonash. The gods move through us. We are the gods. From them we were begotten. To them we shall return. A lost mantra of the Watcher orders. Translated from Old Elian by Alden Teldona. Annotation. While popularized by the Watchers to justify their deeds, the poem's syntax and structure predates the Watcher orders. Some scholai believe it is a remnant of the ancient men, which begs the question, who believed themselves to be gods? Chapter 26 Darian and Valyria danced the dance they knew better than any other, the dance of sabers. In the sky above the great training square of Morrow El, they spun through the air on black wings. Valeria Sardona swooped in from his right. Darien shifted his wings, catching a stream of air from the west, and he arched his body. His saber met hers with a clang that sent shivers through him. A sly grin stretched Valeria's face as she flashed by, and Darien thought that she had never looked more alluring. Even in her morph form, Darien found her taut, militant figure utterly captivating. He banked in the air and gave chase. She weaved amongst a series of ruined spires beyond the training grounds, but he did not follow. She disappeared from sight for a moment, and Darien raced ahead, adrenaline pumping, predicting where she would appear next. He grew hot with sweat and excitement. He shifted his wings and rode a current of the wind to find a higher vantage point. Valeria shot from behind a tower below. Darien turned hard and plummeted to attack. But amazingly, Valeria had anticipated the maneuver. They had become so in sync with one another. It might have been frustrating if Darien were not so electrified by her cunning. She parried his attack, the world consumed by the sharp clanging of their sabers. They weaved in the air, exchanging blow after blow. As they plunged toward the earth, the training field loomed larger and larger. They were both grinning as they sought for the victorious blow. The earth rose to swallow them, and Darien slowed his descent ever so slightly. At the last possible moment, Valeria extended her wings to recover, and that was when Darien struck out with his saber, clipping her left wing. Just in time, Darien swooped upward, morphed forms, and landed on his human feet. 
Valeria landed off balance from his blow, and Darian leapt forward, knocking her on her back. He resisted the urge to join her there, and instead held his blade at her throat. She grimaced as she morphed back into her human form, sweat dripping from her silver hair. She shook her head with annoyance, but conceded. The members of the Sky Guard, who had been watching them all the while, applauded as Darian helped Valyria to her feet. Her skin was hot to the touch, and he longed to feel her touch for longer. Since the night before the Battle of Gods and Monsters, when she had first kissed him, his desire had only increased, and it was driving him mad. He longed to find a secluded place, a weaponry or a narrow stairwell, and steal another momentary taste of their forbidden, intoxicating romance. Instead, Commander Redvar turned to his soldiers and sheathed his sword. Valeria left his side and joined the others. Darian turned off his emotions, as he so often found himself required to do, and became a stern military leader. Why was I able to defeat Captain Sardona? he said, addressing his sky guard. A conjury named Lesa spoke up. She was the first to recover her descent, Commander. You dared it longer. That's part of it, said Darian. Lesa was from his own homeland and she was showing much promise. She didn't anticipate your attack, said Jan, Darian's young protege. We must always be anticipating our opponent's next move. True, but that is not the heart of it. Captain Sardona put herself in a position where she was not in control. The answer came from beyond the group. Dressed in a wispy cream-colored gown, Vashti Burodai crossed the field to join the soldiers. We are honored to have you join us, my queen, said Darian, crossing his right arm across his chest in salute. Vashti drew to the front of the crowd and nodded to him in greeting. Don't be hasty, commander. My wedding is not for several weeks. Of course not. To what do we owe this honor, milady? I was watching your demonstration for some time, said the queen-to-be. Captain Sardona fought beautifully. She matched your every move but you let up slightly in your final descent. The captain was put in a situation where she was forced to make the first move, and you seized that moment. A soldier's observation, milady," said Darian. Vashti hinted a smile. It is a good lesson to teach them, Commander. Even magic can become a crutch. The queen speaks wise words, Darian said to his soldiers. Remember them well. Flight can be a great advantage in battle, but only if you do not let it rule you. Be careful not to depend on your magic. Use it as a tool, not a necessity. Now, pair up for sparring drills. The morphs donned their human forms, and the watchers refrained from using their magical gifts. Darian thought it best they not associate their battle skills with magic. He had seen the weakness of the watchers without their powers. They were little more than cattle as the legions had herded them through the catacombs beneath the crooked teeth. But here, under his tutelage, they would become true warriors. The training grounds filled with the beautiful clash of swords, and Darian watched his soldiers intently, walking amongst them, observing their form, offering suggestions for improvement, as General Thrain had once done for him, not so long ago. It was several minutes before Darian realized that Vashti Burodai had not left them, she stood at the edge of the field with arms crossed. Darian commanded his soldiers to take to the air. They formed two groups and began practicing attack maneuvers, this time without swords. They weaved through the air, assuming battle formations, attacking the opposing group, and then banking to miss their opponents by the mere breadth of a hand. They were coming along well. The Sky Guard had been thrust too soon into battle against the Rulocks, but it had worked for the best. The morphs and watchers had been forced to work together, despite their bitter pasts, and they had been unified by a common enemy. The Rulocks were subdued, and Osha was more unified than ever. As Darian observed his soldiers from below, Vashti Burodai made her way to his side. My queen. I hope you don't mind the watching, Commander. My lady, you are welcome on these grounds any time you like. In a few weeks, your word will command them. We are honored to have you. 
I never thought I'd see the day that Watchers and Morphs would fight side by side. Darian nodded. It is an age of many surprises in the New World. Vashti mused for a moment, watching her former comrades train. They look good, Commander. You are training them well. You're too kind, my lady. Though she tried to hide it, Darian could tell the queen to be enjoyed his formal pleasantries. Vashti retrieved a dull sparring blade from the ground and shifted it between her hands. You may join them in their drills if you wish, Darian said. You have the mind of a soldier. I'd wager it pairs with a soldier's skill. Vashti's lips creased with a subdued smile. She toyed with the blade, and Darian could tell by her grip that she knew her way with sabers. She tossed it upon the ground. Perhaps another day. I am sorry for stealing your time, Commander. I should not distract your training. A queen is never a distraction. Yes, well, thank you, Commander. She turned and began to cross the field, her gown fluttering in the wind. Darian was not sure what compelled him, but he called after her. You made the right decision, my queen. She turned to him. At the watchtower, you saved them. Your old comrades know it too. Vashti paused for a moment, then turned back and nodded to him. Thank you, Commander Redvar. And Vashti left them. The sky guard soon returned to the earth, and Darian dismissed them to wash and prepare for supper. As his sorcerers retreated to their bathhouses in the guard tower, Darian made his way to his own private room. He ascended the steps slowly, his thoughts now able to unravel. A few weeks of peace, and he was already anticipating when they would begin their hunt for the gallows girl. Now that the Rulocks had been overcome, he suspected it would be any day. He had already sent out scouts, so far without luck. He considered returning to the teeth, trying to locate where Tori had emerged from the catacombs, though all tracks would certainly be long lost now in autumn snows. But there might be other signs. It would have to be a morph hunting party. He knew that much. He did not trust the turned watchers enough yet. Especially not since the queen had asked for Tori's death as a wedding present. He pushed the thought away. Thoughts of Tori were confusing and only filled him with anger and regret. As he reached for the door of his quarters, it flew open and he was accosted from the other side. A woman pulled him in and shoved him up against the wall, a blade at his mouth. Then she replaced the blade with her lips, and Darian forgot all thoughts of Tori. Valeria's kiss was soft and warm, and she tasted of sweat, which was an oddly alluring taste. Her body pressed against him, still clad in her leathern armor. How had she managed to beat him up here? It did not matter. He savored the moment, letting his mind fall into the abyss of her presence. But as with all their moments, this one did not last long. Since the battle of gods and monsters, she had not again come to his estate. Of course, Darian saw Valyria in the citadel regularly, and daily in the training fields, but he could appear as nothing but a comrade. He was her superior, after all. It pained him to be so close and yet to feel such distance between them. His skin tingled as she pulled away from him. You're not falling for the queen, I hope, Valeria said with a sly smile. Darian laughed. Hardly. Good, said Valeria, pulling off her leathern armor. I don't want to be tried for a regicide. Darian kissed her again. She bit his bottom lip playfully. We can't have that. I don't want to have to hunt you down for regicide. Valeria pulled away. Ever, my honorable comrade, what did the queen want? I think she missed training for war. Don't blame her. I would go crazy locked up in a palace all day. I offered for her to join the exercises. Really? The chancellor goes to war. Why not his queen? If she does train with us, let me spar with her. There was a sparkle in Valeria's eyes that Darian wished he could enjoy for hours rather than such brief moments. Gods, she is breathtaking. But Darian felt a twinge of guilt again. She was a comrade. She might beat you, he teased. She saw through my maneuver. 
Please, said Valeria. I let you in. Darian grinned and kissed her again. There was a sudden shuffling from the stairs beyond, and Darian quickly moved behind his desk where maps of Osha were spread, and he and Valeria feigned studying them as the intruder entered. Even in their lies, they were in sync. Captain Sardona was pointing to a spot on the coast of Greater Osha, commenting on the terrain and logistical advantages for a new tower, when young Jan appeared at the door. Uh, my apologies, Commander, if I am interrupting. Darian waved nonchalantly. Not at all, lad. What is it? Jan eyed Valeria with a querulous look, only briefly, and then locked eyes with his commander. Uh, the Chancellor has summoned you, sir. Some watchers just arrived from Liani. They want to join the Sky Guard. Darian and Valeria left his chambers. He ordered Daja and a morph named Saeed to join them in welcoming the new recruits. Saeed had served beneath Commander Solero for years. He was a veteran from the magic-hunting days of the Metamorphi, before Cyrus Morrow ascended the Ocean Throne. Daja Bati had shown more potential than any other Watcher. He was talented and motivated, and the other Watchers looked to him for guidance as they navigated this new world in Morrow L. Valeria joined as well, for she was his right hand in the Guard. They donned their formal uniforms and, together, marched from the training grounds and reached the White Citadel before the autumn sun began its early descent. The nights would be growing longer by the day, and come winter they would have only a few hours of daylight in which to train. The Chancellor welcomed them in his throne room. The shimmering crystal palace was not empty, as was usual for Darian's meetings with the Chancellor. Cyrus Morrow sat his throne, and Vashti stood at his side. Medea stood below the throne, at the base of the steps, wearing her customary dark silks. Several members of the High Council were seated at the front of the hall. Wallace, Dragonus, Fedra, and the others. The morphs on palace duty for the evening lined the halls and quietly stood at the ready. This was apparently no private matter of the Sky Guard. Therian and his comrades bowed before the crystal throne, and the Chancellor bade them rise. These new Yanavi recruits, said Darian, glancing around the room and spying no new faces. Who are they? The Chancellor smiled. Sala Burodai sent a company of Ilya to see to Vashti's wedding preparations. Or perhaps I should say Sheva Zora. The Chancellor made light of the feigned name. At this he took his bride-to-be's hand, and she smiled. But Darian sensed it was slightly forced. He supposed most marriages amongst nobles were for power and influence, rather than love or attraction. But Darian knew the smile of desire. Valeria's smile lingered in his mind as he lay in bed, even in his dreams. He doubted that Vashti's smile had a similar effect on the Chancellor. Since the princess was technically executed by her father years ago, said the Chancellor, Sala has asked that his sister be known by another name. It would not do for her to apparently rise from the dead. Superstitious nonsense, if you ask me. He seemed to say this for the benefit of the council, for Darian noted the way he glanced in their direction as he spoke. Several council members had been displeased when the chancellor announced his bride after the victory over the Rulaks. There had never been a non-ocean queen in the White Citadel, let alone a Yanavi one. Darian thought it more likely they were angry their own daughters had lost their chance at seducing him. But Cyrus Morrow was favored amongst the people after his darkling witch saved the city, and so Darian only heard of the council members' qualms through rumors. Still, the Chancellor seemed to be trying to please them. Vashti remained stoic, despite her fiancé's insult to her people's beliefs. The Chancellor went on. So it seems I am marrying the daughter of another chieftain by name. But it is no matter. It seals Sala's loyalties, and I get to marry my lovely desert flower. Vashti smiled at this and whispered sweetly, You are most gracious, Chancellor Maro. 
it was clear she knew her way around the pleasantries of court as well as she did sabres. As for the new recruits, I will not spoil the surprise. The Chancellor gestured to the guards standing at the immense crystal doors. Now that the commander has arrived, the High Council is ready to receive the emissaries from the steppe. Four guards slowly pushed the great doors open, and the company from Liani entered. Darian's interest was piqued when he realized who followed Ashi Burodai, the great sultane's head servant, into the room. He recognized them both immediately. A couple months ago, Valyria had assumed Kira Fane's likeness in the Red City while Sala concocted his devious ascent to the Yanavi throne, and the other watcher was Kale Andovir former lordling of Maro El and brother of the watcher captain currently locked beneath the citadel. Darien and his comrades stood at the base of the Chancellor's dais to receive the new recruits. Four Yanavi tribesmen accompanied Ashi and her watchers. Sala's devoted Ilya assassins, Darien presumed. All seven of the company bowed before the throne. The Chancellor bade them rise. Friends of Sultane Borodai, Welcome to Morrow El. Ashi was the first to speak. Thank you for receiving us, my lord. We come with dark tidings from the Red City. It was with sorrow that we heard the bane of your people has returned, said the Chancellor evenly. Our city lies in ruins, Chancellor Morrow, and our winter stores with it. My people seek aid from our ally. You are not alone in this devastation said the Chancellor, who caught the furtive glances of the council members in the room. My city is in disrepair as well. My lord, with respect, your empire still stands. My people are without a home. Half our herds were in Vliani, and more than half our stores. Thousands of souls were lost. If you do not help us, thousands more will die this winter. I ask that you remember my chief's loyalty. Remember how we ended the war before it began, while you were yet weary from your own war with the Morgathians. Remember his aid in your own endeavors. I remember well Sala's loyalty. He is an ally Osho wishes to keep. The Chancellor spoke these words more to his counsel than to Ashi, his eyes stern and his voice firm. The High Lords will send aid to Pendra, where your people will be offered sanctuary until such time as you are able to rebuild your city. Ashi bowed, a grim smile on her face. Thank you, my lord. You are most gracious. I will send word to my chief. My tribesmen and I, however, wish to stay and assist our princess's preparations for the great union of our peoples. You are most welcome in Morrow El. I will have quarters arranged for you all here in the White Citadel said the Chancellor with a wave of his hand. But you bring two who are not your tribesmen, I believe. What of them? Kira and Kale stepped forward. We have come to bow the knee, said Kira, who Darian noted moved a little unsteadily as she reached for the floor to kneel. He remembered well the injuries she had sustained from the Chancellor's manipulation of her Lumeni power. The scars were still fresh on her face. Her eyes flitted about, but did not settle on the Chancellor as she spoke. Blind, Darian realized. The Chancellor smiled and gestured to Darian, who stepped forward. Kale and Kira stood once more, remaining silent as Darian looked them over. Milady, you do not look well since our last encounter, said Darian. Your partner had a little more sense then, as I recall. Kira grimaced her fists tightening, but she caught herself and remained silent. Darian made note of the reaction. We have both learned our lesson well, Commander, said Kale. We regret our rebellion against the Empire. We have aided Osha before, and we would do it again. We have come to offer our services in your Skyguard, said Kira. And what good do you suppose a blind wielder of light would do for my guard? said Darian coldly. Kira tensed again, but this time she did not remain silent. It is true my gift is useless now, but I have gained another. Darian's brows rose at this. Really? 
Ashi interjected. It is true, my lord. Her sonora magic was what saved my people from complete annihilation in the Red City. Kira heard Zarila approaching, allowing our great Sultan and many others to escape before the beasts consumed the city. Interesting, said Darian. Salah has personally vouched for their loyalty, said Ashi. In exchange for their watcher gifts, Salah asks that you consider restoring Kira's sight. Darian looked to the Chancellor, but an idea had already come to him. It is true that one of the Watcher healers might be able to accomplish this, though your wounds are far along in healing. Kira nodded. All I ask is that they try, Commander. Sonora have their uses, but your Lumeni gift is an incredible one, said Darian. It is one I would value greatly in the Guard. I would like to see your gift restored as well, but first I must have proof of your loyalties. Kael Andovir crossed his arm against his chest in salute. We will be yours to command, sir. I am glad to hear it, said Darian, because you're the one who will be demonstrating your loyalties. I have a task for you, Lord Andovir. Should you complete it satisfactorily, I will have Kira's sight restored, and you will both serve the Empire as the Chancellor sees fit. Kale did not answer at once. He and Kira conferred briefly. But Darian could tell that, though they were joining his guard together, there was tension between them. Kira's face tightened whenever Kale spoke. Finally, Kira turned to him. She faced him directly, despite her lack of sight. We are yours to command, 